of night yesterday. Thank you, Dr. Jamal, for the warm welcome, and the last evening was amazing. And so, but this is not just this moment. We need to work as well. And so we came back to the Governing Council to the point seven, financial situation. And uh, I will give the floor to the Madam Chair uh, of the Standing I'm sorry, sir. Madam, of, of the Subcommittee on Finance. Mrs. Erickson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, honorable members of the Governing Council. As chair of the Subcommittee on Finance, I'm pleased to report to you on behalf of the Executive Committee. The Subcommittee on Finance and the Executive Committee have each have each examined the current financial situation of the IPU this week, along with the mobilization of voluntary funds towards IPU programs. The financial situation of the organization is summarized in the document you have before you. And the IPU finances are currently healthy and stable, and are monitored by the Subcommittee on Finance during its regular meetings. While global investment markets had a negative year in 2022, the IPU's investment strategy remains prudent and is providing positive returns for the organization over the long term. The follow-up of arrears of members' contribution is one area that needs our careful focus and attention. We are grateful that most IPU members are paying their contributions in full and on time and that 2023 payments are continuing to arrive at a steady pace. However, the list of members with arrears is too long. I encourage you all to work through your geopolitical groups and follow up with those parliaments with arrears that are listed in Annex 2 of the financial situation document. We would also like to encourage new members of any IPU committee or body to help with the mobilization of volunteer funds for their committee to the best of their abilities. The executive committee recommends that the review and approval of the 2022 audited financial statement should be addressed during the next assembly for Angola in October, since this meeting is a bit earlier than usually. But I'm happy to confirm the positive financial situation of the IPU to the Governing Council, and I invite the Secretary-General to provide any further details to you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, to confirm what uh, Mrs. Eriksson uh, said, this uh, assembly is a little bit uh, earlier than the usual, and that's why the external audit Auditor did not finish the presentation of the report. Uh, the good thing is that we have the information that the financial situation is well. The bad thing is that we need to come back to it in October, uh, uh, we hope, with the report of the internal and external uh, auditor. I will give the floor to the Secretary General to uh, complement the uh, information. And also, I will subscribe the request of the Madam Chair of the Subcommittee on Finance. Everyone should uh, pay the fees to the, our organization, because it's impossible to go on with activity. And everyone, in all meetings I had, uh, bilateral and so on, people are asking for more activities of IPU, request more visibility, more presence, address more issues without financial resources. So, please, every, all countries should uh, do the efforts, uh, at least to the compromises can be uh, solved. Uh, finally, uh, just a word of appreciation to all members of the sub Subcommittee on Finance, and in this moment to the, to the new president of the Subcommittee. I wish all the luck. I think it's a very important task. Uh, will be our finance minister, and so you will uh, work very hard the next uh, years inside IPU. Welcome to this new task. 
the Secretary General, if you wish to compliment, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I just uh, wish to uh, confirm what uh, the Honorable Minister of Finance of the IP has just said. Uh, the situation, the financial situation is very uh, stable. The IPO financial state, uh, situation is very stable. Uh, you have said, Mr. President and uh, Madam President of the subcommittee, that uh, this year's assembly is very early, and so we have not had time to complete the entire auditing process. The Auditors uh, General of uh, uh, the accounts of the organization are in the process of finalizing their reports, and so we are craving your indulgence and asking you to kindly accept to review uh, the uh, audited accounts of the organization when you meet at the next assembly in Angola. Uh, I just wanted to complete the picture too with uh, some information about uh, voluntary funding. You know, we ha uh, first of all, with uh, the uh, um, payment of assessed contributions, uh, the table that you have in front of you is an updated table. When we, were, we came to this assembly, there were a number of countries that were in areas, and, but now they have Many of them have paid up, including Libya. Libya has uh, paid up fully this time, and so they are entitled to their uh, uh, entire membership rights. When it comes to voluntary funding, I just want to point out that it uh, accounts for 27% of the uh, budget of the organization, which is a, a healthy percentage. It is not uh, one that leaves us vulnerable to outside influences, I hasten to say although I think there is a case to be made for uh, a, an, uh, an increase in voluntary funding in light of the expanded mandate that you have given yourselves in the context of the new uh, strategy of the organization. So this is always an opportunity for me to appeal to uh, those uh, persons of goodwill to uh, mobilize more financial and other resources for the organization. There is a document that has been circulated to you that gives you a rundown of all uh, the current streams of funding that we are receiving from external sources. But I, I would like, not because she is uh, the chair of the subcommittee on finance, but uh, as a Swede, but I want to say that uh, we are really appreciative to the uh, Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency that has been a steadfast uh, supporter of the organization financially. For as long as I've been associated with the IPU, uh, Swedish CEDA has provided funding to the organization, and I think that uh, this is the type of long-term engagement that we would like to see with uh, our, our partners. And so we have an agreement now that uh, runs to December 2024 with uh, an increased uh, budget of 3.8 million. That's a lot of money for the IPU in terms of its overall budget, and uh, we are extremely grateful. We are also grateful to the Canadian International, uh, no, the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development that is supporting for a period of three years our work on gender equality to the tune of 1.4 million Swiss francs, which is uh, uh, really appreciated. This is a continuation of uh, the support that uh, uh, the Canadian government has uh, been giving to the uh, IPU. Let me also use the opportunity, I don't know if the Irish speaker is in this room, uh, Ireland, the uh, Irish Development Agency, Irish Aid, is uh, supporting our gender equality work uh, on a regular basis, and we currently have a program uh, with them to the tune of 148,000 uh, Swiss francs. Uh, we also have uh, WHO, and uh, you know that we are doing a lot of health-related work, advocacy, developing tools for uh, parliamentarians on uh, a number of uh, health issues, including maternal, newborn, and child health, uh, universal health coverage. And we do have uh, a grant from the World Health Organization with whom we have an agreement. And there we, uh, they, we have a budget of 330,000 uh, uh, Swiss francs that uh, we are using to uh, do our health-related activities. And uh, our partners, the pa Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health is also providing resources to close to 100,000 uh, Swiss francs to do work in promotion of maternal, newborn, and adolescent health. Another program, stream of work in the IPU that is very popular now with donors is what we're doing uh, to promote parliamentary contribution to the global campaign to fight terrorism and violent extremism. Here we have uh, 
a consortium of uh, funders that I think uh, I would like to mention very quickly. China giving us 1 million, Bangladesh 200,000, Benin 15,000, uh, the Arab Parliament 60,000, the United Arab Emirates close to $500,000, uh, 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 Swiss francs, sorry. Uh, I, I would like to uh, express our appreciation to all these uh, donors uh, who are uh, walking the talk, supporting the IPU in word but also in action. Uh, let me also, uh, among the uh, long-term sponsors of the IPU, mention the uh, government of the uh, People's Republic of China, which has been supporting our work on SDGs in a very long-term manner, and we currently have an arrangement with them to the tune of $1.5 million uh, to uh, work in the area of uh, the SDGs. I must say that uh, uh, funding is not limited just to the uh, uh, richer, more opulent uh, partners, but also smaller partners that are also, because of their belief in the relevance of the organization, are making that financial effort. And I want to mention the Federated States of Micronesia that has, uh, uh, for the second time in a row, provided resources, and this time to the tune of 120,000 uh, Swiss francs to uh, do work on climate change governance and uh, you know, very flexible uh, funding. And thank you, Mi uh, uh, Micronesia. I don't know if they are in the room. Of course, we have uh, the European Union that is uh, sponsoring a big project of ours in Djibouti. You see in the impact report that uh, we uh, have been working in Djibouti for a number of years now, and what we are doing there is really having an impact. It is a case study, a success story that uh, we always want to highlight, and this is uh, being done thanks to financial support from the uh, European Union. We have funding from our U uh, UN partners on a country, uh, country by country basis. Many of the countries present here uh, are receiving uh, support from the IPU through the United Nations Development Program in their countries. And uh, I wish to thank uh, the uh, the, those various partners. Let me also, at this juncture, always express our extreme gratitude to those parliaments that are helping to uh, scale up our uh, human uh, resource capacity to uh, uh, enable us to perform uh, better in accordance with the mandate that you have given us. And so I would like to use the opportunity to thank the parliament of the Republic of uh, Korea that for uh, close to ten, uh, a decade now has uh, a long-standing uh, secondment agreement with the IPU whereby they second senior staff from the parliament to work with us for a period of, I think, two years. And uh, they come, they provide their expertise, but they also learn to, uh, to learn how international organizations uh, function. And I have evidence that uh, when they have gone back to their countries, they have gone on to occupy very senior positions uh, not only in Parliament, but in the, uh, the diplomatic sphere. Austria, too. Thank you, Austria, for seconding uh, senior staff from the Parliament uh, and at the ambassadorial level. Uh, Brigitte uh, Brenner, who is the head of our IPU Observer Office to the United Nations in Vienna. That has helped us uh, branch out to uh, Vienna as a major UN hub, and uh, we are extremely uh, grateful. Lastly, we have a new partner that is making inroads in the IPU in terms of uh, funding. And uh, I just want to uh, record our appreciation to the Julie uh, Ann Wrigley Foundation. I think many of you know Julie Ann uh, Wrigley of uh, Chewing Gum fame. Uh, they are now providing in, uh, increasing amounts of resources to the organization to uh, develop first of all, uh, gender equality programs, but now in view of our emphasis on climate action this year, have agreed to give us uh, $100,000 to beef up our campaign uh, on my parliament and uh, my planet, and we are extremely grateful to them. So you can see from this that we have a broad uh, base of uh, donors, which is good. No one uh, being able to entirely influence uh, the, way, the way IPU does business, but also showing that uh, we remain relevant not only to our members, but also to those partners that are out there, the belief in 
the strength of parliaments in making change. And so I just want for all of us to continue to be resolved, to continue to show impact how your parliaments are functioning in the uh, different countries uh, in order to continue to enjoy this uh, uh, confidence that we have with uh, the donors around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General. And uh, uh, also this way, thank you for the, uh, all United Nations agencies and several parliaments that made uh, their voluntary contributions amounted to 27% of the income on the last year. Uh, without it, uh, our activity will not be uh, the same. Thank you to all gen generosity from the United Nations agencies and many countries. So I will uh, open the floor. If someone wishes uh, to raise a question or remarks to the Madam President of the Subcommittee on Finance or to Secretary General, can you? Uh, I'm trying. Uh, it's um, Guyana. Okay, Guyana. <laughs> You can't imagine, but with the lies appointing directly to the stage, we don't see very well. <laughs> Please, you have the floor. Good morning, Mr. President, your committee and our members. I'm just checking the unpaid contributions at March 11, 2023. And Guyana, though a small amount, is listed as unpaid for 2022. Uh, I had provided the documentation to the Secretariat that that contribution was paid in February of 2022. So I'm concerned not because um, it's listed here, but if we can lose sight of a small amount, maybe Similarly, other amongst we could lose sight of. So I must asking the Secretariat to look carefully at um, the contributions paid and to monitor the account. Uh, but I've sent, I've sent the record from our banks to the Secretariat a few days ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I think, uh, and thank you for the information. When we have a mistake, we should uh, try to understand what happened and try to solve it. Uh, I believe that uh, the, the, our staff and secretariat will confirm your information and uh, so we will not repeat uh, it. Uh, we hope so. And if there is other cases that may happen, because you see, uh, if we don't receive one formal information, sometimes just looking to the bank accounts, it's not easy to identify from where it came. And so uh, also the, the problem sometimes persists. No more questions. I don't know if Madam uh, Chair, if you wish to, to add, or if the Secretary General wishes to add something. OK, so. Just for Guyana, we confirm that uh, my colleague to come and explain the situation to the Speaker of Guyana so that it, it's clear to him. If there has been any uh, misunderstanding, this will be clarified with him. Thank you. Thank you. And so uh, it's very important to know we are in good financial health. This is also relevant, and we can go on uh, without worries about that. Thank you, dear colleagues, madam. And we go to the point nine, situation of certain parliaments. I will give the floor to our uh, Secretary General. The, the, um, the Executive Committee appreciates this, this document prepared by the Secretariat. We discuss a lot about different cases. Uh, we had three long sessions and very particip with a lot of participation. And, uh, but now, we will uh, present the conclusions of the, our discussion, uh, and I will give the floor to the Secretary General for five minutes. <laughs> to all the cases. 
Thank you, thank you Mr. President. Uh, that's a tall order. Uh, I, uh, I can just, uh, I think you have received, have they received the report on the situation, situation of uh, certain members. Uh, it is, I think, consistent with the mandate of this organization uh, that seeks to promote the welfare of parliaments across the world, that you, on a regular basis, uh, monitor what is happening and if there are issues uh, regarding to, uh, the functioning of parliaments in the world, then uh, you want to come in to help fix those uh, uh, issues. And later this session, you will be hearing what the uh, Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians will be saying in terms of uh, the cases of members of parliament who are allegedly or actually being abused around the world. And this is part of our mandate to uh, protect the institution of uh, parliament. And it is in that vein that uh, at this session of council, you review the number, a number of uh, parliaments where there may be issues, where there are issues, and you want to state the organization's position. And so, uh, very quickly, Mr. President, I want to go on to the, uh, uh, the slides that we have prepared for you. And you will see that first slide that gives you an example of those countries where the IPU is monitoring the situation of Parliament, so just monitoring the political uh, situation of the uh, country in order to see whether this, uh, sit, uh, de these developments are impacting on the way uh, the uh, organization, or rather the Parliament does business. And you will see then that uh, uh, in most, on most continents, I think there's only one continent, North America, where we are not monitoring any particular situation, but uh, in the rest of the world we have uh, uh, there. And uh, you see the red ones, I would imagine, are the flashpoints that you want to pay attention to. And uh, in alphabetical order, we can start with Afghanistan, right? Afghanistan, where uh, there is no parliament that is actually functioning currently as a result of the uh, takeover by the Taliban in August 2021. Uh, they, that, uh, uh, the Taliban dissolved uh, the parliament there, and uh, many parliamentarians find themselves uh, in exile now. Some have been killed. You remember uh, the, the uh, situation of Mrs. Musada. Is it Ms. Ms. Musada who was killed last month? She is one of the uh, members of parliament who opted to stay in uh, Afghanistan following the takeover, but she, she was uh, unfortunately and regrettably so murdered um, uh, last month. And uh, you have, uh, we have uh, observed a minute of silence in uh, memory of this uh, valiant woman. Nabi Sada. Thank you very much. So for Afghanistan, the decision that the, you have taken is not to recognize what has happened there with the Taliban, but to express solidarity with your colleagues, parliamentarians, who were there at the time of the takeover. And you have taken the decision to uh, allow a delegation of Afghanistan to continue to participate in the proceedings of the organization in an observer, non-voting capacity. And it is in that capacity that you have uh, the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives of uh, Afghanistan with a delegation attending this conference. So the Executive Committee is recommending that you maintain that uh, uh, position, that decision, in solidarity with your colleagues who are under siege in uh, Afghanistan. Mr. President, you may wish to ask your colleagues to endorse this recommendation. Dear colleagues, may the Governing Council endorse the recommendations proposed by the Executive Committee on Afghanistan. No opposition? Then. Mr. Mr. President, you have, thank you, you have, always, you have also had a Haiti on your radar screen because this is a parliament that has gradually gone into oblivion because uh, uh, elections have not been held. And uh, most recently, the, rem the term of the last standing members of uh, that parliament expired. So there is no membership in the two houses of parliament in uh, Haiti. This is a country that has undergone a lot of political turmoil, violent, I would say. And uh, the uh, situation is that currently there is no functioning parliament in terms of membership. 
the parliament exists, but it is not populated. There is an agreement to organize elections this year. And when you and your colleagues, Mr. President, examine this in the executive committee, you took note of this uh, regrettable situation and you expressed the recommendation to the uh, governing council that we continue to monitor this, but that you also urge the Haitian authorities to organize elections as foreseen this year so that uh, in the future, in the near future, hopefully in Angola, you can welcome a fully fledged parliament of Haiti. That is the recommendation from the uh, executive committee. We hope so. It, it will be possible to have the parliament of Haiti as, as soon as possible. May you accept the uh, recommendations of the executive committee? In opposition, then. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We move on to Myanmar. A uh, whole situation is uh, akin to the one I have explained regarding Afghanistan. The, uh, the, there was a military takeover in uh, Myanmar uh, in February 2021, subverting a democratic process that had taken place, democratic elections that had taken place, and uh, that uh, the military rulers of the country refused to allow that parliament to uh, seat and have since rolled back all, the, uh, all of the uh, democracy process in uh, Myanmar. Uh, the Myanmar people, through the parliament that was elected in 2022, have refused to accept this situation, and they have gone to, on to form what they call the uh, Committee to Represent the People of Myanmar. Uh, that institution is, uh, has observer status in the IPU, the uh, current military government in uh, Myanmar is not recognized by the UN, so uh, a, uh, we do understand that the Credentials Committee in the UN has not granted accreditation to representatives of the, uh, U, uh, the Myanmar in, uh, in, in New York and in Geneva for that matter. And so you have taken a principled position uh, not to support uh, undemocratic processes. You have express your solidarity with the people of Myanmar and you have uh, decided to support that institution that is articulating the views of the Myanmar people. But you are also uh, realistic in no noting that that parliament is not in a position to function on the territory of a sovereign state, uh, which is why you have taken the decision for governing council to allow the committee to represent the people of Myanmar to uh, participate in the deliberations of the IPU in an observer non-voting capacity. The executive committee is requesting that you continue to endorse this particular position. Thank you. Turkey, uh, uh, allow me, Dr. Raz, just to say that one of the worst things of this information is that also one of our colleagues was executed uh, in July 22. And so uh, it's something that we should condemn always, of course. Uh, but, uh, Dr. Havze from Turkey. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to state for the record uh, that we stand for the fight for democracy in Myanmar. But we also need to remember of the people of Rohingya who are uh, being uh, ethnically cleansed in Myanmar. So we are hoping that during this process, as uh, the people of Myanmar get their democracy back on its feet, hopefully uh, they, the uh, massacre of the people, Rohingya people, will also stop. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, of course, uh, the situation of the Rohingya people, we are in our worries and uh, coordination what happened there in the past. And I, be, uh, I believe that in the future we should uh, be aware that the, the rights of the Rohingya should be defended always. Uh, and just to, uh, I believe that we, everyone will accept. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, speaker of Yemen, uh, please, Mr. Speaker. Shukran, Sayyid al Rais. Wa sa'atum bil khair sabahan. وأميل إلى المقترح التي تقدمت فيه الزميلة من تركيا وأعتقد أننا لو وضعنا المقارنة 
بين الديمقراطية وقتل الإنسان لقدمنا قتل الإنسان على الديمقراطية وتحفزنا لها كثيرا فنحن نتحدث عن الديمقراطية في مينمار ولكن موضوع الروهنجا هو عبادة جماعية وقتل ويفترض أن ضمير العالم يتحرك في هذا الاتجاه ويحافظ على أرواح البشر ف. أن نقيم الدنيا ولا نقع يعني أمر طيب أننا نقف مع الديمقراطية باعتبارنا مؤسسة معنية بذلك لكننا أيضا معنيين بالحفاظ على أرواح البشر وأنا أتمنى أن يصدر عن هذا الاجتماع ما يشير إلى ضرورة اتخاذ موقف من أولئك القتلة والمجرمين الذين يبيدون الرهنجة بشكل فاضح وعلني ولا يبالون بحقوق الإنسان ولا بدمه ولا بعرضه ولا بماله ولا 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 يعيرونه اي اهتمام فارجو ان يكون ان ناخذ قرارا في هذا الجانب وان تتضمن وثائق هذا اللقاء او او هذا المؤتمر ما يشير الى حفاظا على دم الانسان بنفس المستوى الذي نتحدث فيه عن الديمقراطيه وشكرا سيد الرئيس Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I expressed, when uh, before the coup d'état, we condemned uh, the very frontal way what happened with the Rohingya uh, because it's the attack on basic human rights. And the uh, IPU made strong condemnations of the situation there. Of course, uh, uh, in all these cases, we continue also our efforts uh, with uh, some kind of dialogue, may I say this way, with the, re with the fact, in fact, authorities, because we wish to come back to a constitutional order. And so we may make the condemnations, but we need to have uh, channels of dialogue open. Otherwise, they will not uh, be available to hear from us, and we, we are not available to influence the transition as soon as possible to uh, the constitutional order Chile. where we, we wish uh, as soon as they happen. Chile, uh, about the situation in uh, Myanmar, of course. No. Gracias, no. gracias, Presidente. Eso sobre el punto que le preocupa a, este, a esta organización, a esta asamblea, eh, sobre países que han sido atentados eh, en su democracia interna y se les ha eh, quitado la estabilidad a los parlamentos. Eh. Yo creo que también así como se condena el, el rompimiento de la democracia en los casos que se han planteado, también tenemos que hacer una autocrítica interna como parlamentarios. Y esta organización debe procurar que los propios parlamentarios también sean eh, garantes de cuidar la democracia interna. En algunos países, como el nuestro, existen parlamentarios que abiertamente han llamado al rompimiento del Estado de Derecho, han llamado a quemarlo todo como una forma de luchar por su causa. Yo creo que esos casos también deben ser condenados por esta Asamblea, por este Parlamento, señor Presidente. Muchas gracias. Okay, uh, dear colleague, this is not about uh, Myanmar. It's a general, a general comment. Uh, I, I will say, of course, the speech of aid that sometimes we criticize in our society should be criticized also when it happens inside our own parliaments, because we as parliamentarians and we as, uh, as Democrats should give the example to the society. And people are looking to us and try to understand how can we appeal to have uh, a society where everyone can be accepted and to have the respect if we don't give the example of that inside our own parliaments. But this is uh, not... The, and if there is a physical or other kind of attack against a colleague, he can go and can appeal to the Committee of Human Rights or Parliamentarians to analyze and to defend the situation. But now about Myanmar, 
May we accept the recommendations of the Executive Committee? No opposition. It's done. Secretary General. I thank you, Mr. President. Just to add uh, regarding Myanmar and the Rohingya, that uh, this matter is constantly under review by a dedicated body of the IPU, the Committee to Promote Respect for International Humanitarian Law. And I, I would imagine that when they present their report, they would draw attention to the plight of uh, the Rohingya refugees. Thank you. Uh, we, Sudan. Sudan is, uh, stands suspended from the IPU because there's no parliament there, it dissolved completely uh, following the military coup that took place in April 2019. And that country has been in a state of instability ever since. Uh, election, elections have not taken place as have been foreseen. And now we do understand that as late as December 2022, a political framework agreement was signed that uh, uh, would pave the way towards the organization of uh, elections in uh, Sudan. You may wish, Mr. President, as you discuss this in the Executive Committee, to recommend to Governing Council to take note of this and uh, express uh, the strong wish to see those elections take place as soon as possible, according to the schedule agreed by the political leaders of uh, uh, Sudan, so that in the near future you'll have the pleasure of uh, welcoming back uh, a full-fledged parliament within the IPU. Thank you. Of course, you are, uh, we are an association of parliaments. If there is no parliament uh, in Sudan, it's not possible to have Sudan with us. Uh, I, but we can accept the recommendation of the Executive Committee and the appeal uh, to the authorities to come to a constitutional order and to have elections, because we wish to have colleagues and uh, the people of Sudan represented in our organization. No opposition. To the, the recommendation of the Executive Committee is done, Secretary General. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. We, that that was the uh, situation of parliaments that are not functioning around well. Now we go on to the transitional parliaments that are on your radar screen, and we start with Burkina Faso, where, as you know, since 2022 there have been two coups uh, as a result of dissatisfaction with the leadership of the then administration in Burkina Faso. Uh, you have discussed this matter and uh, expressed your principal position uh, that uh, you cannot condone uh, military takeovers in any country, whatever the reasons. But you have also taken note of the fact that the, the uh, military authorities have put place, in place a, uh, a transitional legislative body, uh, which is now in its second format. It has now been expanded. And you have said that uh, you want to not remain at the level of just condemning, but actually helping the uh, transitional authorities to ensure a speedy uh, return to constitutional rule in that country. And that is why you continue to maintain, you took the decision to maintain Burkina Faso's uh, membership in the IHPU, but encouraging and urging the authorities to agree to a roadmap for a uh, return to constitutional ru uh, rule, including support that the IPU can give uh, to the Transitional Legislative Assembly in this regard. I wish to report, Mr. President, that since you last met in October, I have been in contact with the Burkina Faso authorities, including the Parliament. Most recently, upon my invitation, the Speaker of the Transitional Legislative Assembly came to Geneva to reconfirm their commitment to work with the IPU with a view to bringing back normalcy to uh, Burkina Faso. At this session of uh, the Assembly, Mr. President, you remember yesterday the Burkina Faso delegation appeared before the Executive Committee to restate that commitment. So we do have a roadmap with the uh, Transitional of, uh, Legislative Assembly with a view to um, uh, coming up with uh, activities that we can do to help them uh, craft a legislative framework that would provide for a strong legal basis for new uh, Burkina Faso. So, Mr. President, you may wish to re ask your colleagues to reconfirm their decision to maintain Burkina Faso as a member and to urge them to scale up progress in implementation of the roadmap with a view to uh, completion by July 2024, as they have agreed. Uh, 
the transitional period is due to end on July 2024. And you express the strong wish that by then you will be able to welcome a fully fledged democratically elected parliament in uh, Burkina Faso. Thank you. Thank you. No opposition to, to maintain this uh, transitional legislative assembly uh, in our association, organization, and call the authorities to finish uh, on the end of July 24 the transitional period to come to the, the constitutional order. No opposition. Then. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. We move on to Chad, which is virtually in the same situation, where since uh, October 2021, there has been a transitional national council that has been established in the wake of the death of the then President uh, Idris Deby uh, on the battlefront. And uh, that transitional uh, council is the one that is managing the transitional period that uh, is now due to end in October 2024. We do understand that uh, the uh, uh, Transitional Legislative uh, Council or National Council is working with uh, the uh, various authorities, including the commission that is uh, drafting the new constitution for Chad uh, in order uh, to organize elections uh, uh, by uh, October 2024. We uh, also point out that uh, pursuant to your previous uh, a decision, the IPU uh, is providing technical support to the staff of the Transitional National Council in order to prepare that staff for when there is a fully fledged uh, legislative body in uh, Chad. Mr. President, you may wish to take note of these developments as uh, the Executive Committee uh, would like to recommend that uh, we continue to support the uh, Transitional National Council in Chad and also express the strong wish that the processes, the process in place should be accelerated with a view to organizing those elections as a schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Do everyone accept the recommendation of the Executive Committee? No opposition? Then? Guinea, Guinea-Conakry, another country in a similar situation where Parliament was dissolved in September 2021 and then a transitional legislative body uh, put in place in January 2022. You have discussed this situation as for the other cases. You have condemned military takeovers, subversion of uh, democratically elected uh, institutions, but you have also taken note of the efforts being made to re-establish constitutional rule in, in the country. So we do understand uh, from the information that has been provided by the authorities in uh, Guinea that they have a 36-month transitional period and uh, that period has now been reduced to 24 months following consultations with the regional integration bodies including ECOWAS which is the Economic Community of, uh, Central, of West African uh, States and uh, so we have a uh, transitional period of 24 months that is in place here and in the past as you have discussed this matter you have uh, taken the decision to maintain uh, guinea's membership in the ipu in the spirit of constructive engagement with them like with uh, burkina faso and, and chad and you have uh, agreed that there should be a roadmap with the uh, parliament for a, a speedy uh, return to constitutional rule and that is what we are doing i think we have now agreed on uh, what it is that the IPU can do to support the uh, parliament in uh, uh, Guinea in order to accelerate uh, the process for return to constitutional rule. Mr. President, you may wish to ask your colleagues to accept the recommendation of the executive committee to continue to monitor the situation and for the IPU to continue to support that parliament as it makes its way towards more constitutional rule. Thank you. Thank you. More one case where we needed to, to dialogue with the authorities that are on the ground and with the transitional parliament to achieve what we wish, to come back to the constitutional order and free elections in the country. And so, no opposition.
to the recommendation of the executive committee. Great. Secretary General. Like, uh, Libya, Mr. President. Libya, again, is one, uh, it looks like a maze because we ourselves who are monitoring the situation very closely are having a hard time really understanding what is going on in Libya. But just to say that uh, at some point there has been a multiplicity of parallel institutions, including parliaments, two parliaments at some point, but you have taken a decision to recognize one as the member in the IPU. And it is that parliament that was elected in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, which is based, it was initially based in Tobruk, but I do understand it's functioning out of Benghazi today. And that is the one that is represented within the IPU. I mentioned earlier that they had paid up their assessed contributions, and so they're entitled to exercise that membership fully in the IPU. There is a delegation from Libya here, and uh, we do understand that elections are now foreseen, parliamentary and parliamentary, uh, presidential elections are now foreseen in Libya by November 2023. Mr. President, uh, you and your colleagues have discussed this matter, and uh, we continue, you have uh, recommended that you continue to engage with the Libyan uh, parliamentary authorities and express the strong hope that this time elections will take place as uh, foreseen so that you can welcome a fully-fledged parliament of uh, Libya that is representative of the Libyan people. Mr. President, you may make that recommendation to Council. Thank you, uh, Secretary General. May we support the recommendation of the Executive Committee on the Libyan case? No opposition. Then? Thank you, Mr. President. Mali, no, uh, not uh, same, similar situation as in Burkina Faso, Guinea. Mr. Mr. President, uh, the Libyan delegation has expressed the wish to take the floor. I'm sorry, I'm sorry dear colleague, I didn't uh, uh, saw. <laughs> I didn't see. But, but you have the, uh, the floor on, uh, before we go to, to Mali. Please. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. لدينا بعض التوضيح حول إزاء الوضع السائد في ليبيا يبدو أن في الأمر غير واضح نعم ليبيا حديث العهد بالعمل البرلماني الديمقراطي الحر الوضع السياسي في بلادنا لازال هش لعدة أسباب جزء منها داخلي ويتحمله مجموعة السلطات أو المؤسسات في الدولة البرلمان جزء من هذه السلطات الجزء الآخر هو خارجية تمثل في تدخلات الخارجية من بعض الدول في الشأن الليبي وجزء آخر يتمثل في ضعف عمل بعثة الأمم المتحدة التي لازالت تراوح منذ عام 2011 ولم تقدم الدعم والمساعدة الليبيين بالشكل المطلوب البعثة تقوم بعمل سيء في مواجهة البرلمان تقدم إحاطات في الأمانة العامة وتقدم عمل للليبيين في هذه الإحاطات تسيء للعمل البرلمان كما تحدثنا الأزمة في ليبيا جزء منها داخلي والجزء الأكبر وحاليا شبه دولة الأزمة الليبية وأصبحت ساحة لإدارة الصراع الدولي والإقليمي على الأراضي الليبية هذا أمر يجب أن يكون واضح لكل السادة الأعضاء نحن قمنا بتسديد الاشتراكات وما حوجنا لمساعدة برلماننا الدولي في تقديم المساعدة للبرلمان الليبي من أجل وهو آخر جسم منتخب هذا أمر يجب أن يكون واضحا نحتاج إلى مخاطبة الأمين العام من أجل توجيه مبعوثيه الإحاطات التي تقدم بها الوضع الهش في ليبيا متعلق بالجانب الأمني لازال هش والوضع الاجتماعي لم تقم مصالحة بشكل مطلوب البرلمان لم يكن مسؤول على هذه المسارين أخيرا بعض النواب يتعرضون للخطف والتهديد في منازلهم منذ أقل من عشرة أيام تعرض نائب إلى الخطف لدى جهات خطبنا البعثة من أجل الإدانة لم تقم بإدانة هذا الأمر قبل هذا التاريخ أيضا سيدة نائبة تعرض منزلها إلى الاعتداء بالسلاح تقدمنا للبعثة ولم تقم بإدانة هذا العمل في حين نشاهد أن البعثة تقوم بإدانة بعض الأعمال التي لا تمثل قيمة كبيرة عمل البعثة يشكل تهديد مباشر للبرلمانيين الليبيين فهذا توضيح بسيط 
لكم وللعمل في ليبيا فالبرلمان يقوم بدوره على أكمل وجه نعم الوضع لازال سيء في بلادنا من حيث العمل البرلماني والديمقراطي بالنظر للوضع الأمني والوضع الاجتماعي فالبرلمان قام بهم ومطلوب منه فنحن نحتاج إلى دعمكم وسندتكم في هذا الأمر وشكرا Thank you. I will give the floor to the Secretary General, but uh, I believe, uh, you, you may believe, the uh, IPO will be ready day by day to help the Libyan uh, Parliament to, uh, authorities to develop, to achieve a very democratic and con constitutional parliament uh, in your country. But uh, Secretary General, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me join you in welcoming the uh, Libyan delegation to the IPU. We look forward to ongoing engagement. Of course, you, you do know, my, my colleagues may have explained to you, that we are in consultations with you, with relevant officials of the uh, Benghazi-based parliament, with a view to providing technical support to you, because we know that at the end of the electoral process there will be a full-fledged parliament in need of uh, uh, concrete technical support to get off the ground, and that is what we're doing uh, when we have those conversations with you. I encourage you to be open to those discussions with my colleagues who are here uh, to see what it is that we can agree uh, to. Uh, I remember way back in 2013 there had been an agreement with the then parliament to provide technical support but this has not uh, materialized because of the prevailing situation in Libya. The security situation has been very unstable and we have not been able to secure guarantees uh, for the integrity of uh, uh, IPU personnel uh, in, in Libya. And that is why that has stalled. But we can look into this. You mentioned the dire situation of human rights. I believe you will be here when the Committee on Human Rights of Parliamentarians presents its report. And one prominent case in Libya is before that committee. I encourage you, with regard to the other uh, cases of parliamentarians having been kidnapped or being tortured or whatever, facing all sorts of abuses, to address the complaints to the Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians so that this can be properly investigated and the IPU can pressure the authorities concerned to uh, clarify and bring the culprits to book. Thank you very much. Mr. President, with your permission, I'll move on to Mali. Yes, yes please. Mali, Mali, again, as I said, is in a similar situation as Burkina Faso. There, there was a military coup in August 2020, and uh, there has been uh, established a transitional legislative assembly that you have in the past recognized as uh, the uh, member in the IPU while expressing the strong wish to for the process to return to constitutional rule to be accelerated. And in, in Mali, you have also asked us to uh, lend support to that transitional legislative assembly in order to help speed up the process in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Mali. And that is what we have been doing uh, with uh, the Malian authorities. And we have provided a lot of support in terms of facilitating their access to the citizens to explain the ongoing political processes in their country in order to obtain their buy-in. We want to scale up this assistance to the Transitional uh, uh, Council, uh, National Transitional Council in Guinea, in Mali. And uh, Mr. President, you may wish uh, to uh, report to Council that the Executive Committee took note of these developments and uh, wants to recommend that we maintain the current approach of the organization to recognize that transitional authority in uh, Mali, but also to express the wish that the roadmap that has been established now with the support of ECOWAS, if I remember very well, that that uh, process be brought to a speedy conclusion and that the IPU should continue to provide technical assistance as he has done so far. Mr. President, recommendation to Council. Thank you. About uh, Mali, no requests from the floor. No opposition to the recommendation of the Executive Committee is then. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, South Sudan. South Sudan is uh, uh, one case where we are uh, able to report positive progress. Uh, it 
would seem that uh, the previous uh, this, uh, no, what, uh, disagreement between the various political uh, stakeholders in South Sudan, those uh, dis uh, disagreements have now been resolved and the uh, expanded uh, transitional parliament in uh, uh, South Sudan is functioning now, uh, spearheading the process towards uh, speedy uh, uh, return to constitutional rule. You see in that slide that is on the, on the screen there what has been done so far. The um, transitional period is now scheduled to end uh, in February 2025. And uh, we are told that uh, this is a very firm deadline. So, uh, Mr. President, you and your colleagues may wish to take note of the positive developments there and encourage the political authorities of the country to continue to express, to display the requisite goodwill with a view to driving the transitional process to its logical conclusion with elections by February 2024. We do understand that the constitution making process is well advanced and that uh, uh, a new constitution is foreseen by the end of February 2024. You may wish to salute these developments and encourage the authorities to continue. When we have good news, we should salute them, always. Unfortunately, are not so often as we wish. So we can endorse the recommendation of the Executive Committee. No opposition. It's done. Mr. President, we move on to Guinea-Bissau. Uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, we have reported on several occasions on the ongoing political turmoil in the country. Uh, they are moving from crisis to crisis, and elections that have been scheduled several times have not taken place. The uh, president uh, last year dissolved parliament in view of new parliamentary elections that had been initially scheduled for December 2022. Those elections have not taken place. They have been postponed to June 2023. And uh, we continue to monitor the situation. This is a country where the IPU has offered assistance to the parliament. On several occasions, we have set aside resources, financial resources, to support them in the uh, process of uh, uh, resolving the political impasse in the country and making sure that uh, parliament can function properly. We have not received any feedback from this, uh, from, our, uh, for, uh, from the authorities on our offer, but uh, we continue to monitor the situation. Mr. President, you and your colleagues took note of this worrying uh, situation, and uh, you uh, decided to recommend to Council that uh, you send a strong message to the authorities of, Burkina, uh, of uh, Guinea that uh, elections should take place now, as foreseen, uh, by June 2023, and that you'll have the pleasure of welcoming a full-fledged parliament from Guinea-Bissau, uh, I believe in Angola, later this year. Thank you. We hope that the good news will come in Rwanda, uh, Angola. Uh, it's just to information. Can we continue? Uh, we accept that the IPU should continue to monitor, monitor the situation no opposition. Taken, Secretary General. Thank you, Mr. President. You have on your list Palestine. Uh, elections haven't taken place uh, for the Palestinian Legislative Council since 2016. Uh, uh, elections had been due to take place in 2022, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but they didn't take place because of uh, a number of uh, obstacles uh, uh, raised by a variety of stakeholders in the region. The uh, Palestinian Legislative Council had been dissolved in 2018 in view of those elections. And currently, the, those elections have been uh, uh, postponed, including the, the presidential elections in a year. So uh, we have no new dates for those elections. And uh, Mr. President, when you uh, looked at uh, uh, this case, you uh, uh, decided to urge the Palestinian authorities to organize the elections as soon as possible and to make sure that uh, the, uh, there's a, a fully-fledged Palestinian Legislative Council in place as soon as possible. The UN, there is a report of the Committee on Human Rights of Parliamentarians which will be delivered in a moment, and there again, 
there are a number of cases concerning Palestinian MPs. If I'm not mistaken, I see my colleague is shaking uh, his head, but there is, there is uh, there are a number of uh, cases of, uh, uh, involving uh, members of the Palestinian Legislative uh, Council that are being discussed by the committee. Maybe they're not presenting a report this time, but they remain seized of those cases. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I'm trying to... Uh, Palestine. <laughs> Excellency Deputy Speaker. Shukran, Sayyid Rais. من الواضح أن الملاحظة التي أدرجناها في مؤتمرنا الأخير في كيغالي لم تؤخذ بعين الاعتبار حيث قلنا بأن الانتخابات الفلسطينية معطلة بسبب تعنت الجانب الإسرائيلي ورفضه للسماح للفلسطينيين بإجراء الانتخابات في القدس على الرغم من تدخل العديد من الدول ومن بينها الاتحاد الأوروبي تحديدا وكان هناك ضمانات من الاتحاد الأوروبي بعقد الانتخابات في القدس إلا أنها تعذرت في اللحظات الأخيرة واعتذر الجانب الأوروبي عن الضمانة التي قدمها السيد الرئيس محمود عباس دعا إلى انتخابات واضحة في عام 2022 وحدد التاريخ ولكن لا يمكن لنا كفلسطينيين إجراء انتخاباتنا دون أن يكون هناك لنا تواجد في هذه الانتخابات في القدس وعليه حتى يكتمل البند المقدم من طرفكم أعتقد أنه يجب أن يكون هناك دعوة واضحة من البرلمان الدولي إلى إسرائيل بعدم التدخل في الشأن الداخلي الفلسطيني والسماح بإجراء انتخابات في القدس شكرا Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Of course, the IPU uh, are aware of the situation on the ground and we will continue to talk with the authorities also of Israel because we wish to have real uh, free elections as soon as possible in all Palestine. Uh, so, may we accept the recommendations of the Executive Committee? In opposition, Secretary General. Thank you, Mr. President. Tunisia, Tunisia is a country that has experienced uh, political turmoil, uh, especially since uh, July 2021, 20, when the president suspended the, the parliament, uh, did not dissolve the parliament entirely, uh, but uh, uh, he went on to arrogate to himself uh, full powers in order to move ahead with uh, uh, developing the country, uh, including uh, reforms in the various uh, uh, institutions of the country. And uh, in line with that logic, he did uh, lead, uh, steer the country towards a new constitution that was approved um, by, uh, in July 2022. And in that constitution, uh, the president has a lot of uh, uh, powers uh, that uh, are, are assigned to, allocated to him or her, in, in, as the case may be. The uh, Constitution uh, provides for two houses of parliament in uh, Tunisia, and uh, on the basis of uh, that new Constitution, elections took place in uh, December this year and in January, two rounds of elections, and the results have only just been uh, confirmed for the uh, uh, lower house of parliament. Uh, the reports are that uh, the uh, turnout in those elections were uh, between 11 and 19 percent, and many of the president's opponents have been clamoring for an annulment of no, or non-recognition of those elections because they think that uh, it is the, the elections were illegitimate. There are, uh, of course, many calls that are coming in from, including from the, the parliament that had sub subsequently been dissolved, Mr. President, in view of those elections, not to recognize uh, that parliament. You did uh, take a decision uh, in a previous session of, uh, of uh, the uh, assembly 
that uh, you would uh, express deep displeasure at the fact that Parliament was not being allowed to perform its duty properly, and you did also subsequently condemn the dissolution of the Parliament, but you did take note of these developments and said that you would like to see a speedy return to constitutional rule, including with support from the IPU. This message was conveyed to the President of uh, Tunisia, and he welcomed IPU support, but did say that this support would only uh, be welcome when the uh, constitutional process, the parliamentary elections, had run their full course. That is uh, where we were with the situation. Since uh, Kigali, I have engaged with the Tunisian authorities, including the head of state, the true his ambassador in Geneva, and most recently in a conversation that I had in Geneva with the Tunisian Minister of Foreign Affairs. And it was confirmed to us that they would like to welcome IPU's support now with a view to bringing about more stability in the country, more uh, stringent parliamentary uh, efforts to uh, help the governance process in um, Tunisia. They have uh, suggested to us that we invite uh, a delegation of the newly elected parliament to Geneva to agree on a roadmap for support from the IPU towards uh, uh, helping them resolve those issues that have been on the forefront of the media for some time now. So, Mr. President, I have uh, agreed uh, to this approach with the uh, Tunisian authorities. I have uh, said that it is in line with your previous uh, decision here to engage the authorities with a view to resolving outstanding issues in Tunisia. So, in, recent, in, in the next few weeks, we are going to be following up on that. Mr. President, you may wish to call council to uh, agree with this. As a recommendation. No opposition. No opposition. No requests. Okay. Okay. Then. Thank you. Thank you. I'm being told that I, I need to eat the microphone so, so the interpreters can hear me very well. Thank you. Mr. President, in this category we have uh, Venezuela not because you took any particular decision in, uh, regarding Venezuela, but you just wanted to confirm the previous decision that you had taken in respect of Venezuela. And that decision was that uh, you did not recognize the two uh, competing uh, parliaments in Venezuela uh, on account of the fact that the previous one, the 2015 Assembly, ha uh, the, its mandate had expired, and the 2020 uh, Parliament uh, was not elected according to the prevailing rules uh, of uh, Venezuela. You, however, indicated that you welcome a joint delegation of both parliaments here in an observer capacity. So this is just to let you know that uh, the position uh, regarding Venezuela hasn't changed. Thank you. Yes, one update of information, no more than that. Thank you. Uh, no request, no opposition. We can go forward. Let, let me conclude with Yemen. Uh, Yemen, I, just to let you know that we continue to have Yemen on our radar screen. Uh, we do have a full-fledged delegation from Yemen. We have a counterpart uh, uh, in Yemen. I think the, I, I see the speaker from Yemen is sitting up, but, but uh, there's nothing to report apart from the fact that uh, you continue as the executive committee and now as council to continue to urge the international community to step off its efforts to resolve the ongoing crisis in Yemen. When you took the decision to recognize the, the parliament that is aligned with the internationally recognized government, you did encourage the speaker of the Yemeni parliament to engage with all the parliamentarians that were elected, I believe in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, since then, elections haven't taken place in Yemen. So, we do recognize that all MPs who were elected on that occasion continue to be the representative of Yemen. And you did encourage him, therefore, to uh, continue to federate all these parliamentarians with a view to articulating the uh, interests of the entire Yemeni uh, society. Uh, of course, there is the ongoing humanitarian crisis in the country, and I, I believe the uh, Committee to Promote International Humanitarian Law would uh, be examining this case, uh, if not in this session, but in uh, future sessions. And so you may wish to take note of these developments and encourage the 
Yemeni delegation to continue to federate all uh, the parliamentarians uh, in Yemen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General. I will give the floor to the Speaker of, of Yemen that requests. Shukran, Sayyid Rais. Wa shukran, Amin al Am. Wa ana fi'lan ta'ahab li anisat ara min bab al insaf. Ana attagih bil shukr wa taqdir li al ittihad al barlaman al dawli bi raasatihi wa aminihi al Am. Ala kull al mawaqif. Wa ana shuru anana wa nahnu. نعيش حالة حرب استمرت على مدى ثمان سنوات نجد في هذه المؤسسة ما يعيننا على الصبر وما يعيننا على الأمل وأمامنا فسحة من الأمل على الأقل تعطينا وأنا في قبل حوالي أربعة أشهر وقعت اتفاق مع الأمين العام بشأن الدعم والدعم الفني للبرلمان وهذا الأمر مقدر لكم في والأمان العالم مقدر للاتحاد البرلمان الدولي أملي هو أن تتوجه للأمان للأمان للأمم المتحدة بتوصية كاملة بأن تعمل الأمم المتحدة لإنقاذ هذا البلد الذي يعيش حالة حرب ثمان سنوات غارق في بحر من الدماء يسبح فيها ولا ولا حياة ولا منقذة وما لم تتعاون تتعاون كل زملائنا البرلمانيين أولا في موضوع إنقاذ زملائهم البرلمانيين الأربعة وأربعين الذين عملت عصابة الحوثي على إصدار أحكام إعدام بحقهم وأنتم تعلمون أن هذه العصابة ربما تصدر فتاوى منفلتة وسيقتلون البرلمانيين واحدا تلو الآخر ولن ينتظرون مجيئهم إلى صنعاء سيقتلونهم في أي مناطق كانت من العالم وأيضا أنا أتوجه بالشكر للجان الفرعية للاتحاد لأنها تعمل في موضوع اليمن بشكل جدي وصادق ومخلص وامين هذا ما احببت ان اعطيك يعني ان اشيد بدوركم وان اناشد في ان ان تعملوا كل ما بوسعكم الامين العام كلف بان يتابع الامم المتحده وارجو ان يقوم بدوره كامل وهو فعلا ممن يقومون بكامل الدور ومن اللحظات الاولى كان معنا وحاجتنا ماسه اليوم للدعم الفني وفقا للاتفاق الذي وقعناه في جنيف و سنعمل جميعا وانا التزم التزاما كاملا بان جميع البرلمانيين المنتخبين في 2003 وليس 2013 لا هم متساوين لدي وكلهم اخواننا وزملائنا لا نفرط باي منهم ونتمنى ان نتحرروا من العصابه الحوثيه ان يستطيعوا الخروج من تحت الظلم والضيم والاستبداد والحصار المفروض عليهم في منازلهم والذين لا يستطيعون مغادرة العاصمة صنعاء على الإطلاق وربما يستعرض حياتهم للخطر إذا ما أرادوا الخروج من العاصمة صنعاء شكرا سيد الرئيس Thank you Mr. Speaker for your words uh, as you know you are living a war that one day will come to an end we need to work on that and uh, as you said uh, we identify our side. Sometimes it is not easy when we have a conflict to understand and to be with the right side of history. But I feel try to be on the right side of history always. Uh, go to the next. Uh, we accept the recommendation. No opposition on, on the situation of Yemen. Then. Secretary General. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, that was all for the countries that uh, you reviewed during this uh, session of the Executive Committee. You were also apprised of the uh, po prevailing pro political situation in a number of countries that might erupt into full blown crisis uh, later. This was just to serve as an, uh, uh, an early warning uh, mechanism, and if uh, those uh, situations get out of the ha out of hand will bring that to the attention of the executive committee and the governing council but for the time being it was for the information of the executive committee so there are four words thank you thank you secretary general uh, also for the, uh, all the efforts of the of the ipu and all the staff at the, all the secretariat to accompany this uh, this situation and try to defend democracy in all countries of the world. And in light with this principle of solidarity, 
I would like to encourage everyone to do what is possible uh, from, uh, to help countries with crisis to solve their situations. We, uh, IPU is, that, is doing what is possible, but each one of us can help in some cases uh, to hit these countries to return, return to a, a normal and constitutional order, and we should make it as also. Uh, we may go to the point 10 about regional offices. Uh, just to avoid to spend a lot of time with that, uh, allow me to say, we in Kigali took a decision, it's done, uh, to open regional office in uh, Cairo and in Montevideo. The decision was taken and we approve uh, rules that needed to be accepted by the countries. And so we, we give the mandate to the Secretary General to go forward with consultations. Uh, and only when all the rules are accepted, the office may, uh, may be established in, the, in these countries or in one country and not the other. If, we, uh, if one country accepts the, uh, the rules uh, that we approve and the other will not, or if both will not, we will not open. So the Secretary, had, the Secretary General, uh, accepting the mandate of the Governing Council, did a lot of consultations during the last months. What we will have here is just one update. He will inform us, all the Governing Council, what is the point uh, uh, of these consultations? Is not to reopen the debate because the debate was taken in Kigali. Allow me to explain. Sometimes I think that I am not very well, very good in English, and people will not understand what I am saying. So I will repeat: the decision was taken. We will not reopen the debate. We will just receive the information of the point of, of the consultations given by the Secretary-General. Thank you, Mr. President. Indeed, a decision was taken that if the conditions, uh, the requirements adopted by the Governing Council were met, uh, regional offices would be open in uh, Uruguay and Egypt uh, uh, as outposts of the organization. And this would be for a pilot phase of two years, after which uh, an evaluation would be made to see if it was worth the trouble uh, continuing this. You did ask me, yes, Mr. President, that uh, I carry out those discussions with the two countries that had gracefully accepted, or rather offered to host uh, regional offices. We have carried out those consultations with Uruguay and Egypt, and I am pleased to report that uh, the consultations are progressing. Uh, not as fast as I would have hoped to be able to tell you today that I was going to conclude an agreement with them. Uh, but I think that uh, the issues, uh, the conditions that uh, you endorsed for uh, the establishment of these offices are being discussed. Some of them are being accepted and others need some clarification. That is where we are uh, at this particular stage with the two uh, parliaments concerned. And the approach is that when you did uh, provide, uh, adopt those uh, requirements and conditions, uh, it was clear that there were certain conditions that would only be met by the governmental authorities of the country concerned, and then others that would be met by the parliament. So the approach is that we will have a two-track uh, uh, two track agreement, one with the uh, government of uh, those countries, whereby they would uh, clearly recognize the IPO as an international organization entitled to all the immunities and privileges that accrue to uh, international organizations. This gives us the required protection for us to function in an independent, autonomous, and free manner without any interference. That is one thing and that we have been engaged in that. And then subsequently, on the basis of those assurances, we would sign an agreement with the parliaments concerned because the parliaments undertook to provide the resources that are required to uh, have those offices uh, function. 
So that, uh, that is where we are with those two countries. I think the executive committee discussed this uh, entirely and took note of this uh, progress. But uh, I am sure you, the executive committee wanted to accelerate uh, progress. And so they wanted to suggest to the governing council that having taken note of this progress, they could uh, agree that the secretary general go ahead and conclude those consultations. And if those con uh, consultations are satisfactory and he can ascertain that uh, all the requirements will be met, he will go ahead and conclude the relevant agreements without having to come back to council. This is because it's in line with the prerogatives that are uh, assigned to the secretary general because these offices are meant to be administrative uh, structures of the IPU and it's the secretary general who has authority over administrative structures. So he wants to make sure that uh, those offices can function according to the administrative norms of international organization. So Mr. President, you may ask governing council to take note of uh, this development and uh, agree that the Secretary General will continue consultations, will determine as and when uh, appropriate that all the conditions that you have adopted have been met. And if that is the case, he will go ahead and conclude those agreements that he has mentioned here with a view to the establishment of those offices, once again, on a pilot ba tr uh, basis for two years. Mr. President, over to you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, as you said, sometimes we wish that the things happen more quick, but uh, we may also understand, uh, and uh, I will understand, that uh, we are talking about uh, something that is new. If we open these uh, offices, and if after the two years we'll, uh, we will uh, make a positive evaluation and we will go to, to open more, we already will have the experience of, of the negotiations, we will have the experience of the, of the agreements that need to be signed and may, it will be more easier. This is the, something new and so sometimes we don't have the, the velocity that uh, everyone wish. Uh, the people that know me uh, understand that. For me, we should open it tomorrow morning. But I may understand that it is not possible because the Secretariat, and especially the Secretary General, needs to defend the organization and to understand that everything is in accordance with uh, the, what the Governing Council approved. Uh, what, uh, the, the request, it's very easy, is to, to mandate the Secretary General to continue the efforts uh, of consultations and when uh, all the conditions uh, are respected, it can sign the agreements, of course. Because if we agree, if we make the proposals of, uh, of the rules, if all rules are accepted, he will have the power and uh, with the endorsement of the Governing Council to sign the agreements. I, I, saw, uh, I understood that Madam uh, Speaker of Tanzania asked the floor. Uh, please, Madam. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. I would like to uh, acknowledge what you have just said about um, the establishment of the pilot offices in the two places. I remember we, uh, as the African geopolitical group, we registered our concerns in Kigali. And the concerns that were raised then still stand because as Africa geopolitical group, we have not been consulted. So these consultations that are going on, which are being led by the Secretary General, I appreciate them, but I'll appreciate more if the word that was given to the Africa geopolitical group in Kigali that you're going to consult it, we would appreciate that this group is consulted. It's important, Mr. President, because Egypt is our brother, is our sister in Africa. 
We also acknowledge the fact that Egypt is part of the Arab group, but geographically, Egypt is in Africa. And by all means, we support Egypt. We need to consult each other. Who is this office going to serve? We are not against the Arab brothers and sisters. We are not against Egypt, which sits in Africa. So we are together in the AU. We have no personal issues against Egypt. All we need is to be consulted. Now, the words that are coming from your good chair, Mr. President, is such that consultations have been going on, OK? But we haven't been consulted. Fine. You're saying a decision was taken in Kigali. OK. But the last time, I, uh, if my, my memory serves me correct, you said in Kigali, we are not taking any decision. We will take now. So now, if a decision was taken in Kigali, that's a surprise for the African group. Because even when we met in this uh, recent one on the 10th, this matter came up. And I reported, as they are president, that this matter hasn't been concluded because we have not been consulted. That's all we are asking. Not more than that, not less than that. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Madam uh, Speaker, thank you for. Now I see the Speaker of Yemen, and then we came back uh, to the Secretary General. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, allow me just to, to ask, because the, our, our Secretary said to me, this is not the case, because I identify we are talking about speakers, but when are other members of delegations, please tell your name in the beginning uh, of your intervention to, to the minutes to be correct. In this case, it is not necessary because I identify the speaker of the, of the parliament of Yemen. شكرا سيد الرئيس وأولا الشكر والتقدير لك وللأمين العام على الجهد الذي بذلتموه وعلى اتخاذ مثل هذا القرار ونحن نتمنى معك أن يعجل الأمر وأن يفتح المكتب خلال الأيام القادمة وليس خلال شهور أو سنوات أو أن يظل يتداول في أروقة الاتحاد وفي اجتماعاته لأن مثل هذا المكتب في مصر بالذات يقدم لن يقدم خدمة لمصر ولكنه للعالم العربي أجمع ولأفريقيا ولجزء من دول آسيا ومصر لديها تجربة كبيرة جدا في العمل الديمقراطي هي أول من سبقتنا في المنطقة إلى هذا العمل بل وأقول لك بكل صراحة نحن في اليمن لوائحنا كلها كانت تعتمد على اللوائح التي كان يعتمدها مجلس الشعب المصري عام 1922 وظلينا نعمل على هذه اللوائح ووفقها فمصر صاحبة تجربة ثرية وغنية وأنا أتمنى على أن نأخذ قرارا بأن يكلف الأمين العام بإكمال التفاوض وإكمال المشاورات والبدء في الخطوات العملية لأن العودة إلى المجلس الحاكم معناه أن الناس نجتمع بعد ستة أشهر من جديد وسنأخذ قرار جديد وسيكون من المتعذر فتح هذا المكتب بشكل عاجل بعض قضايا ربما يمكن التنازل عنها من خلال قبل توقيع الاتفاق إذا كانت ليست ضرورية فلا أتمنى أن الاتحاد يتمسك حرفيا ببعض النصوص وعلى حساب المصلحة العامة التي سنجدها في وجود المكتب في مصر وكما أشرت إليه بأنه سيقدم خدمات قليلة لأعضاء كثر سواء في يعني عدد البرلمانات الأفريقية والعربية والآسوية التي ستكون على مقربة من هذا المكتب ستشعر بأن الاتحاد يؤدي دوره على أكمل وجه وأنه حريص كل الحرص وعلى أن يقدم خدماته وأن يرتبط بالبرلمانات في العالم ارتباطا وثيق ليس عبر الاجتماعات في جنيف ولا عبر الاجتماعات السنوية التي تعقد في هنا أو هناك وإنما من خلال التواصل المستمر والارتباط الوثيق بكل برلمانات العالم وعلى مقربة منها جغرافيا وفي مناطق يمكن الاستفادة منها ويمكن التعامل معها ويمكن للاتفاقية التي توقع مع الاتحاد مصر بالإمكان أن يقرأ فيها مزيدا من 
الخطوات الفنية والدعم للبرلمانات من خلال التدريب والتأهيل وعملية الاستفادة من التجارب الثرية والغنية في مصر فأرجو أن يحسم القرار بأن نفوض الأمين العام تفويضا كاملا بالوصول إلى الاتفاق والبدء بالخطوات العملية على أرض الواقع على أرض الواقع وشكرا Thank you. Shukran. So, uh, uh, as I said, what uh, we are receiving the information about the, the, the state of the art uh, of, on these consultations, what the Governing Council will endorse now is the Sec Secretary General to go ahead, uh, to try to finish the consultations uh, as soon as possible. And, and when uh, the consultations achieve the agreement that is needed to, in accordance with the rules approved in Rwanda, uh, you have the power to sign the agreement. No opposition on that? Uh, Secretary General, please. No, no, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I just. I just want for us to be clear what the decision in Kigali was. The decision in Kigali was that you agreed in principle to open offices in Uruguay and uh, Cairo. You agreed that these offices would be open on condition that the criteria and requirements that you approved in Kigali were fully met. These uh, criteria were appended to the uh, document that was circulated to all the members. And that is the guiding document that the Secretary General has used with his colleagues to carry out the consultations that you mandated him to do. But we also note that on the floor of the deliberations in Kigali, a number of concerns were raised with regard to the character of the office in uh, Cairo, whether it would be for Africa or for uh, the Arab countries. The requirements that you endorsed said that the office, the projected office, would need uh, to have the support of a geopolitical group. And it was ascertained in that case that for Cairo, that support had come from the Arab group as, uh, you know, the, their preferred choice. However, Mr. President, the Honorable uh, Speaker from Tanzania is right that those concerns were, would be factored into the consultations that uh, are taking place now. The con those consultations have not concluded yet, and uh, we have strongly encouraged the uh, sponsors of the office in Cairo to be in touch with the coordinator of the Africa group in order to resolve any outstanding misunderstanding so that uh, we can then speedily conclude these consultations. I do not know whether this is satisfactory to Madam Speaker or not, but uh, as far as the Secretary General is concerned, the legal requirement for him to pursue cons uh, consultations is that there is a, an endorsement by the geopolitical group concerned. We do have that endorsement from the Arab inter, uh, group of the IPU. But of course, those concerns that you have raised are legitimate, and I'm sure that uh, the uh, uh, Egyptian counterparts would like to take that into consideration as we continue the consultations. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General. So. Uh, Tanzania, please. Thank you so much. I, w I just wanted clarity on one matter. Who's, uh, who is going to consult who? Is the Secretary General and his good, good office going to consult the Africa group? Or it's Egypt who is going to consult the Africa group? Or who, who 
whose responsibility it is, because we are going to give the mandate to the Secretary General to conclude and enter into agreements with the respective two countries. So who is going to consult the Africa group? That's the clarity I wanted. So that next time we don't have to blame anybody who is not really mandated by this body to consult us. That's all. Secretary General. I, Mr. President, I, I hear uh, the speaker from Zimbabwe wants to take the floor. I, I, I didn't see, I'm sorry, I'm sorry speaking with them. And South Africa, please. Hmm? Yep. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Speaker Budend, I understood that you wish to, to yes. rise for uh, to um, Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, listening very carefully to the Secretary General, he appears to be saying that he, the office is for the Arab group. I think that's a misrepresentation. Our understanding and with our conversation with my brother, uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives in Egypt, and listening very carefully to the contribution by Yemen, the office is in Africa. The office will service Africa and its regional parliaments. And the service can be extended to the Arab League. We have no problem with that. But uh, the uh, insinuation by the Secretary General that the office for the Arab, uh, Arab, uh, Arab, uh, Arab League I think is wrong. First, is wrong in terms of, in terms of, the clear interpretation of geopolitical group. In terms of geopolitical group, Egypt is our sister republic, who has contributed enormously towards the liberation of many countries on the African continent. And we have had great respect for Egypt as the cradle of African civilization and the decolonization process. And we cannot see how we can divest that relationship suddenly. And I believe our brothers in Egypt do appreciate that, that they've had a very strong historical and political relationship with African countries. And we have no qualms for the office to be also open to service the Arab League and not the insinuation that has been given by the Secretary General. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I give the floor to other speakers of Parliament, uh, what I wish is uh, it's real uh, to understand a few things, please. We had this discussion in Kigali. We are clever, we are not stupid, we don't need to repeat all the arguments two, two three, four, five times. We understood the situation. And so, the situation is, is on the table and will, will be in account in the process of negotiation with Egypt. That we should find a dialogue process with the African uh, geopolitical group and only after the, the agreement will be achieved and all the requests of the, that we approve in uh, Rwanda will be achieved, it will be possible to sign the agreement. I think that the Secretary General understood very well what is the feeling 
of many colleagues from Africa. And I understand also that the Egypt authorities understood very well the feeling of our colleagues from Africa. We don't need to repeat the arguments 10 times because we are not stupid. And so I think that I will request, if it's possible, to go ahead. But uh, of course, I will give the floor. But please, we have a very tough agenda today. It is not possible. Uh, otherwise, uh, Dr. Jamal and the Speaker needs to host one more day uh, the assembly of IPU here in Bahrain. I know that everyone loves Bahrain, they, everyone wishes to stay one more day, but it is not in our schedule. We should finish our work today. And so, this way, uh, South Africa. On a point of order, Mr. President. Uh, a point of order is, is in, yes, in front yes. of, uh, I, I of the intervention uh, of South Africa. Uh, the use uh, of speaker your Mudeanda, word. Please. You, you have the floor, Mr. Speaker. The use of your word, stupid. We are not stupid. N we are not. It no obviously one. may mean those that are contributing are stupid. No, sir. No, I, at I all. I think that should be withdrawn. Uh, no, I, I never, never, sir. I just try to understand that you don't, you don't need to, all of, to have 10 interventions to say the same thing because the Secretary General, myself, and the Egyptian authorities understood the, the, the message that Madam Speaker from Tanzania Express. And now I have 10 more interventions asking the floor, I think, all, all them to repeat the same idea. This is. If no, someone no, no. thought no, no, that no. I, am, I am, or the Secretary General, or the Egyptian authorities, this is what I am asking for. Uh, we understood very well the, the arguments of Your Excellency and from Madam Speaker. And, but if you wish to repeat ten times, okay, we will hear ten. No, no, ten no. Mr. President, it's not a question of repeating. It's a question of disabusing what the Secretary General said that the office will be for the Arab League. That's what we want, uh, disabused. That's all. Otherwise, there's no need for further debate. Mr. President. Speaker, is a point of order, Kenya? Yeah, yeah, if yes, it is, uh, but I'm uh, from South Africa, but I'm speaker. I uh, I'm sorry, I need to wait a little bit, uh, because the point of order uh, in accordance yes, yes. with the rules of, uh, is first. Mr. President, uh, the Right Honorable Madam Turia Africa Geopolitical Group, you know when you refer the President as Speaker of Tanzania, you are not giving her a title because she is speaking on, on behalf of so many other countries, Africa Geopolitical Group. So when she is on the floor, she is not representing Tanzania, but Africa in your political group. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, uh, excuse me for if I don't uh, address you well, but, but you know, when someone asks the floor, we don't know in what quality uh, we'll speak. But now I understand very well, Madam Speaker, uh, presented the position of the African group and not the, the Tanzania. Uh, South Africa, I'm sorry now, where is South Africa? Is there. Madam Speaker, I'm Thank sorry for the delay. No, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I think it is a pity that this matter has been dragged for so long. And it has been dragged for this long now because of how you responded to the remarks which were made by the chair of the geopolitical group, the speaker from Tanzania. I think we should accept that in the presentation of this matter for a decision, there was an omission, and that omission was the word consultation. And this is what the speaker was saying. None of us are, op are opposed to Egypt, precisely because of the historical relations the African, most Af African countries have with Egypt. And we do understand that 
Egypt, there would be certain things which maybe would not be able to provide, which Egypt can do. So, and therefore, there may be support for Egypt, but you shouldn't come across as though you are imposing the decision on Egypt. The principle of regional offices was agreed to. Not only was it agreed to, it was mentioned that these were pilots. And the issue did arise at the meeting of the geopolitical group that we need to be assured that the pilot in Egypt, that office will service both the African continent and the Arab League, because Egypt does belong to the Arab League, whereas geographically it is in the African continent. Those were the issues which were raised. And therefore, I do want to say this, that uh, I think it was an error, it was a mistake, it was an omission, and I think we should take, uh, you should take responsibility for that, because the matter is raised now, because you left the word consultation. Lastly, Chairperson, President, a country which has an interest in hosting cannot be assigned the task of being the one that goes around consulta consulting. It should be the secretary of the organization, Secretary General, who goes out and consults with the geopolitical groups, and then you may go ahead afterwards and, and sign the agreement with Egypt. I repeat, none of the countries in the continent have a problem with Egypt. What is a problem is that decision being imposed on the continent rather than putting the emphasis on the consultative processes which must be undertaken. Thank you very much. And I don't want to repeat the issue raised by uh, the Speaker Mdende. I, I think that word should never have even arisen. And also, when people are responding to issues which are raised by members, don't patronize us. Just talk to the issues and let's get an understanding because this forum is a consultative forum by its nature. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, South Sudan. Where is South Sudan? I think it was in error, Mr. President. OK. okay. So Egypt? شكرا سيادة الرئيس شكرا معالي الأمين العام لقد أفضتم كثيرا وأوضحتم بالمستندات أن القرار قد اتخذ فعلا في كيجالي أما ما يلي ذلك من طلبات بعض الدول الصديقة فقد استضفنا السيد موديندو في القاهرة وأوضحنا له الآتي بعد أن كررنا كثيرا ذلك في كيجالي الموافقة تمت من المجموعة الجغرافية العربية وليس من أرب ليك جامعة الدول العربية ليست عضوا هنا ولكن المجموعة الجيوسياسية العربية أرجو التفرقة بين الحالتين حتى لا ندخل جامعة الدول العربية في مجال المناقشة بعد اتخاذ القرار أوضحنا أن الأداة التي وفق عليها في إقامة المكتب الإقليمي في القاهرة هو من المجموعة العربية ولكن هذا المكتب وأوضح وبصورة قاطعة سوف يخدم كل المحيط المجاور سواء الدول القريبة منا في آسيا أو في أفريقيا وسيلة القرار من المجموعة العربية غرض القرار هو خدمة المحيط كله المحيط كله غني عن البيان ولا أزيد ولا أكرر الصداقة القوية التي تجمعنا بأشقائنا الأفريقيين 
المكتب سوف يكون في خدمتهم أوضح وليسنا في حاجة إلى مفاوضات أو تسويات في هذا الشأن أوضح للمرة الأخيرة أهلا ومرحبا بكل الأشقاء الأفارقة سوف يخدمكم هذا المكتب الوسيلة عربية ولكن الهدف لكل الدول المحيطة بلا استثناء وطبعا أغلبيتها من قارة أفريقيا الأم أفريكا is our mother ونعتز بها كثيرا شكرا سيادة الرئيس Of course, uh, not to give the Morocco, just uh, Secretary General may confirm, but in our requests, uh, one of them is to have the agreement of the geopolitical group. Uh, otherwise, it uh, will not be possible to accept. If a country A from Asia this, uh, make uh, an invitation to host, needs to have the agreement of the other uh, countries of this uh, geopolitical group uh, to host the office there. Uh, this is one of the requests, I think, uh, the written, or at least the agreement we achieve in, uh, in Kigali. Uh, but uh, I will give the floor to Morocco. أنا متفق معك سيد الرئيس على أن لا حاجة لنا لإعادة النقاش لأننا تناقشنا كثيرا فيما يخص إجاز هذا المكتب في مصر وهي أولا كانت تتخذ القرار لإنشاء هذا المكتب القرار من حيث المبدأ في مصر وفي دولة من الدول الأمريكا اللاتينية خانتني الذاكرة أريد أن أشكر بهذه المناسبة المتحدث رئيس برلمان زيمبابوي ولا كذلك المتحدث باسم جنابوي إفريقيا على الدور المحوري الذي لعبته مصر دائما سواء على الصعيد العربي او على الصعيد الافريقي فمصر فيها دوله رائده افريقيا رائده عربيا ورائده دوليا افريقيا من الدول المهمه في الديمقراطيات الناشئه وبالتالي لم ارى ان هناك خلاف ما بين المجموعه الجيوسياسيه العربيه او المجموعه السياسيه الافريقيه فيما يخص انشاء المكتب هناك خلافا فيما يخص النقاش وكذلك سوء تقدير فيما يخص الشرح ديال شرح الامين العام لمفهوم المشاورات وكذلك شرح كذلك الكلمات التي ادرجت على ان هذا المكتب له علاقه بالجامعه العربيه لا لا الجامعه العربيه دول لا علاقه له بالبرلمان كما قال رئيس المجلس الشعبي المصري لا علاقه له له علاقه بالمجموعه الجيوسياسيه العربيه الممتلئه الان والان نلاحظ على ان جل المتدخلين لا يو لا, يو لا, لا يريدون ان يعرقلوا انشاء هذا المكتب لان هذا المكتب اذا اردنا ان يكون فلا بد من مجموعه جيوسياسيه ان ان تضع الطلب ومصر وضعت الطلب عن طريق المجموعه الجيوسياسيه العربيه ولكن هذا المكتب سوف يكون مكتبا كما قال زملائي في جنوب افريقيا وفي زيمبابوي ان يكون مكتبا للعالم العربي وللمجموعة الجيوسياسية الإفريقية كاملة أن يمثل المجموعة الجيوسياسية العربية والمجموعة الجيوسياسية الإفريقية هذا هو الموضوع وبالتالي نتمنى أن تتم هذه المشاورات على هذا الأساس ويتم البدء تجريبيا لنقل الأمين العام على أن هذا المكتب سوف يكون تجريبيا لكي نلاحظ مدى نجاعته لكي يتمكن الاتحاد البرلمان الدولي من انشاء مكاتب اخرى في قارات اخرى شكرا لك السيد الرئيس Thank you Morocco uh, now to conclude the item uh, secretary general Thank you thank you Mr President Mr President it has to be clear that the Secretary General did not at any time refer to the Arab League in these discussions. I referred to the Arab Geopolitical Group. That is the official entity within the IBU. Should be, as a matter of uh, record, that should be clear. So um, I think that it is important that clarification be sought. You are being asked to give the responsibility to the Secretary General to conclude agreements when the conditions are right. And
the Secretary General wants to see, receive clarification on those conditions. As far as I am concerned, those conditions are those that are included in this document that you approved in Kigali. And in that document, it was said one of the conditions is for the uh, regional office to be established with the concurrence of a Joe political group. I did point out that the Joe political group that has sponsored this particular proposal for Egypt was the Arab countries. I do remember also that there were discussions in Kigali expressing concern. Now, my question to the governing council was whether agreement between the Africans and the Arabs would be a precondition for opening an office in Cairo. That is the clarification I wanted. And I do now, as a result of the discussions here, understand the sense of this meeting, that this office should not be seen as an Arab office alone, but an Arab plus Africa office. If that is the decision that you agree to, the Secretary General will proceed accordingly with consultations between the, all, the, all the sides. But I just wanted to be sure that uh, concluding an agreement was not conditional on agreements between Africa and uh, the Arab geopolitical group because that was not one of the uh, criteria that you identified in the document that you approved. I would like for us to protect ourselves, including the Secretary General, when he takes up a responsibility, he wants to be sure that he can fully implement that re responsibility according to the spirit and the letter of the law. And that is why I thought it was important for you to clarify this matter for the Secretary General, for him to be able to implement it in a way that is satisfactory to the broad membership. I did not yeah. Uh, yeah. Disagree, disagree with what uh, Speaker Mudenda was saying. But of course, we can help facilitate consultations, but on the basis of something that is agreed to by the membership. I would not like to go and secure personal uh, agreements that are not in line with what you are saying here. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, I saw that uh, His Excellency the Speaker of Yemen uh, wish to take. Uh, I will, uh, say, uh, Excellency, uh, please, 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I want to thank the President and the Prime Minister and say that Mصر is a country of power and is not the owner of this school or the owner of it. The school is the owner of the parliament and the owner of all the discussions and the discussions is the owner of the Prime Minister. للالتحاد وقيادة الاتحاد ولا ولا نحشر مصر بأن نحول القضية عربية أفريقية لا نحتاج لاتفاق بين العرب والأفارقة نحن أشقاء ومصر كانت في قلب العالم العربي وفي قلب أفريقيا فلا فأرجو أن نبتعد عن عن هذه اللغة بأن نبرم اتفاقا بين العرب والأفارقة بشأن المكتب فالاتحاد البرلماني الدولي يجب أن يكون جاد وصاحب مسؤولية مسؤولية كاملة لأنه هو صاحب الفكرة وهو صاحب المبدأ وهو صاحب الملكية ومصر دولة مستضيفة فقط الشيء الثاني أرجو من الأشقاء أنا العرب في الدول الخليج أن يتحملوا مسؤوليتهم المالية أن يلتزموا ماليا لأن مصر لا تستطيع أن تتحمل أي التزامات مالية الشيء الثالث لي طلب من, من الأخ الرئيس من الزميل الرئيس من الصديق الرئيس أن يقول كلمة صغيرة وهو أن إذا كان فهم كلامي خطأ فأنا أعتذر لأن الزملاء رؤساء البرلمانة الذي سأهم كلمة الكلام الذي صدر عن الآخر الرئيس أرجو أن يلطف الأجواء هو وشكرا وشكرا سي آخر الرئيس Thank you شكرا إيطالي I don't know if it's point of order or I, I would like to help the discussion by responding to the question that the Secretary General just posed. I mean, uh, of course, we're not involved directly, we're not part of any of the regional groupings, but I think if we are discussing how to proceed, and if the Secretary General just asked the Governing Council whether he has to proceed 
with a clear mandate. I think that the question is whether the mandate is if there is a pre precondition uh, for, to proceed further to have the agreement of the regional groupings concerned. For what concerns Italy, yes, it is a precondition to have the two regional groupings consulted and that the consultation be done by the Secretary General. And I think this concerns us because it is a precedent that can hold also for other regions if we want to establish in the future other regional offices. So just to help the discussion go further. Thank you, Italy. I think you clarified the situation. Can we go ahead with, uh, with uh, this uh, clarification proposed by, uh, by our colleague? So it's done. You can <laughs> go ahead, Secretary General, this uh, not easy task, but uh, I, we hope all that we will end in a very positive way. Point 11, cooperation with the United Nations. Uh, the, the, the Secretary has entered you, the Bureau of the Standing Committee of United Nations Affairs, to prepare uh, one approach and a roadmap that is uh, in front of all of us. And so uh, I will try I will ask the Secretary General if you wish to, to present it or if we can just adopt it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I recognize uh, that uh, delegates may not have had the time to uh, read uh, that note uh, carefully. I just want to provide some background, some perspective, and that's all. And you, you remember that in Kigali you did adopt the new political project for the IPU with the United Nations. That included a number of actions that you were going to carry out in the context of uh, the new IPU strategy. And one of the steps in that roadmap was a review of the structure, working methods, and strategies of the Committee on UN Affairs. When you approved the roadmap for the political project in Kigali, you asked clearly that the Committee on UN Affairs should be consulted before a clear-cut strategy was adopted for its mandate. That those consultations have now taken place between the Secretariat and the Bureau of uh, the Committee on UN Affairs. A note has been prepared that has been discussed by the Committee on UN Affairs at this session of the uh, assembly and we now understand that it has been endorsed entirely uni unanimously by the committee. The document is therefore presented to you for, by way of information to say that yes, what you had asked to be done to consult the, the, the uh, Committee on UN Affairs has taken place and it has come up with a strategy, a new working methods that it will henceforth follow in prosecuting its mandate. So, Mr. President, Council is being called on to take note of uh, progress in the implementation of the roadmap and to take note of this uh, note that has been prepared as part of the uh, record of the mandate of the Committee on UN Affairs. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Secretary General. May we accept the roadmap and the, all the uh, information of the, of the note and so mandate to go ahead with the implementation of it. No opposition, it's done. And we will go to the point 12, a report on the work of the IPU Task Force on the peaceful resolution of the war in Ukraine. Uh, once again, I will express my gratitude uh, oh, sorry the, I wish to, uh, to express my gratitude 
to the, all members of the task force because it is a very hard work, but this is one of the spirits of our organization. When we have a conflict, and in this case a war, we should be involved, try to put an end, try to put an end that is essential to save lives. And so all members of this uh, task force are doing all the best. Sometimes a little bit frustrated, I know, because uh, the war is not over, but they don't uh, give up and continue. Thank you to all members of this, of this task force. I will give the floor to the, one of the members, Madam Speaker of South Africa, to update all of us with the information of the efforts. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Colleagues, all members of the IPU who are here. Just a brief background which reminds all of us that the IPU Task Force on the Peaceful Resolution of War in Ukraine was formed in March 2022. This was further to an emergency item resolution adopted by the 144th IPU Assembly in Nusa Dua. The primary objective of the task team is to promote political dialogue in support of peace-building efforts in strict observance of the UN Charter and the principles of international law, including national sovereignty, territorial integrity, and refraining from the threat and use of force. In the course of 2022, the task force held six online sessions. In July 2022, we undertook a first mission to Kyiv and Moscow to meet with the respective parliamentary leadership and better understand the situation on the ground and identify modalities favorable to the cessation of hostilities and a return to diplomatic dialogue. In October 2022, the task force met in Kigali in the context of the 145th IPU assembly. We held meetings, hearings with the delegations from both Ukraine and Russian Federation and reported to the governing council on our work. The task force deplored the global ramifications of the conflict which have hindered countries' responses to the SDGs, the global health crisis and the climate emergency. The war has also triggered a severe food and energy crisis with a negative impact on the economy and on political and social stability in several countries around the world. The task force underscored the responsibility of parliaments to defend the lives of the people and provide humanitarian relief. In turn, both parliaments welcomed the efforts of the task force in opening channels of communication and promoting parliamentary diplomacy and underscored their willingness to engage in consultations. In December 2022, the task force issued a call urging the parliaments of both the Russian Federation and Ukraine to do everything within their powers to bring their respective governments to declare and implement a ceasefire, particularly during the brutal winter months, and prevent a humanitarian catastrophe. The task force also invited the parliaments to continue discussions in person at IPU headquarters in Geneva. In, in the meantime, it decided to engage with other organizations including the European Union, the Council of Europe, and the OSCE, in order to gain a broader perspective of the situation. This meeting, this in-person meeting, should have taken place in February 2023. Neither the ceasefire for which the task force had called 
for, nor a visit by both sides to IPU headquarters to continue consultation materialized. The head of the, the Ukrainian delegation responded that war-related financial restrictions impeded their ability to travel to Geneva. Whilst the deputy speaker of the Nash Russian Council of Federation responded that political sanctions imposed by the Swiss authorities prevented the delegation from coming to Geneva. The IPU secretariat reiterated that in keeping with the IPU's host country agreement, the Swiss authorities would provide visas for Russian MPs coming to Geneva on official IPU business. On the 13th of March, 2023, the IPU task force met for the eighth time during the 146th IPU assembly in Manama. Task force members acknowledged that the situation on the ground and current geopolitics did not grant the necessary circumstances for a ceasefire to be implemented nor for both parties to be brought to the same table. However, the task force reinstated its commitment to pursue spaces of dialogue in a bilateral manner, to meet more often and to identify with both delegations possible ways to ease humanitarian consequences um, of the war. The task force has proposed to engage both Ukrainian and Russian delegations on the following points, identified, of course, as elements in which a level of convergence could be achieved. One, nuclear safety. In other words, refraining from military attacks in the proximity of nuclear power plants. Two, food security enhancing the current grain deal which was facilitated by the United Nations and Turkey. Three, protection of environmentally vulnerable sites. And fourth, access to and exchange of prisoners of war. The delegations from both Ukraine and the Russian Federation welcomed the work of the task force. They reiterated its importance noting that the IPU is one of the last forums in which both parliaments are still present. They also noted that the unique strengths of the IPU included good and long-standing relations with both delegations, access to influential decision makers, and a strong network of partnerships within the global parliamentary community. The two delegations welcomed the task force idea to focus on specific points where small steps forward can be made and expressed their interest in receiving a more detailed proposal from the task force. They also agreed to examine such a document and to respond to the task force with their views. So our next step following this meeting of the 13th are, one, that the task force will send to the parliaments of Ukraine and the Russian Federation a letter detailing avenues to mitigate the humanitarian consequences of the war in the above mentioned four areas, the ones I've just mentioned to you. The second issue is that the task force will seek to engage with other parties that may help bring about positive change in the context of ongoing escalation of conflict. And the last matter, once responses have been re received, the task force will endeavor to find possible avenues of convergence and invite both delegations to convene in a suitable venue for continued discussions. The United Arab Emirates and South Africa stand ready to host such meetings. I thank you all. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for your presentation and again by your commitment, uh, personally, uh, a personal commitment in this task force to achieve the dialogue that is essential between both countries. I see that Ukraine uh, wish to 
to uh, ask raise uh, the floor. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to make only two points with regard to this task force uh, report. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, since the term ceasefire is mentioned several times in this document, I think what is really missing and what should be ignored in this document is a reference to the provisional decision taken exactly one year ago by the ICJ, by the International Court of Justice, on preliminary measures. I will quote only one phrase from this uh, extremely important decision regarding ceasefire. It says that Russia must suspend the military operations launched in Ukraine on 24th February immediately. And my question is why there is no reference to this important decision of ICJ and what was the reaction of Russia to this implementation? It should be mentioned. It, it, we cannot ignore this. And second point, regarding uh, the tone of, um, of the whole document, of the report. Because when a person uh, reads this document, he might get false impression that it's not understandable from this document who is the aggressor and who is the victim of the aggression. And when we use the term aggression, we use uh, international legal qualification, international legal term. And that's why we should have the answer, because even in the title of this document, war in Ukraine, it's misleading. One might think that it's internal conflict, whereas from the perspective of international law, it's uh, war, aggress war of aggression committed by Russia against Ukraine. And we should be truthful about this. It's, it's a very important issue. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Ukraine. I don't know if uh, I did see other uh, countries asking the floor. And that's uh, why I will ask if Madam Speaker, on behalf of the, of the task force, if you have any comment to the questions raised by the Ukrainian uh, delegation. Thank you very much, uh, President. This is a report of the task force. Members of the task force are not here. However, I do want to make the point, which is this, that it is important for the task force to maintain its impartiality in the way, manner in which it conducts its business, but also in the manner in which it reports to assemblies such as this one. Thank you very much, President. Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. Uh, Secretary General, please. Thank you very much. I appreciate what the uh, uh, delegate from uh, Ukraine has uh, just said and what Madam Speaker from uh, uh, South Africa and member of the task force has said. The, uh, of course, that information that has been providing regarding the ICG uh, uh, decision will certainly be uh, uh, looked into by the task force as it continues its deliberations. Uh, so and clarification will be sought in that regard. Regarding the uh, title of uh, that, the report, the task force, the title of the task force is the title that was adopted by the membership of the IPU. It is not something that has been in, invented uh, uh, by, by the task force itself. That is its official title. But we do take the point that you have made about who is the aggressor or the aggressee. And I think it's very clear from the very beginning, from the IPU's uh, very earlier deliberations on the uh, war, uh, that uh, the aggressor is known and the aggressee is known. It's very clear to everybody. And, and it's a matter of record that uh, this is the case. So thank you. Thank you. We took uh, good note of the report uh, and uh, we will incentive our colleagues that are members of this uh, very important uh, mission to go ahead with all the efforts. We go to the point 13, report on specialized uh, meetings.
the first one. I'm sorry, I think there is, a, because of logistic questions, Secretary has uh, agreed and proposed that uh, we can go forward to the point uh, 14 uh, and, and we, later on we came to the point 13. Yeah. Why? Because uh, the report uh, of the Committee on, on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians is always a little bit extended and try to avoid it to be interrupted for, uh, during the lunch time. This way we will begin and finish this report. And if we have uh, time, we came back to the 13 because it is not so, so long. And so this way I will give the floor to Mrs., uh, Mr. Kogliati, uh, the chairperson of the Committee of Human Rights of Parliamentarians. And again, thank you also to all members of this task force, uh, of this committee, because they are defending our colleagues. And this is one of, for me, the most important committee of uh, IPU. You have Thank, the... you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues, I have the honor to present to you the report of the Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians. Our committee during its session in Bahrain held 11 hearings, in the course of which it met with the authorities as well as complainants. I would like to thank all of those who took the time to respond to the committee's invitation by video conference and in person here in Bahrain. During its session, the committee examined the situation of 250 parliamentarians in 14 countries. It also adopted admissibility decision in two new cases and declared inadmissible one case. The draft decisions that I will present for approval by the Governing Council concern 190 parliamentarians in more than 10 countries. But before I do that, dear colleagues, let me just say a few words about the importance of honoring and respecting the core values of our organization, the Interparliamentary Union. Our organization was built on the premise of dialogue, inclusion, and the possibility for diverse opinions to be heard and shared in the context of our work. We know from our own parliaments that there can be fundamental and very serious dis disagreements in our chambers, even among ourselves. We know that it is not necessarily a joy to hear our opponents criticize us, but it is an essential ingredient of democratic life. Only by engaging with one another and keeping the door open to dialogue can we really advance together. We think it is critical that we honor the spirit of openness and inclusion within our IPU assemblies as well, irrespective of whether it concerns member parliaments or even permanent observers. Let me now turn to my presentation of the cases in alphabetical order per region. And let's first start with Africa and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is the first time, dear colleagues, that I am reporting to you on the situation of three parliamentarians in the DRC. One of them had its parliamentary mandate arbitrarily invalidated for absenteeism, and the two others were arbitrarily prevented from resuming their parliamentary functions. Despite the medical certificates explaining his absence, Mr. Papiniango's parliamentary mandate was invalidated for absenteeism. The second case concerns Mr. 
Martin Kabuya and Mr. Crispin Bundu were prevented from resuming their parliamentary functions after losing their governorships and despite a ruling by the Constitutional Court in their favor. The committee wishes to receive the official views and observations of the parliamentary authorities on these cases and encourages the Congolese authorities to take all necessary measures to guarantee the fundamental rights of all members of the National Assembly. We therefore invite you to adopt the draft decisions on pages 5 and 8 and 28 and 31 of the English and French versions respectively. If I may, if may I, I may, dear colleagues. I will ask, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I will ask if someone wish to make a statement about this case. No statements, so approved. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Dear colleagues, I would now like to turn to um, Eswatini. This concerns the case of three parliamentarians, two of whom have been in detention on various charges since July 2021 in the aftermath of protests calling for democratic reforms in Eswatini. You have before you the report of the IPU trial observer who attended some of the court hearings in this case. His findings confirm our earlier concerns that the criminal charges brought against the parliamentarians come in response to their actions in support of political change. Moreover, the trial observer points to excessive delays in the legal proceedings and the unjustifiable dismissal of the parliamentarians' bail applications. Our committee sincerely hopes that the judge in this case will take due account of the observations made by our trial observer in reaching her verdict. At the same time, the committee remains keen to travel to Eswatini to discuss with the relevant authorities and other stakeholders the concerns and issues that have emerged in this case and hopes that this mission can take place as soon as possible. We invite you to adopt draft decisions on pages 10 and 6 of the English and French versions, respectively. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a des questions par rapport à ce point? Il n'y a pas de questions, donc c'est adopté. Bien. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Uh, we now turn to uh, Senegal. And firstly, we would like to thank, to thank the Senegalese delegation for the very constructive discussions we could have in our committee. We had discussions with, uh, with the Senegalese delegation in the context of uh, this very assembly, following which the committee adopted two decisions. One relates to the situation of Mr. Khalifa Sall, a former parliamentarian who had been sentenced to a prison term in 2018. The committee welcomes Mr. Sall's release following a presidential pardon in September 2019. We also welcome the information that the draft amnesty law, which could enable Mr. Sall to recover fully his civil rights, is being prepared and that Parliament would like to receive the IPU's assistance in preparing this law. We invite the parliamentary authorities of Senegal to provide further information on how the IPU could best provide such assistance. We invite you to adopt the draft decisions on pages 24 and 34 of the English and French versions, respectively. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y aura des, y a des réactions par rapport à ce point? Il n'y a pas de réaction, pas de question, donc c'est adopté. Merci, Madame uh, la Présidente. I now turn to the second decision of uh, Senegal uh, concerning the situation of Mr. Usman Sonko, who is currently facing a judicial investigation. Although the committee is fully aware that justice should follow its course, it also notes that in the past, 
other opposition candidates were excluded from the presidential race after being convicted by the courts. And we do hope that the trial against Mr. Sonko will soon lead to a final judicial decision in accordance with an independent and impartial procedure. We call on all the relevant national authorities to take the necessary measures to ensure that all opposition candidates and their supporters are being able to exercise the right to take part in the conduct of public affairs at the upcoming presidential elections. We invite you to adopt the draft decisions on pages 26 and 36 of the English and French versions, respectively. Je vous remercie, chers collègues. Avez-vous des questions? Il n'y a pas de questions, donc euh, il a ainsi décidé d'adopter. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. I now turn to Somalia. Regarding Somalia, the committee adopted a decision on the merits of the case of late Miss Amina Abdi, who was brutally assassinated in a bomb attack a year ago. The committee is appalled by this murder of a woman parliamentarian who was known as a fearless defender of human rights. We call on the authorities of Somalia to do everything to ensure that justice is done. We also urge the authorities to use the expertise of the IPU and other international bodies to this end. We invite you to adopt the draft decision on pages 28 and 39 of the English and French versions, respectively. Je vous remercie, chers collègues. Avez-vous des questions par rapport à ce point? Il n'y a pas de questions, donc euh, adoptez. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. Now, regarding Uganda, the committee has adopted three decisions. The first one of which concerns the situation of two of our colleagues who had been arrested in September 2021. We are pleased to inform you that they were finally released on bail on 13 February 2023 and that we have been able to send a trial observer to Uganda to monitor those trial proceedings. We would like to thank the Speaker of Uganda for the information provided in writing on this case and the Parliament of Uganda for the steps taken to monitor the situation of Mr. Sewanyana and Mr. Segiriana while in detention. We do remain, however, concerned about the reported lack of investigation into the allegations that they were tortured and the alleged political motivation on the criminal proceedings. We regret that the mission requested by this council to visit Uganda has not yet received any official approval from the Ugandan authorities, and we do sincerely hope that the Parliament of Uganda will do its utmost to make this mission happen as soon as possible. We invite you to adopt the draft decision on pages 30 and 17 of the English and French versions, respectively. Uh, je vous remercie. Uh, chers collègues, avez-vous des questions par rapport à ce point? Pas de questions? Uh, Adoptez. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. We also declared admissible two new cases regarding two female colleagues from Uganda, Ms. Betty Nambuze and Ms. Anna Adeke. We invite the Parliament to provide in writing the official views on the allegations made in both cases. We invite you to adopt the draft decision on the case of Ms. Nambuze on pages 33 and 20 of the English and French versions, respectively, and of her colleague, Ms. Anna Adeke, on pages 35 and 22 of the English and French versions, respectively. Je vous remercie. Euh, chers collègues, avez-vous des questions par rapport à ce point? Pas de questions? Adopté. We now turn to um, the Americas. 
and first Venezuela. Regarding the collective cases in Venezuela which you all know for quite a long time now, the committee reaffirms its long standing position that the continued harassment of parliamentarians elected in 2015 is a direct consequence of the prominent role they played as opposition MPs. We are also convinced that the issues involved in the prison case are part of the broader complex situation in Venezuela. We reiterate the IPU's readiness to provide support for any effort to strengthen democracy in Venezuela, including the ongoing process of dialogue. We invite the Venezuelan authorities to provide further information on how best the IPU can help. We invite you to adopt the draft decision on pages 37 and 42 of the English and French versions, respectively. Je vous remercie. Uh, Chers collègues, avez-vous des questions? Pas de questions, donc uh, adopté. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. We now turn to uh, Asia and first uh, Cambodia. The draft decision before you concerns the long standing case of 42 former parliamentarians, all belonging to the Cambodian National Rescue Party, dissolved by the Supreme Court in 2017. We had a fruitful exchange with the Cambodian delegation here in Manama and understand that the invitation extended to our committee to travel to Cambodia to discuss the concerns in this case is still in place. We hope that this mission can really take place as soon as possible and in any time before the national elections of July 2023. In the meantime, we recommend that the author authorities in Cambodia urgently resume political dialogue with all opposition parties, both in and outside Cambodia. Only then will they be able to build trust and find solutions to the current political situation. Dear colleagues, we invite you to adopt the draft decision on page one of the English and French versions, respectively. Merci beaucoup. Uh, chers collègues, avez-vous le Cambodge? Le Cambodge, vous avez la parole. Mr. President of Human Rights Commission, uh, Committee on the Human President of the Human Rights Committee of the Parliament. Your Honor, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I reject the draft decision. Second, we did explain to you on 11 of March with the committee and explain to you everything concerning the charges. Another thing too, on page four, and on page three, line four, you said that the uh, 45 political party had registered to participate in the election. We're talking about 45 political party registered to end the Ministry of Interior, not to the NEC yet, the National Election Committee yet. Another thing that I was really concerned that concerning the investigation, I am the president of the Human Rights Commission complaint and investigation. When I received the complaint, we did investigate thoroughly. We go, we talk to them, we visit the site before we make decision, before we send to the uh, different institutions to solve it. I'm really concerned that they do really investigate very good concerning the charge by the, the the plaintiff, uh, I'm, I'm really concerned. That's the reason that, you know, you need to do real thoroughly. Because if you just receive the phone call or you just see the letter from the plaintiff, I think that's not enough. I, I would like to appeal to all the people here to make, to think about it before you vote. Because is it really, you have made a really thoroughly uh, investigation? You talk to the person, you visit him, or they met you, and uh, just I'm really concerned. Thank you, Mr. President. That's all. 
Euh, je vous remercie. Euh, nous prenons bonne note de vos observations. Euh, toutefois, nous pouvons adopter avec réserve. S'il n'y a pas d'autres questions, nous pouvons adopter. Adopter. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, let me now turn to uh, the case of Pakistan. As for Pakistan, I am pleased to share with you that owing to the, to the mobilization of a number of parliamentarians and other actors across the political spectrum, Mr. Ali Wazir was released on bail having spent 26 months in a remand prison. The committee remains concerned by the impunity for the many allegations of harassment and arbitrary abuse against Mr. Wazir, as well as by allegations that due process guarantees have not been followed despite the actions taken by the parliamentary authorities. The committee calls on the authorities of Pakistan to do their share to ensure that this crime is not left unpunished and to ensure that the underlying factors for the pattern of impunity in Pakistani cases are addressed, including by bringing legislation in line with Pakistan's international obligations. This appears to be the only way to, to prevent the recurrence of such cases. Dear colleagues, we invite you to adopt the draft decisions on pages 21 and 24 of the English and French versions, respectively. Merci beaucoup. Chers collègues, avez-vous des questions Il n'y a pas de questions. Adop Adoptez. Merci beaucoup, uh, Madame la Présidente. I now turn to the MENA region and to the cases in Iraq. The committee would like to thank the Iraqi delegation for the very constructive and fruitful discussion it had on the case of former Iraqi parliamentarian Mr. Ahmed al-Awani and welcomes the visits carried out to Mr. al-Awani in detention and the steps taken by the judicial authorities to follow up on the IPU's recommendations. The committee considers that the situation of Mr. al-Awani should be seen as a national cause of concern. We therefore call on leaders to stand united for the protection and promotion of human rights by taking up Mr. Al-Alwani's case before the highest authority to promote his release, uphold his rights, and ensure that he will not be executed as a result of politically motivated charges. The committee also reiterated its wish to visit Mr. Al-Alwani in detention in the near future and to meet with the relevant Iraqi authorities to promote the resolution of this case. We therefore invite you, dear colleagues, to adopt the draft decisions on pages 14 and 10 of the English and French versions, respectively. Merci beaucoup. Chers collègues, avez-vous des questions? Il n'y a pas de questions. Donc, nous pouvons adopter. Adopter. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. And uh, final case in uh, Libya. The committee thanks the Libyan delegation uh, once again for the very fruitful exchange and for providing detailed information on the steps taken by the Libyan authorities to shed light on Ms. Seham Sergiwa's fate. The committee expresses its support to all members of the Libyan parliament particularly women parliamentarians, given the very serious challenges for their safety. The committee learned that the case of Ms. Sergiwa is still under criminal and judicial investigation by the Attorney General, and that she was the victim of a vile online hate campaign which had led to her abduction. The committee also learned that such campaigns were routinely used to incite physical violence against parliamentarians, and in particular women. And once again, on behalf of the committee, I would really like to express our full solidarities with our colleagues MPs in Libya, who carry out their mission in a very sensitive and difficult, dire situation. 
The committee calls on the competent authorities to ensure that social media are not used to circulate hateful messages against members of parliament, particularly women parliamentarians, and urges the executive authorities to establish the truth of Ms. Sergiwa's case. Dear colleagues, we invite you to adopt the draft decisions on pages 17 and 13 of the English and French versions, respectively. Je vous remercie. Chers collègues, avez-vous des questions Donc, nous pouvons adopter ce projet de décision. Adopté. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Si vous le permettez, j'aimerais dire un petit mot de conclusion. Mr. President, Madame President, sorry, dear colleagues uh, from all around the world, the cases I have referred to here are only some of the very numerous cases before our Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians. In view of the record growing number of cases, we can see that being a parliamentarian today can be truly dangerous. Unfortunately, this trend is apparent in all regions of the world. Yesterday, in the afternoon, we had a fascinating panel discussion on parliamentary solidarity with the MPs at risk. And it was, I must say, very moving to listen to the testimonies of many of our colleagues who have faced abuse, mistreatment, and even sometimes death, simply for doing their job. At the same time, it was also extremely inspiring and even encouraging to see that many of you, many of you, wherever it may be, are also extremely working so hard in order to support your colleagues in danger in other parts of the world. And thank you for that. Dear colleagues, to find out more about the specific actions you can take to help our committee, I really invite you to sign up to our contact list so that you can stay informed about the work of the committee and act accordingly. We really depend on your support, on parliamentary solidarity, in order to implement our decisions in practice. So please contact the Secretariat at the end of, uh, of this session or during the lunch break so that you can uh, remain uh, informed. I would now like to um, thank uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, my very distinguished colleagues, members of the IPU Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians of the IPU. It's a true privilege for me to be able to work with them. And I would also like to say, once again, like during every assembly, that we would not be able to carry out our mission without the incredible competence and without the very hard work of the Secretariat of the IPU in Geneva. And I recognize there uh, Rogier, I also see uh, Roberto, I see Buteina, I also see uh, Ilia. I really want to thank them and I think we can really applaud as they are doing a wonderful job in order to save and protect our colleagues in danger around the world. Madam President, dear colleagues, thank you for your attention. Je vous remercie uh, pour le rapport. Je vous remercie pour le rapport du Comité des droits humains et je souhaiterais donner la parole à Monsieur le Secrétaire général. Uh, Madame, Madame Président, thank you very much. I don't want to prolong the deliberations of the Council, but I just wanted on this auspicious occasion to uh, recognize the important work that is being done by the Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians of the IPU. This is a body that is doing a most noble piece of work that is always done almost all the time uh, out of the limelight. We hardly see the members of this committee. I'm sure that not many of you know who the members of this committee are. It is because they are tucked away somewhere in the back room, working studiously and professionally, examining the cases that are before the committee. I want to use this opportunity to thank you, Samuel, 
you and your colleagues of that committee for the sterling job that you are doing in that committee. I have had the opportunity to work with you very closely during sessions, especially when you're meeting in Geneva, and I do know the many dilemmas that you uh, face when you examine it, many of these cases, but I've always been heartened by the fact that you have always brought the welfare of your colleagues who are suffering abuse around the world to the fore, and that has been your guiding light, which I salute very much. On behalf of my colleagues, I want to assure you all of that committee that we'll continue to give you our best support. We want to give you our best support so that you continue to do that noble work that has been entrusted to you by uh, the various members of this organization. Thank you very much to all the members of the uh, Committee on Human Rights of Parliamentarians. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général. Madam President, I had my hand up from South Africa. D'accord. Donc, nous donnons la parole à la Thaïlande après l'Afrique du Sud. La Thaïlande. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, Madam Chair, first of all, I'd like to thank the Chair of uh, Humanitarian, uh, the, the Human Rights for MPs Committee for their excellent job. Yesterday, I attended the meeting briefly of the Standing Committee, and uh, there were two cases raised and not appearing in the report today, One, uh, two of which are members of the ASEAN countries, my neighbors. First case is the case of Myanmar. Uh, you know that uh, middle of last year, there has been an execution of political prisoners, four of them, and maybe more now, by the military government. One of them is a friend of mine, personal friend of mine, who I had the opportunity to have met him in 2018. And I didn't expect that it was the last time that I see him. And executing political prisoner is beyond imagination. It's unacceptable. And I think IPU must do more to stop this and to ensure that military government would move forward to democratic election quickly. In the meantime, Thailand is a receiving end of so many refugees from Myanmar. And we therefore seek IPU members to assist Thailand in humanitarian assistance to the best of your ability. Second case is uh, the case of Senator De Lima in Philippines. You know that she has been detained on a pre-trial detention, pre-trial detention for six years. And up to this date, there has been not even one case that there is sufficient evidence to prosecute her. And therefore, with the change of regime at this point, it is, it is an opportunity for IPU to take a more important step, more serious step, to demand immediate release of Senator De Lima. Thank you. Uh, je vous remercie. Je remercie la Thaïlande. Uh, je souhaite donner la parole à l'Afrique du Sud. Après, je donnerai la parole au secrétaire général qui va revenir sur la question. L'Afrique du Sud. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, may I first make use of the opportunity to thank the Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians for the superb work that they are doing. And it serves as a beacon of light for those parliamentarians who are subjected to human rights abuses across the world. We personally had experience of the work that the committee is doing when the Speaker of our National Assembly of Parliament was requested to appear due to a complaint that was laid against her. And we accompanied the Speaker on Monday, the 13th of March, to this hearing that took place. The Speaker was asked to make presentations 
on an incident that occurred in Parliament during the State of the Nation address by the President of the Republic. And the complaint was heard when the Speaker gave her side and version of events that occurred. On a procedural point, we want to inquire, when are we going to get the outcome of that engagement, the written presentations, as well as the physical appearance of the Speaker in front of this committee? Thank you very much. Merci. Donnons la parole au président du comité des droits humains pour apporter des réponses. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, distinguished colleague, uh, dear Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I have to say that uh, we had an extremely fruitful discussion uh, with your entire delegation and especially with Madam Speaker. And uh, we would like once again to commend her great leadership uh, in South Africa and in your parliament. Regarding the decision of this case, uh, the case was declared inadmissible. Thank you. Thank you. You are finished. Merci beaucoup. Maintenant, la parole est au absolu secrétaire général. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, would like just to compliment what uh, the president of the committee has said. Uh, the uh, Committee will be, I will, as Secretary General, be communicating the decision of the committee directly to the parties concerned, including Madam Speaker of uh, the uh, South African National Assembly, whom I also thank for her spirit of cooperation. Regarding the issues raised by the Honorable Member from uh, Thailand, I want to uh, let you know that because of the caseload of the Committee on Human Rights of Parliamentarians, it is not always possible to report publicly, publicly on all the cases. So it has adopted a strategic approach whereby it focuses on a number of cases that it reports to you on for decisions, but it continues to be apprised of the other cases and come back to you in due course with uh, answers. That is the case of Myanmar, and I do understand that for Mrs. Uh, De Lima, a decision was taken uh, as early as uh, in January this year when the committee met. So, and precisely stating what you have asked, that is asking for the release of Senator De Lima because the conditions or the challenges, uh, the charges leveled against her are unfounded according to the uh, Committee on Human Rights of Parliamentarians. So this is on record just to assure you that those cases have not been forgotten, including Myanmar. Myanmar is a case of ongoing concern for the committee, and it will report to you as and when it has advanced in its deliberations. So thank you. Whatever information you have that can guide the committee, please feel free to provide this to the Secretary General, who will co convey to the uh, committee uh, members as uh, uh, the case might be. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, pour toutes ces précisions. Merci également au président du comité des droits humains. Monsieur le secrétaire général, je pense que nous pouvons continuer avec le point 13 relatif au rapport sur les réunions spécialisées. Et nous donnons la parole à Moussé Darwish de l'Égypte. Pour la réunion parlementaire, donc à la COP. Il est là Thank you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, it gives me a great pleasure to stand in front of you here today to read to you the report on the parliamentary meeting at the COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. The global parliamentary community came together in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, on the 13th of November at the parliamentary meeting held on the occasion of the 27th session of the Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The meeting was jointly organized by the Interparliamentary Union, IPU, and the Egyptian House of Representatives. It brought together nearly 200 participants from over 50 countries 
to identify interparliamentary solutions to tackle the climate crisis. Parliamentarians and experts engaged in rich discussions in, on how to discuss and address key climate issues, including emission reduction, scaling up adaptation efforts, and mobilizing climate finance. The meeting provided a platform for parliaments to share concrete climate solutions, including supporting technology transfer to developing countries, creating financial incentives for green investments, and approving dedicated climate funding for both adaptation and mitigation. The parliamentary meeting concluded with the, adoption, with the adoption of an outcome document that outlines a path forward for strengthening action on climate change post COP27. It affirms parliamentarians' commitment to adopt laws and legislative models that support climate change, mitigation and adaptation, and the transition to a green economy, and to fulfill their country's commitments and obligations under the Paris Agreement. It also calls on parliaments to support additional and separate funding for loss and damage, which was also a key outcome of the wider COP27 proceedings. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the document and this is the draft, and it's all now in your good hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Monsieur Darouish, honorable chers collègues. Uh, nous allons uh, projeter la vidéo uh, relative à l'atelier qui a eu lieu en Argentine au mois de novembre sur les défis en matière de commerce. Que nous pouvons avoir la vidéo. Merci, merci pour la vidéo. Euh, Monsieur le secrétaire général, vous avez la parole. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I just want to uh, indicate that this uh, workshop is part of the cooperation that uh, we enjoy with the World, uh, World Trade Organization. As you know, we do have a mechanism in the IDU, the Parliamentary Conference on the WTO, which allows uh, parliamentarians from across the world to uh, uh, provide some oversight over uh, the rules-based trading system as articulated by the World Trade Organization. So this uh, 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 meeting in uh, Argentina was intended to apprise the members of parliament on the major challenges that are being faced 
in uh, the uh, trade matters around the world and how parliaments of the region could contribute. It was done in cooperation with the World Trade Organization. And there is the understanding that we'll continue to do this type of uh, activities for parliamentarians across the world. Let me, uh, on behalf of us all, thank uh, Speaker Nadi of uh, uh, Guyana uh, for the strong leadership that he has provided as the co-chair of the IPU, uh, the, the Parliamentary Conference WTO Steering Committee, who has been very, very energetic in uh, prosecuting the agenda that you have set for yourselves, that of providing oversight on the work that is being done by the uh, WTO. Thank you very much, Madam President. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général. Nous pourrons inviter Monsieur Tuizi du Maroc euh, concernant le Forum Régional pour les Pays Arabes sur l'agenda 2030 qui s'est tenu au Liban à Beyrouth. Monsieur Tuizi du Maroc. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Monsieur le Président, chers collègues, chers invités, Mesdames et Messieurs, l'édition 2022 de forum, du Forum parlementaire régional arabe sur le programme 2030 s'est déroulée dans la maison des Nations Unies à Beyrouth les 29 et 30 novembre 2022. Conjointement organisé par l'UIP et la Commission économique et sociale des Nations Unies pour l'Asie occidentale, pour l'Asie occidentale, c'est ça, en partenariat avec le programme des Nations Unies pour le développement, le forum fournit chaque année aux parlementaires l'occasion de débattre et d'échanger entre pairs sur leurs fonctions de législation, de contrôle, de budgétisation et de représentation dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre des objectifs de développement durable. Il s'inscrit dans la poursuite de partenariat de l'UIP avec la Commission, les commissions économiques de l'ONU. L'édition 2022 était la troisième, le troisième événement conjointement organisé avec la Commission économique et sociale des Nations Unies pour, pour l'Asie occidentale depuis 2019. Le Forum 2022, qui a, attiré, qui a attiré plus de 80 participants, était centré sur le rôle des parlements de la région en matière d'action climatique en lien avec la réalisation des objectifs du développement durable. La région arabe est en effet l'une des régions les plus vulnérables au changement climatique. En outre, malgré l'abondance et la diversité de ressources naturelles dans la région, les effets négatifs des changements climatiques y remettent en cause l'avancée des nombreux ODD. Plusieurs d'entre eux, notamment les objectifs pays de pas de pauvreté, fin zéro, au propre et assainissement, seront hors de portée si une réponse n'est pas apportée d'urgence à la question des changements climatiques. L'événement a donné lieu à des discussions très animées et très constructives qui ont abouti à l'adoption de messages clés et de recommandations d'action. Au premier rang de ces, derniers, de ces dernières, citant la recommandation de créer un organe parlementaire multisectoriel composé de membres des commissions parlementaires compétentes, agriculture, eau, environnement, finances, santé, etc., pour coordonner les mesures à prendre en matière du climat dans le droit fil des engagements de la réalisation des ODD. Les participants sont convenus que la structure de cet, de cet organe parlementaire devrait être adaptée au contexte, besoins et caractères nationaux. Les participants ont partagé leur expérience mutuelle et débattu d'importantes initiatives lancées par leurs parlements respectifs dans ce domaine. L'importance de renforcement de la coordination interne a été mise en lumière. Un consensus s'est constitué autour du fait que pour appuyer efficacement la réalisation des ODD, à la fois dans leur triple dimension économique, sociale, environnementale, les parlements doivent faire en sorte que les ODD et les autres objectifs climatiques soient intégrés dans leurs travaux. Le forum est donc convenu que les parlements devraient, devaient mettre en place des organes parlementaires dédiés pour améliorer l'efficience, 
le partage d'informations et la communication sur ce sujet. Toutes les personnes présentes ont été heureuses d'entendre que besoin, ils pourraient compter sur l'aide de l'UIP et de ce partenaire de la CAO. Merci de votre attention. Merci beaucoup, M. Touzi. Euh, nous vous remercions et nous souhaitons inviter M. Khalifa du Burkina Faso euh, sur le deuxième séminaire pour l'Afrique sur la réalisation des objectifs de développement durable, ODD, qui s'est tenu à Djibouti. Merci, Madame la Présidente, chers collègues, chers invités, Mesdames et Messieurs. Le deuxième séminaire régional pour la réalisation des objectifs de développement durable, ODD, a eu lieu du 5 au 7 décembre 2022. Plus d'une cinquantaine de participants venus de dix pays africains se sont réunis à Djibouti pour cet important événement qui, après trois ans de pandémie, nous a permis de nous retrouver en présentiel pour faire le point sur la situation et réfléchir aux moyens concrets par lesquels nous pouvons contribuer à résoudre les défis structurels et à stimuler un développement inclusif et durable pour tous. Deuxième, en son sens, ce séminaire s'est appuyé sur les conclusions du séminaire organisé par l'UIP conjointement avec le Parlement de l'Ouganda en 2017. Ainsi que cet événement en ligne organisé pour la région en 2020. Grâce à la participation d'experts internationaux et régionaux, nous avons été informés sur le rythme de progression des ODD sur le continent. Selon les données des Nations Unies, les pays africains ont fait progresser 15 des 17 ODD, notamment en ce qui concerne les inégalités, la faim, la santé, l'éducation et l'eau propre. Nous devons néanmoins redoubler d'efforts pour faire en sorte que les ODD soient en bonne voie de réalisation. En effet, les changements climatiques, les conflits, les migrations forcées et l'impact socio-économique de la COVID-19 entre autres, ont remis en cause le développement acquis à ce jour. Sur la base des expériences respectives et des leçons tirées, nous avons défini différentes mesures que les parlements devraient mettre en œuvre en priorité. Voici quelques-unes des recommandations proposées. Les parlements devraient intégrer les ODD dans les principales fonctions parlementaires pour assurer leur pleine mise en œuvre dans le pays. Demander des comptes au gouvernement, par exemple grâce à des séances de questions, des questions écrites ou des auditions publiques sur les objectifs auxquels il a souscrit pour lutter contre les changements climatiques. Renforcer les liens de collaboration et de coordination entre le Parlement et les institutions nationales qui travaillent en faveur des droits de l'homme et du développement durable promouvoir la mise en œuvre du règlement sanitaire international de 2005, un instrument de droit international qui définit ce que les pays peuvent faire en termes de riposte de santé publique face au risque pandémie ou pour la santé publique, et contrôler que les plans de développement national sont conformes aux ODD, et s'ils ne le sont pas, plaider en faveur de leur intégration complète et transversale notamment dans la, réal... dans la législation et dans le budget national. Chers collègues, conformément à la nouvelle stratégie de l'UEP 2022-2026 et à l'engagement que nous avons pris de donner la priorité aux actions en faveur du développement durable durant les cinq prochaines années, je tiens à vous encourager à mettre en œuvre les décisions prises dans ce domaine dans vos parlements respectifs. Je compte sur vous tous pour nous rejoindre dans ces efforts. Je vous remercie. Nous vous remercions, M. Khalifa du Burkina, euh, pour ce rapport. Et nous invitons Mme Mouti, présidente du Parlement zambien, qui va présenter le rapport sur le forum parlementaire à l'occasion de la cinquième conférence de l'ONU sur les PME, les pays les moins avancés, qui s'est tenu à Doha au 14, ce mois de mars 2023. 
thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, dear colleagues, I am uh, Nelly Butete Kashumbamuti, the Speaker of the National Assembly of Zambia. It is my honor today to report on the parliamentary forum that was held on the, at the fifth United Nations Conference on the least developed countries on 4th March in Doha, Qatar. The forum saw the participation of about 70 members of parliaments from 30 countries. It was the last step of the IPU-led parliamentary track to this major UN conference, which served to raise awareness of a new program of action for the least developed countries. There are 46 least developed countries in the world with a population of 1.1 million people. The parliamentary forum was organized by the IPU and the Shura Council of Qatar in close cooperation with the UN. Its key messages can be summarized as follows. Firstly, the LCDs will not advance much without deep reform in global economic governance to level a playing field that remains heavily biased in favor of the more advanced countries. Secondly, the LDCs need to pay greater attention to their domestic governance by preventing or quelling conflict and by stimulating economic and trade synergies among themselves. Thirdly, greater sharing of experiences and mutual learning among LCDs, capitalizing on local knowledge, investment and institutional reform provide a critical path forward. Fourthly, the LCDs don't want charity and certainly not aid that does not truly benefit them. They want to enjoy their right to development as recognized by the United Nations. Fifthly, the LDC agenda that is now represented by the Doha Program of Action is not a, margin, a marginal, but rather central to all work of the Sustainable Development Goals. The SDGs cannot be fully implemented on a global scale as long as the LDCs do not rise up the development ladder. <clears throat> the Parliamentary Forum made it clear that the role of parliaments and parliamentarians will be key in all of this. Through their legislative, representative, and oversight respons responsibilities, parliaments must hold governments accountable for the implementation of the DPOA, making sure that all governments, not just the LDCs, in, inter, internalize their new plan, th internalize this new plan through institutional and policy reforms. All acts of legislation, including the national budget, need to be attuned to the relevant provisions of the DPOA in tandem with the SDGs. We need to work harder to make parliaments more effective at implementing these global commitments. Too many parliaments particularly in the LDCs, lack the capacities or the legislative authority to oversee governments. As speaker and as a member of the IPU, I am proud of our contribution to this conference. It provides, yes, another illustration of how IPU and the UN can work together and support each other in the pursuit of their shared objective for peace and sustainable development around the world. I thank you. Merci, Madame la Présidente et très chers collègues. Pour ce rapport, nous invitons Madame Rioto de la France à présenter le rapport concernant la Commission sur la condition féminine qui s'est tenue à New York le 7 mars. Merci, euh, Madame la Présidente, chers collègues. J'ai le plaisir de vous faire un compte rendu de la réunion parlementaire organisée conjointement par l'UIP et ONU Femmes à l'occasion de la 67e session de la Commission euh, de la condition de la femme. La réunion s'est tenue il y a tout juste quelques jours, le 7 mars, au siège des Nations Unies à New York. Elle a réuni 75 parlementaires de 23 pays ainsi que d'autres parties prenantes. La réunion a porté sur un thème crucial, à savoir le rôle des parlements dans la promotion de l'égalité des sexes grâce à la technologie. 
La réunion a été ouverte par notre président, M. Duarte Pacheco, et Mme Sarah Hendricks, qui est directrice de la division des programmes des politiques et des affaires gouvernementales euh, d'ONU Femmes. J'ai eu le plaisir de présider cette réunion euh, lors de la première demi-journée, suivie de Mme Lia Quartepele, membre du comité des droits de l'homme des parlementaires de l'UIP pour l'après-midi. Les débats ont mis en évidence trois domaines clés dans lesquels les parlements peuvent et doivent se mobiliser pour veiller à ce que les progrès technologiques respectent les droits des femmes et des filles et fassent progresser l'égalité des sexes. J'ai envie de dire à la fois le côté positif de la technologie dans l'émancipation et l'autonomisation des femmes et le côté sur lequel il faut porter vigilance dans la légalisation des sujets au niveau du numérique. Premièrement, nos parlements doivent veiller à ce que l'innovation technologique soit menée par les femmes et favorise leur autonomisation. Nous incitons ainsi davantage de femmes à étudier les sciences, la technologie, l'ingénierie et les mathématiques, mais aussi adopter des mesures positives en matière d'allocation des ressources. On parle de financement des marchés publics de manière à faire émerger davantage de femmes dans ce domaine. Deuxièmement, nos parlements doivent faire davantage pour lutter contre la violence des femmes et des filles qui est facilitée par la technologie. Nous devons légiférer contre toutes les formes d'abus tout en veillant à des mécanismes d'application efficaces. Cela doit comprendre tous les types d'atteintes sexistes commises en ligne, notamment l'exploitation sexuelle, la sextorsion et la vengeance pornographique qui ciblent principalement les femmes et les filles. La violence en ligne euh, à l'encontre des femmes parlementaires requiert également des mesures spécifiques tant que la loi euh, dans les procédures, euh, autant dans la loi que dans les procédures internes pardon, des parlements. Troisièmement, il faut que nos parlements améliorent leur compréhension et leur potentiel d'emploi des technologies dans euh, leurs propres travaux. La pandémie de Covid-19 fait apparaître de nombreux avantages inattendus des modes de fonctionnement hybrides dans les parlements. Cette souplesse de travail, cette diversité des procédures nous offre la possibilité d'être plus proche de la population et de mieux concilier les responsabilités familiales et nos carrières politiques. Voici une feuille de route que je nous invite toutes et tous à mettre en œuvre dans nos parlements respectifs. Chers collègues, le lendemain de la réunion parlementaire, l'UIP a organisé également un, un événement parallèle qui s'intitule « Réaliser l'égalité des sexes dans la prise de décision d'ici 2030 ». Quels moyens pour la mise en œuvre Cet événement était conjointement organisé par le comité CEDEF, le Haut Commissariat des Nations Unies aux Droits de l'Homme et ONU Femmes, en collaboration avec la coalition d'action sur les mouvements et le leadership féministe du Forum Génération Égalité et plusieurs États. Cette conférence a permis à des expertes, à des parlementaires, mais aussi des représentants de gouvernement et de la société civile de partager leur expérience en faveur de la parité, d'une approche féministe, de la, euh, de la prise de décision. Pardon. Les constats partagés serviront à renseigner la prochaine recommandation générale du comité CEDEF sur la représentation égale et inclusive des femmes dans les systèmes de prise de décision à laquelle l'UIP est associée. Les données de l'UIP présentées à cette occasion, ainsi que notre travail sur la parité et la violence à l'égard des femmes parlementaires, ont été particulièrement saluées. J'ai été particulièrement heureuse d'être associée aux travaux de l'UIP, à la Commission sur la condition de la femme et à ses délibérations fructueuses. Je vous remercie. Nous vous remercions, Madame Briotto, pour ce rapport. Nous invitons euh, notre collègue David McEntee euh, pour l'audition parlementaire annuelle qui s'est tenue à New York en février 2023. Colleagues, on the 13th and 14th of February, just this year, the IPU and the United Nations held their annual parliamentary hearing. The hearing was entitled Water for People and the planet. Stop the waste, change the game, and invest in the future. The topic was chosen in view of the United Nations Water Conference taking place next week, March 22nd to 24th, 
in New York. And it comes hard on the heels of the historic United Nations Agreement on protecting marine biodiversity in international waters, concluded just last week after two long decades of negotiation. Water and sanitation correspond to one of the Sustainable Development Goals, that would be SDG number six. And this event was one part of the IPU's commitment to help implement all of the SDGs by 2030. Some 150 parliamentarians from 46 countries participated in vigorous discussions throughout seven sessions, as well as a special briefing on the future of multilateralism conducted by a special envoy for the Secretary General. Colleagues, in case we need reminding, there is no understating the facts. One in four people lack access to safe drinking water, and almost 50% of the global population does not have safe sanitation. Water is related to most disasters, and about 1.2 billion people are at risk of floods. Exploitation, pollution, and climate change are intensifying water scarcity, undermining the food supply and the health of billions of people. And in case you're not aware, water is increasingly becoming a global and national security issue because it leads to conflict and it leads to dislocation. Action on water and sanitation is urgent, yet most governments are not paying attention. It's our job as parliamentarians to change that. And I hope that, like me, many of you brought home to your parliament the spirit of the discussions and that we are working to engage with our governments around the UN Water Conference and in the years to come. Finally, colleagues, I'm pleased to report that in keeping with the IPU's political project vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations. Many members in New York engaged with their United Nations ambassadors and with senior officials of the United Nations working on issues important to their nation. It's important to remind United Nations ambassadors that parliamentarians are capable of being of enormous help, can ground truth their findings, and help with the take-up of UN resolutions and outcomes at a domestic level. So these hearings are a great opportunity for all of us as parliamentarians to join together and with our diplomats to work together on our shared agenda. Thank you so much for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Le point 13 étant épuisé, le point relatif au rapport sur les réunions spécialisées, nous allons entamer le point 14. Donc, nous donnons la parole à la présidente, Madame Fayez, pour le compte des, du Forum des femmes parlementaires. Madam President, Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to report on the 35th session of the Forum of Women Parliamentarians that I had the honor to preside over. The forum met on 11th and 14th March. It was attended by 228 participants including 186 parliamentarians from 66 countries. We had 161 women parliamentarians and 25 men parliamentarians in attendance. The session was opened by the IPU president, Mr. Pacheco, and the first deputy speaker of the Shura Council of Bahrain, Mr. Jamal Fakhro. 
I want to thank them for their remarks on the leadership of women, which the world must no longer do without. The forum considered the draft resolution on cyber attack and cyber crimes from a gender lens, highlighting how women and girls are targeted for, of technology facilitated gender-based violence, including sexual harassment, threats, stalking, bullying, and sexist hate speech. We agreed that such cyber crimes should be urgently prevented and addressed with gender-sensitive, comprehensive, and victim-centric legislation. Equal access of women and men experts in cyber security sectors should also be our priorities. I'm happy to say that the amendments submitted by the forum to the draft resolution were included in the text amend adopted by the Standing Committee on Peace and International Security. I look forward to the resolution being adopted by the Assembly later today. We also focused our work on our responsibility of putting gender equality at the center of water security, climate resilience, and peace sustainability. We agreed that it was crucial to increase women's participation at all levels in these fields. It is also urgent to develop gender responsive strategies and measures related to water management, climate change, mitigation, peace processes, as well as recon reconstruction of recovery efforts. Dear colleagues, I would like you to join me in congratulating the new members of the Bureau of Women Parliamentarians who have been elected during this assembly. The forum elected Ms. Lopez Castro from Mexico as pre president of the Bureau. Ms. Elimi from Algeria as first vice president. And Ms. Nasif Ayoub from Egypt as second vice president. Congratulations to all three. I would also like to recognize Ms. Lysia Vasilinko, the outgoing president of the Bureau of Women Parliamentarians. And on behalf of all of us, really, thank her mostly uh, for her presidency, which was carried out in particularly sad circumstances. However, she never failed to make herself available to carry out her duty. I will never forget her joining our first bureau meeting online in 2021 from the hospital's maternity, where she had just given birth. I will also never forget her courage and resolve to stand for women, their protection, and their empowerment everywhere. Dear Lesia, rest assured that we will continue to fight for every woman and every girl. Before I conclude, I thank you all having joined this 146th IPU Assembly. It was a great pleasure for me and my country to welcome you all. I hope you enjoyed your stay in Bahrain and wish you a safe return to your countries. Thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Madame Fayez. Nous aussi, nous vous félicitons pour le travail que vous avez accompli parce que vous avez eu à diriger beaucoup de réunions en l'absence de Madame Vasilico, empêchée pour les raisons que nous savons tous. Félicité par la même occasion la nouvelle présidente, Mme Cynthia de, de la Mexique, Mme Cynthia Lopez Castro. Félicité la première vice-présidente, Mme Ilimi de l'Algérie. Félicité également la deuxième vice-présidente, Mme Nassif Ayoub de l'Égypte. Je souhaiterais demander à l'Assemblée si nous pouvons entériner ces décisions. Je vous remercie.
Nous invitons Mme Albazar, présidente euh, des jeunes donc, du, de l'UIP, à venir donc, prendre la parole au nom pour le compte du Forum des jeunes. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues and friends, I'm glad to share with you the updates of the Forum of Young MPs here in Bahrain. This week, we brought together 60 young MPs from 58 countries. About 37% of them were women. Yes. I, I want to thank the IPU president for joining us. He urged young MPs to continue working on promoting youth participation so to stay on the top of the agenda of IPU. I promised the president that we will continue working on this. As we looked at the progress we made in the last two years, even through uh, COVID standing on our way, we accomplished so much. One of the big successes is the new virtual emp empowerment series for young MPs, where we gather every three months to empower each other and have experts talking to us about the most pressing global issues. And I'm thrilled to say that this empowerment series will continue in the future. In the forum, we had the chance to hear from each other the achievements we did on a national level. So we had to hear about creation of youth caucuses, newly elected young MPs, increased enga engagement with political parties, and more. We also talked about the progress that we achieved on the I Say Yes to Youth in Parliament campaign, because until now, we have more than 1,000 endorsements and signatures from even head of states. To bring the youth perspective in the theme of uh, general debate, we discussed the leadership role young MPs can play to promote peace. Therefore, I want to repeat the calling of the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, during COP27 to stop the war. We are the young people, and we deserve peaceful future. That's why in the forum, we discussed, we discussed and emphasized on the importance of education, which promotes peace, inclusion, and tolerance, as well as legislations to combat hate and discrimination. In addition to presenting the youth overview reports to the resolutions before this assembly, we discussed special measurements to protect young people from the online harm. Dear colleagues, with the current board's mandate coming to an end at this assembly, I would like to express my gratitude for having the chance to serve young MPs over the, young to, uh, over the last two years. And, Thank you. And thank the board, uh, the board members that work together in, in a dedication and efforts. And the good news is the forum has nominated the new board, and the new board has elected a new president, Mr. Dan Carden from UK. They have started their work by nominating a rapporteur for the coming assembly. Please allow me to, ask, to seize this opportunity to congratulate them and wish them the best of luck in the coming two years. Thank you. Just a second, Mrs. Albazar. Uh, Just, just allow me to say, we are not saying goodbye. Yes. Because you will stay with us, and as we know each other, I, I think that everyone understands Mrs. Albazar will continue to work very hard with IPU. Yes. Thank we you know that. Thank you so but thank you for what you have done uh, during our leadership of, with the Forum of Young Parliamentarians. And, the, the, you are the next, the new president has a very hard task. 
because you did it so well that the, what we are waiting for, from him is to do better. And I don't know if it is possible. Oh, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Sorry, I ask the help of our Secretary General. So, uh, we need to. The Governing Council is invited to endorse the election of the following board of members for a two year term in March 2025. Uh, Mr. Carden from UK has been elected President of the Board. We endorse. Congratulations and uh, welcome to the Executive Committee as well in this capacity. But uh, you will have a task, a task uh, <laughs> very hard after what did Madame Albaza. From the African group, uh, uh, Mr. Bonchouit from Argeli and uh, Mrs. Buteke from Namibia. We may endorse these two proposals. From the Arab group, <coughs> Mr. Uh, IT Mick from Morocco and Mrs. Palank Nats from United Arab Emirates. May we endorse the proposal of the Arab group? From the Asia Pacific group, Mrs. Esti from Indonesia and uh, Mr. Faka Fanua from Tonga, may we endorse. From Aero-Asia Group, uh, uh, Mrs. Akobian from Armenia, may we endorse as well. From the group of Latin America and Caribbean, Mrs. Aguirre from Ecuador and Mr. Soto from Peru, may we endorse the proposal of the group. And uh, from the 12 plus group, already the new president of the board, Mr. Carden from UK, and Mrs. Hudenko from Ukraine. May we endorse as well? So, all them are now with a full, with a full uh, the endorsement of the governing council. Please represent very well and do all the efforts to defend the young people of our world. Thank you, sir. Men and sirs. And we will go to the Middle East question. No, it is not present in this moment. Can later on committed to promote uh, respect for international humanitarian law. And so I will invite uh, Mr. Chiari from Kenya to promote, uh, to present the report. Dear colleague, Take the floor, please. Mr. President, dear colleagues, yesterday, the 14th of March, 2023, the Committee to Promote Respect for International Humanitarian Law met in Manama here in Bahrain. And let me take this early opportunity to thank the King and the people of Bahrain for the amazing hosting of this great conference. You will find in our report a set of documents, and so what I will do is just focus on two key points. In view of our mandate, we spent some time discussing the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Ukraine, focusing particularly on the plight of refugees and internally displaced persons. Since we last met in Kigali, we note very little improvement in the situations that the committee has been following. Between the three countries under review, there are close to 10 million women and, women and men, girls and boys, that have had to leave their homes and their entire lives behind. The great majority averaging at 70% of them 
are women and girls. In the case of Ukraine, this number is as high as 90%. These situations are becoming more and more complex. And new dimensions, such as the impact of the climate change or economic and social challenges in the host countries, add additional challenges to the provision of help, protection, and support. The high prevalence of gender-based violence is another area of great concern which needs our urgent attention, support, and action. As parliamentarians, the question of impunity for the violation of international humanitarian law, including or that by non-state actors, is a priority that we will discuss. Colleagues, we made a special plea with regard to the situation of Afghanistan. Life-saving efforts have become a priority for support agencies involved in the country, and we stressed the importance and necessity of securing access to health care and education for all women and girls. This should not be optional. I call you to bring these humanitarian situations for discussion in your respective parliaments and to escalate them to your geopolitical groups and to provide support for relief and assistance in the countries concerned as well as the countries that are hosting these refugees. We observed firsthand the legal reforms adopted by parliaments to include refugees and integrate them in the host countries. This is the case, for instance, in Poland, and we know of the inclusion efforts and approach adopted by countries such as Rwanda and Turkey. And these are great best practice examples, and this is the way to go. By enabling inclusion in national systems with the right legislation, policies, and practices, states can ensure more holistic, effective, and coordinated response that can benefit both the host and the refugee populations greatly. I will end by reminding all of you of the Global Forum of Refugees that will take place at the end of this year in Geneva and which will review implementation of Global Compact for Refugees and many of the countries, including my beloved home country, Kenya, have committed pledges towards the Global Compact and I invite all of you to engage your governments and review the situation prior to the forum. I also invite all of us to work towards committing new pledges for the realization of the set objectives of this very important global framework, which aims at facilitating and enhancing assistance and burden sharing. Mr. President and dear colleagues, I thank you all, and I wish you safe skies as you fly back home after this very important assembly in Bahrain. Thank you very much, shukran, and see you next time. Thank you, dear colleague. I will ask if someone wish to make any comments on this report. Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, thank you. And so we, uh, we may consider that the Governing Council approves the report of the Committee to Promote Respect for International Humanitarian Law. No opposition is then. And the last uh, report presented before lunch, then we came back at 2.30 to, uh, to the others, uh, is about the Gender Partnership Group. And I will invite the Chair, uh, Madame Canoté, uh, to present the report. Uh, but uh, mas before, uh, before that, uh, allow me to say two special thanks to Madame Canoté for the way she led the, the work during this, the great part of this morning. Thank you, Madame Canoté. And your success was so amazing that it was possible to go forward in many points of our agenda. Thank you for that. And thank you also for all the work done at the Executive Committee for uh, during the last years as first Vice President 
of the Executive Committee. Now you have the floor, Madame Canute. Merci. Euh, je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, je suis très sensible à vos félicitations et encouragements. Vous remerciez également, vous et le secrétaire général, pour le soutien dont j'ai eu à bénéficier depuis mon entrée au comité exécutif jusqu'à jusqu jusqu mon élection en tant que vice-présidente du comité exécutif de l'Union interparlementaire. Soyez-en remerciés. Euh, je m'avais maintenant euh, prononcé, euh, vous faire le rapport du groupe partenariat entre les hommes et les femmes. Euh, Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Secrétaire général chez Honorable Collègue, j'ai le plaisir de vous présenter un compte rendu des travaux du groupe du partenariat. Nous avons commencé par examiner la composition des délégations présentes à notre Assemblée. À Manama, nous battons des records positifs, mais malheureusement également moins positifs. Commençons par le positif. Chers collègues, nous avons 230 femmes parlementaires annoncées à cette Assemblée. C'est un des plus grands nombres en chiffres absolus jamais atteints à une Assemblée en présentiel. En termes de pourcentage, nous sommes à 34%. C'est dans la moyenne des dernières années. Ce qui est plus inquiétant, chers collègues, c'est que 23 délégations de deux membres ou plus sont venues sans membres des deux sexes. Là aussi, c'est un record. Nous n'avons jamais atteint un tel niveau et nous ne devons pas relâcher nos efforts. Le groupe a aussi pris note que 35 délégations présentes sont équilibrées, c'est-à-dire qu'elles ont entre 40% et 60% de femmes. C'est un peu moins qu'à Kigali et représente 26% des délégations. Nous devons continuer sur cette voie. Enfin, comme vous le savez, à l'initiative de notre groupe, nous avons obtenu l'accord du Conseil directeur de l'UIP à Kigali de développer une politique contre le harcèlement, y compris le harcèlement sexuel, à nos assemblées et autres réunions de l'UIP, et ce, à nous calquant sur le modèle de, code de conduite des Nations unies. Fort de cette décision, nous avons commencé le travail par, sur un texte plus développé et espérons pouvoir finaliser cela pour notre prochaine Assemblée. Chers collègues, lors de notre deuxième séance, nous avons eu la possibilité de dialoguer avec la délégation des Maldives. Mes chers collègues, depuis quatre ans, il y a eu d'importantes avancées aux Maldives relatives à la participation des femmes en politique. Les femmes sont chargées de 36% des portefeuilles ministériels. En 2019, une loi réservant aux femmes 30% des sièges aux élections municipales a facilité l'accès des femmes lors des élections locales de 2021. Ce sont de bonnes nouvelles. Mais pour les femmes au Parlement, la situation est loin d'être satisfaisante. Aux élections de 2019, le pourcentage de femmes parlementaires est descendu à 4,6%. Elles sont actuellement 4 femmes sur 85 parlementaires. Le défi, les défis sont grands. La culture, les stéréotypes sexistes, la violence faite aux femmes en politique, et particulièrement la violence en ligne, et la difficulté de gérer simultanément les responsabilités liés aux sphères privées et publiques, pour n'en citer que quelques-uns. Des élections législatives sont prévues pour 2024. C'est donc le moment, chers collègues, de soutenir nos collègues femmes et hommes des Maldives afin de faciliter plus d'inclusion au Parlement. Des tentatives sont à court pour mettre en place des quotas ou des mesures temporaires et spéciales pour les élections législatives de 2024. L'objectif étant d'atteindre 33% de femmes au Parlement. Chers collègues, je veux au nom du groupe faciliter les, féliciter les Maldives pour les progrès accomplis et leur dire que nous sommes à leur côté pour les étapes à venir. Ils peuvent compter sur l'UIP. Et j'espère, chers honorables collègues, 
comptez sur vous tous ici pour les soutenir. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Madame Canute, and once more, thank you for your commitment to work in IPU in all positions that you assumed during these uh, years. We will miss you, but of course, you will stay with us working hardly in IPU. So, may I ask the Governing Council if we may adopt and approve the report presented by Madame Canute on the name of Gender Partnership Group by acclamation. Great. It's done. Thank you, Madame. And uh, it's time to make the, our stop to lunch. We will come back at 2.30 and we will try to anticipate the closing ceremony uh, to 4, uh, 4 p.m. We, uh, I am? No, 4 p.m. We are doing our efforts with the authorities uh, of our host country to see if it is possible. And so at 2.30, we will try to finish the agenda of the, of the Governing Council and at, to begin our closing ceremony at 4. But please, we need the quorum at 2.30. Thank you so much. Have a nice lunch.
la séance. Donc la séance, elle est reprise. Et nous donnons la parole à Mme Benbedis du comité Moyen-Orient, du comité sur les questions relatives au Moyen-Orient. Elle est là D'accord. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Mesdames, Messieurs, mes chers collègues, j'ai le plaisir de vous faire euh, un compte-rendu de la réunion que le comité a tenue le 12 mars 2023 en présence de 12 de ses membres. Cette réunion s'est axée autour d'un certain nombre de points. Le premier point concerne l'élection du nouveau président de ce comité. En effet, M. Hubert Julien Laferrière, député de la France, a été élu pour représenter notre comité, notre comité en tant que président. À cette occasion, nous avons réitéré notre engagement à travailler ensemble sur la base d'une compréhension mutuelle et d'un dialogue constructif. Le mandat de ce comité a en effet pour objectif essentiel de construire des ponts entre les différents pays de la région afin de contribuer à l'établissement d'une paix durable. Le deuxième point est relatif à la situation actuelle en Israël et en Palestine. Nous avons entendu avec beaucoup d'émotion un rapport la concernant et ceci suscite en nous une inquiétude profonde face à la détérioration de la situation en raison d'une violence accrue depuis le début de l'année 2023 dont certains incidents sont considérés comme les plus meurtriers depuis près de 20 ans. Nous sommes préoccupés par les, par les proportions, compris les cas de discrimination, d'intolérance et de discours de haine. En raison du caractère préoccupant de la crise dans la région, nous avons convenu de créer un groupe de réflexion sur Israël et la Palestine et dont la mission sera de prendre les, des initiatives concrètes pour une réconciliation. Bien sûr, d'autres pays sont concernés par euh, l'intérêt de ce comité et pour cette raison, d'autres groupes de réflexion, notamment concernant la crise au Yémen et en Libye, devraient également voir le jour. Le troisième point concerne la visite, enfin, une visite éventuelle dans la région. Afin de concrétiser ces objectifs, le comité a convenu d'organiser une visite dans la région pour acquérir une compréhension approfondie de la situation en dialoguant avec les différentes parties, cette visite s'étendrait à la Jordanie, en Israël et à la Palestine. Peut-être serait-ce l'occasion de promouvoir le rapprochement dans la région et faire avancer le processus de réconciliation. Pour certains membres, ces moments de tension pourraient même générer des opportunités de paix. Le quatrième point euh, est relatif à l'école de la science au service de la paix. Un exposé euh, nous a été présenté au sein de ce comité. Pendant cette réunion, donc, le secrétaire de l'Union interparlementaire nous a informé sur les activités des écoles de la science pour la paix, dont un événement du comité tenu au CERN à Genève du 5 au 9 décembre 2022. Le CERN, c'est l'Organisation européenne pour la recherche nucléaire. 24 participants dans six groupes géopolitiques ont assisté pendant cinq jours de conférences, d'ateliers et de visites sur le thème « Faire face à la pénurie d'eau ». Ceci constituerait une occasion de reconstruire la paix avec la science. Euh, une prochaine euh, une conférence de suivi par le, pour les parlementaires axée sur l'eau et la sécurité alimentaire se tiendra prochainement au Vietnam en juin 2023. Et la deuxième session des écoles de la science pour la paix se tiendra en juillet 2023 sur le thème du changement climatique, suivi d'une conférence pour les parlementaires en marge de la COP28 aux Émirats arabes unis au mois de, décembre et, euh, mois de euh, novembre, novembre et décembre 2023. Bien entendu, ces initiatives et le résultat positif ont été applaudis par le comité. 
Le cinquième point concerne les activités de l'Office de secours et de travaux des Nations unies pour les réfugiés de la Palestine dans, la, dans le Proche-Orient, l'UNRWA. Nous avons entendu un rapport sur les activités de l'UNRWA euh, et de leur rôle crucial dans la provision d'aide aux réfugiés palestiniens, dont la situation se détériore de plus en plus, situation d'autant plus grave en raison de la crise financière dont souffre cet organisme, l'UNRWA, manque de financement notamment. Enfin, et en l'absence d'une solution juste et durable à la question des réfugiés palestiniens, le par les parlementaires doivent jouer un rôle majeur en soutenant l'UNRWA et en lui fournissant les ressources financières nécessaires pour lui permettre de remplir son mandat. Vous constaterez, mesdames, messieurs, le rôle de ce comité qui œuvre sans relâche à l'établissement d'une paix durable dans la région. Merci pour votre attention et soyez aux porteurs d'un message de paix et d'espoir. Je vous remercie. D'accord. Je vous remercie, euh, Madame, euh, Madame Benbedis, pour le rapport. Euh, monsieur le secrétaire général, non. je vais lancer le tout de suite. Non. Monsieur Etchenis, d'accord. Euh, nous allons inviter Monsieur Etchenis, président du groupe consultatif sur la santé. Il est là, M. Etienne. José. Ah, c'est José. <rire> Merci, Madame Président. Thank you, General Secretary. Uh, the IPU Advisory Group on Health met on March 11 with five of our 12 members in attendance. It welcomed the three new members from Ireland, Pakistan, and the United Republic of Tanzania, and the technical partners from the World Health Organization, the Partnership for Maternal Newborn and Child Health, UNAIDS, and Global Fund for Fights AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. The advisory group discussed some ways to strengthen IPUS IPU relevance in the global health arena and to implement the health component of the IPU strategy. We agreed that the challenge of health is very broad and that we would expand our priority further but keep some key priorities and respond to their needs. The group reflects jointly about the importance of human rights obligation in the work of health restrictive laws and policies are still limiting the blocking access to services. Challenges exist, and we must do more to protect vulnerable populations, especially young women and socially marginalized groups. There is a lot of parliamentarians can, I should do through political outreach. The advisory group decided to act on its outreach mandate. We agreed to organize a field visit to Uh, this year to learn about the document practices related to equity in health, in particular for marginalized groups. We would be uh, happy uh, to receive proposals from the countries that would like to help us. We already have an offer from Pakistan on the table. The group also reflected about its rules and practices and agreed to continue these discussions Uh, with a view to further strengthen IPU relevance and work in the global health arena. We discuss IPU cooperation with the advisory group technical partners and were pleased to learn about the achievements and impact. We were apprised of upcoming joint activities, including first WHO IPU African Parliamentary High Level Conference on Strengthening Health Security Preparedness that we will take place in May in Cape Town in South Africa, preparing for future emergencies would be central of our post-COVID efforts, and the advisory group is glad to support parliamentary mobilization around this issue. Equity in health should be the guiding start of our efforts to prevent and fight diseases and ensuring universal health coverage as a key step in this regard. IPU and WHO produce a handbook for the parliamentarians on this issue uh, entitled The Path Towards Universal Health, which we are pleased to officially launch today. 
the handbook is a practical tool to enhance parliamentary understanding of the complex issues related with uh, health coverage and to support the development of the requisite capacity in parliaments to take concrete actions to deliver on health and well-being for the citizens. I encourage to all of you to take a copy and discuss in your parliament how to use this handbook. I am pleased now to invite a video from the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, on the occasion of this launch. IPU President Duarte Pacheco, IPU Secretary General, my brother Martin Chungong, Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends. As members of Parliament, you are uniquely positioned to transform political commitments to UHC into reality. It therefore gives me great pleasure to launch the new UHC Handbook, a joint project of the IPU and WHO, which can help to guide you along the path towards universal health coverage in accordance with the landmark 2019 IPU resolution. The handbook and the accompanying briefs provide guidance on leveraging your roles in lawmaking, finance, taxation, and accountability to advance UHC. I encourage you to draw on the expertise of WHO and IPU and to engage at the high level meeting on UHC at the UN General Assembly this September. To provide the support you need on the journey towards UHC, it's critical that WHO has the sustainable financing we need to do long-term programming in countries, deliver top quality norms and standards, and respond to emergencies. Last year, your governments agreed to a stepwise increase of access contributions to WHO. I urge you to support the first phase of this increase when it comes before the World Health Assembly this May. Thank you all once again for your commitment to UHC and a healthier, safer, fairer future for your countries. I thank you. Dear friends, I end by emphasizing that healthcare, as millions of deaths from the pandemic have shown us, is not just a fat or a minor matter. The pandemic treaty, mental health, rare diseases, primary care, vaccine patents, health budgets, the burden of cancer disease, digitalization, and health data, for example, are issues that need the attention of IPU. Also, the importance of training young people in health policies or sharing good practices between parliaments. The creation of new working group in WHO and other sectoral parliamentary associations in the field of health must encourage the IPU to make advisory group on health more relevant, more capable, and the, that is one of the conclusions and commitments of the, our group. And for that, the advisory group on health will develop a concept note that will be discussed in the next executive committee in Lisbon. I end by thanking all the members of the advisory group on health, as well as the secretariat, for their work, their commitment, and their help to build a healthy world. Thank you very much, dear friends. Merci beaucoup, uh, José. Et nous vous félicitons ainsi que toute l'équipe du groupe consultatif. Uh, sur ce, uh, nous invitons Monsieur le Secrétaire Général à prendre la parole. Madame President, uh, distinguished members of Council, uh, I just wanted to take a few moments to reflect on this particular moment. Uh, yesterday, when I presented my impact report, I did say that uh, we were very anxious to develop democracy and strong parliaments, but this would only be 
uh, instruments for serving the people. And one of the key areas, policy areas, that we have identified for serving the people is uh, health. You've just had the report from the uh, chair of the advisory group on health. That is a statutory body of the organization that is dedicated to reflecting and directing policies on health matters in the IPU. I also said that the IPU uh, does advocacy, stresses the important role of parliaments, but we cannot assume that all parliaments are on the same level of uh, competence and capacities. They do need uh, support, especially when you are dealing with highly technical matters. And that is why today we are pleased to launch a handbook for parliamentarians on, global, uh, on universal health coverage. You remember way back in 2019 in Belgrade, in the context of the deliberations on the role of parliaments in promoting universal health coverage, you did adopt a very important resolution. You did launch a handbook on the same matter in the presence of uh, my dear friend, the Director General of WHO. And today, a lot has happened since Belgrade. We've had the global pandemic, COVID, that has uh, wrought havoc uh, in the world today. We've learned a lot of lessons, and the world has evolved generally. So today, the two organizations, uh, IPU and the World Health Organization, have decided to upgrade that handbook that was launched for the first time in Belgrade, coming up with a second edition of that that reflects current realities, but also, as Dr. Tedros keeps telling all of us, uh, the universal health coverage and global health security are two uh, sides of the same coin. That is why we are working strenuously to promote parliamentary uh, contribution to universal health coverage. And uh, Mr. Echanis, Dr. Echanis did actually mention here that there's going to be a major summit in Cape Town in May this year on a global health emergency, trying to explain what it is that uh, parliaments are required to promote global health security on the African continent. I encourage you to attend that meeting, which I believe has the potential to beef up our capacity to deliver on the common agenda of universal health coverage and by extension, global health security. I would now like for us to uh, come together, join hands. I, I see the IPU president is here. He may want to come up to the uh, podium here so we can jointly launch this handbook. Uh, Duarte? <laughs> Come. Why is she going? Mrs. Canote. Come on, come on. Join us. Where is gender equality? <laughs> Maybe in front. We, we will now jointly launch this handbook. <laughs> with Dr. Kedrick, Director General of the WHO, in virtual attendance. <laughs> Dr. Tedros, hi. <laughs> Now, we are going to the high-level advisor group on counterterrorism and violent extremism, and I will give the floor to my 
pleasure to the next chair of this uh, high level uh, group. Please, you have the floor. Cher Président, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, c'est avec plaisir que je vous présente le rapport de la réunion du groupe consultatif de haut niveau sur la lutte contre le terrorisme et l'extrémisme violent qui s'est tenu le 13 mars 2023. Des élections pour les postes de président et de vice-président ont été organisées. J'ai été, moi, Bouden Munder, vice-président de l'Assemblée nationale algérienne, élu président et Madame Agnès Vadaï, la Hongrie, a été élue vice-présidente. Au cours de la réunion, nous avons, nous avons été discuter les résultats des trois réunions thématiques de l'appel du Sahel. Nous sommes convenus des quatre principes généraux suivants. S'agissant de s'engager auprès des pays du Sahel, concentrer les efforts sur l'action immédiate et non sur les discussions et les réunions. Harmoniser toutes les activités globales liées aux pays du Sahel avec les, inis, les, inis, les initiatives régionales et internationales. Soutenir des, sol, des solutions pilotées par les Africains aux problèmes qui touchent l'Afrique. Rétablir la confiance au niveau national et international entre toutes les parties prenantes clés. Après la première réunion thématique sur l'environnement, la deuxième réunion thématique s'est tenue à Alger. L'Algérie, le 26 et 27 février 2023, à l'initiative conjointe de l'IPU et de l'Assemblée populaire nationale d'Algérie sur l'engagement des communautés dans la prévention de l'extrémisme violent et dans la lutte contre les conditions propices au terrorisme. Cette réunion était la première du genre puisqu'elle a rassemblé 190 participants de divers horizons en particulier des chefs religieux et tribus du Sahel, des jeunes et des parlementaires du G5 Sahel et des pays voisins, ainsi que des experts régionaux et internationaux et des organisations parlementaires. La réunion était conduite par le président de l'IPU, M. Pachiko Duat, et le président de l'Assemblée populaire nationale d'Algérie, M. Brahim Bourali. La réunion a abouti à 20 recommandations qui peuvent être résumées comme suit. Renforcer la résilience des chefs tribus et religieux ainsi que des acteurs de la société civile face à l'extrémisme violent et à la lutte contre le terrorisme en améliorant les conditions de vie dans les pays du Sahel grâce à des projets humanitaires et de développement. Soutenir les personnes les plus vulnérables et dont la situation caractérisée par la pauvreté, les exposer au risque d'être recrutés par des organisations terroristes en reconnaissant que le développement est le fondement des efforts durables en, ma en matière de lutte contre le terrorisme. Veillez à ce que les femmes les jeunes et les victimes du terrorisme soient associés de façon constructive à tous les processus de paix et de stabilité. La troisième réunion de l'appel du Sahel s'est tenue le 11 mars 2023, lors de la 146e assemblée de l'IPU à Manama, Bahreïn, en présence de membres du groupe consultatif de parlementaires des pays du Sahel et des pays voisins, ainsi que des experts en la matière, la réunion avait pour thème atténué l'impact de la menace sécuritaire en renforçant la résilience au Sahel. La réunion a débouché sur la formulation des recommandations suivantes. Assurer un appui technique et financier pour maîtriser la situation sécuritaire et empêcher la propagation du terrorisme vers d'autres pays de la région. Reconnaître le défaut d'attention porté par la communauté internationale à la difficile situation au Sahel et le fait que l'Occident n'assume 
pas sa responsabilité dans la déstabilisation de la Libye, laquelle a eu de graves répercussions sur le Sahel. Renforcer la coopération régionale des États sahéliens et la fonder sur la sincérité et la transparence. Pendant la réunion du groupe consultatif à Manama, nous avons évalué le résultat de ta réunion thématique sur l'appel du Sahel et pour y donner suite, nous nous sommes accordés sur les étapes suivantes. Coordonnation interne. Ayant reconnu, reconnu les femmes et les jeunes comme des groupes vulnérables, il convient d'organiser des réunions de coordination avec le Conseil des jeunes parlementaires de l'IPU, Forum des jeunes, et le Bureau des femmes parlementaires de l'IPU, Forum des femmes, afin de les sensibiliser à la situation de ces groupes vulnérables dans les pays du Sahel et d'encourager ces organes de l'IPO à mettre cette question à l'ordre du jour des prochaines réunions de leurs forums respectifs. Coordination interparlementaire. Afin d'harmoniser et d'unifier l'aide apportée aux populations du Sahel, il convient de mettre en place un mécanisme de coordination avec tous les acteurs parlementaires qui travaillent sur des questions liées au Sahel. Il faut aussi encourager les, parle les parlements des pays développés à s'investir dans le rétablissement de la confiance avec les pays du Sahel. Coordination internationale. Il faudrait encourager les institutions de l'ONU présentes au Sahel à établir un mécanisme de coordination interinstitution qui englobe également les acteurs parlementaires sur la base des besoins constatés sur le terrain. Communication et visibilité. Il convient de donner une grande, plus grande visibilité aux travaux du groupe consultatif, en particulier à l'appel du Sahel, pour obtenir l'impact souhaité. Le secrétaire général de l'IPU pourrait en l'occurrence, jouer un rôle important en faisant mieux connaître l'appel du Sahel sur le plan international. Merci. Mr. Vanden, Vanden uh, thank you for the, the presentation of the report, also for the election to share the, the, the group, uh, and so, and we count with you to have uh, this group very active because to fight terrorism and violence, extremism is very important to, to the IPU. Allow me to say that uh, we had different elections. Uh, for a four-year term ending the March 27. We received the following candidates from different geopolitical groups, and as usual, IPU, the uh, Secretariat, uh, the, the President, will not interfere on the, the, the decisions of each geopolitical group. We need to repeat it. And so, uh, always we respect uh, candidatures of Ms. Uh, either Al Zahabi from Oman, Dr. Al Alarbi from Saudi Arabia, from the Arab group, uh, Mrs. Ambarish from India, Mr. Golho from Iran for the Asian Pacific group, Mrs. Guerra Castillo from Mexico uh, and for Latin America and Caribbean group. Um, Madame Mr. Danone and, uh, from Israel and Mr. Carlson from Sweden from the 12 plus group. May I understand that Governing Council endorsed the proposals of the different geopolitical groups? No opposition it adopted. I see Palestine ask the floor, please. Okay. Sayyid Rais, 
السيدات والسادة الزملاء كنا قد تقدمنا باعتراض مكتوب إلى مكتب رئيس الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي على انتخاب إسرائيل في هذه اللجنة وعندما تشكل الفريق الاستشاري الرفيع المستوى لمكافحة الإرهاب والتطرف العنيف كنا نتطلع بأمل أن ينصف ضحايا الإرهاب وأن يعمل للحد من الإرهاب والتطرف إلا أن وجود ممثل إسرائيل في هذا الجسم يقود الهدف الذي قام من أجله للأسباب التالية إن البرلمان الإسرائيلي يسيطر عليه مجموعة من المستوطنين الإرهابيين الذين أسسوا عصابات تتبنى وتمارس الإرهاب كنهج وتدعو إلى إبادة الشعب الفلسطيني ومنهم من هو مطلوب للعدالة في دولة الاحتلال نفسها ثانيا إن برلمان إسرائيل هو المسؤول الأول والأخير عن جملة من القوانين العنصرية والتي تمثل في مضامينها المعنى الحقيقي للإرهاب والتطرف مثل قانون يهودية الدولة والسعي لإقرار قانون إعدام الأسرى الفلسطينيين وغيرها من القوانين ثلاث إن إسرائيل كدولة احتلال تمثل أعلى درجات الإرهاب وانتهاك حقوق الإنسان ولا زالت تتنكر للمئات من القرارات الأممية بدون رادع أو محاسب إن إسرائيل أيها السيدات والسادة تسعى من خلال وجودها في هذه اللجنة إلى الإفلات من العقاب والتغطية على إرهابها المنظم إرهاب الدولة بحق الشعب الفلسطيني الأعزل والحصول على شهادة براءة من الإرهاب الذي تمارسه وتعرض مجموعة القيم والمبادئ التي قام عليها اتحادنا هذا للمساءلة والخطر وهذا أمر علينا جميعا أن نرفضه شكرا Dear colleague, I took a good note uh, of your position. Allow me to say uh, just two th three things. I think that uh, and I'm trying to prepare my speech for the end of this meeting. And I will criticize all kind of hate speech between ourselves. And so some of, of the words you used against one colleague of us I think was not appropriated, and I will need to say that because this is what I believe. We should uh, show our differences, but always with respect to our colleagues because they have the same legitimacy as because they, are, they were elected as we are. Second point, uh, we take a good note of that, but it, is, it was the proposal of the 12 plus, and I, as I said, we always accept the proposals of the different geopolitical groups. Uh, sometimes maybe the ones, some Europeans will not like the proposals of other groups. It's, it's, they can make a reservation, as you explain, explain now, but this is a decision of the, of the geopolitical group. And so this way uh, I, I understood that uh, with this, this res strong reservation uh, expressed from Palestine, we accept uh, the, all nominations from the geopolitical groups, and this is the decision of the Governing Council. And this way, we'll go to the other point, uh, uh, the work, Working Group on Science and Technology. And I will uh, give the share to Mr. Nauktant from Ireland. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. On behalf of the members of the IPU Working Group on Science and Technology, I'm pleased to report on our meeting held on the 13th of March uh, here in Bahrain, uh, and also uh, on our project of the Science for Peace Schools held in December uh, at CERN in Switzerland and in France. Before I go into my report, I want to say that we 
uh, at uh, our Assembly have passed resolutions that, if delivered upon, will make a real difference uh, for the people that we all represent. These complement the global commitments on topics such as climate action and the sustainable development goals. But as we hear from every corner of the world, we must focus on the delivery of these commitments and resolutions. We are facing unprecedented or even wicked problems uh, in our world today. Climate change, energy insecurity, digital and green transitions uh, 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 and AI. The implementation of the actions to address these challenges is through policy change and legislative change, and we as Members of Parliament are instrumental in delivering that. The IPU is the greatest reservoir in the world of practical solutions uh, that work and the ones that have failed, and we need to be sharing these with each other, not just informally outside this room but here in the Assembly itself. There is no more powerful an argument for new legislation or for policy change on the floor of each of our parliaments than the practical examples of what has actually worked in other countries. And let us learn to share that knowledge. And the role of our working group is to build on that sharing of knowledge, to help each and every one of you as parliamentarians to access the vast reservoir of new potential solutions that science holds to emerging problems, as well as the existing ones that we have already paid through our taxation and vast government grants uh, for these solutions in the first place. Here at our, our meeting this week, we agreed to the work programme for 2023 which reflects our engagement uh, and dialogue between science and politics. We agreed to officially participate in the Science Summit in New York, which will be held from the 13th to the 29th of September. We will be able to identify ways in which science can contribute to the global challenges and ensure a continuous dialogue between parliamentarians and the scientific community while developing and launching science collaborations to support uh, the uh, achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. We have also agreed to collaborate with the Interparliamentary uh, Union Standing Committee on Sustainable Development and UN Affairs to develop and present a key report to the Science Summit, reinforcing the, reinforcing the role of parliamentarians in setting the global agenda. We have also agreed to organise an IPU day as part of the summit, which will focus on the contribution of the IPU in general, and parliamentarians in particular, to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, with the goal of facilitating direct parliamentary engagement with scientists to ensure a more policy-focused approach to the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals. And I am asking you and your colleagues here to support us in that initiative because without your support, we will not uh, succeed. We also agreed to participate as observers in the 26th session of the United Nations Commission on Science and Technology for Development, which will be held in Geneva uh, from the 27th to the 31st of March, and where we will actively be contributing uh, to those discussions. One of the joint initiatives that our committee has been involved in, along with the uh, Middle East Questions uh, Committee, that is the Science for Peace Schools. The aim of the school is to bridge the worlds of science and politics by initiating dialogue and helping to create a community of parliamentary experts to address challenges together under a neutral umbrella of science. 24 participants from all of the geopolitical groups attended the five days of lectures and workshops and visits uh, in relation to the theme of, of water scarcity at CERN uh, last December. And as uh, Mrs. Bonvenise uh, has already outlined, the first session provided a space for participants to exchange experiences on evidence-based decision-making and to learn how methods of scientific collaboration could be used to solve the problems that we are now facing in parts of the world, like the Middle East and in the Sahel uh, region, two regions that are challenged in terms of water scarcity. 
the working group agreed to hold a follow-up conference for parliamentarians, which will focus on water and food security in June at the International Centre for Interdisciplinary Science and Education in Khoinan in uh, Vietnam, and a second session focused on climate action later this year, culminating with uh, a meeting at COP28 at the United Arab Emirates uh, in December. We also agreed to pursue several pilot projects on engagement uh, between the scientific community and parliaments. We discussed a proposed process aimed at improving awareness of the need for scientific engagement in the legislative process. Uh, conclusions and recommendations from each of the parliaments participating in this progress, process will be used to develop a practical parliamentary toolkit on the importance of scientific engagement in parliamentary decision making. Our plan is to develop, review and approve a toolkit at our meeting during the 147th IPU Assembly in Angola this uh, October. We also, as a working group, noted and welcomed the uh, decision by the Committee on Peace and International Security in terms of their cyber crime report. But we did flag concerns about the establishment of a cyber security working group. We believe that working in conjunction uh, with the Peace and International Security Committee, as we're doing with other committees, we can support them in carrying out that uh, particular and delivering on their particular resolutions rather than the establishment of a new committee. Before ending our meeting, we re-elected our Vice Chair, uh, Ms. Atta from um, Egypt, uh, wishing, and I wish her a very productive mandate over the next two years. Finally, uh, members and colleagues, our constituents don't care about the theories of the resolutions. They are only interested in, in results. And as we know, the Sustainable Development Goals are all about breaking down silos to deliver a set of cross-cutting objectives for the people in our individual countries and the countries of the world to make it a better place for all. So let's start using science and the practical knowledge that it brings us to break down those silos in the benefit, to benefit all of our peoples across the globe. And I'll end my report by thanking the Government of Bahrain and the Parliament for hosting this meeting. Garamila Mahagov Galer, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nocton, and to all colleagues of the group for the amazing work you are thank doing. I will ask the floor if there is any question about this report. No questions. So we consider, may we consider the approved report? No opposition? It's approved. Before we go ahead, allow me to, to receive that we should elect three members for the vacancy on this group there for a four-year ending uh, mandate, ending on March 27. We received uh, candidatures from Mr. Saleh from Iraq, representing the Arab group, and uh, Mr. Tonti Zirin from Thailand, from the Asia-Pacific group. May we consider them elected? No opposition? Thank you. Congratulations, sir. And uh, now, election to the Executive Committee. Go back. Uh, uh, Secretary General informed me that uh, Iran, not because of this uh, last report, but because one of them, and uh, on that moment, we didn't see uh, his re their request. Uh, the Iran wish to to, to have the floor, and please, dear colleague, with our apologies because we didn't see no problem. your request on the right time, you have the moment to do it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on the report of the Committee of Middle East question, I would like to draw your attention that, regrettably, part of five of the report 
refer to an allegation against IRGC, which is an official part of the Iranian military forces. This reference is totally unacceptable and must be removed from the report. Our understanding is that the committee has no mandate to refer to alleged communications it receives. The delegation of Islamic Republic of Iran will not adopt this report as it stands now. Thank you very much. Uh, dear colleagues, we note uh, your reservations. We'll go to the. It will stay in our minute for the future, uh, and so this way we can go ahead. Uh, I also am trying to understand. The, and no. I'm trying to understand the, if. Uh, Yemen? No, no, not Yemen. No, uh, I understood that the Madame Cher of the African of, of the African group, the Speaker Ashkar. of Tanzania. So to use uh, correct expression uh, to avoid any kind of mistakes. Uh, but I am not seeing uh, uh, Her Excellency. Could Sir Terrace? سأتحدث عن الموضوع السابق. Mr. Speaker of uh, Yemen, you are asking the floor to. الشيخون. أنا طلبت الحديث عندما كان الموضوع يتعلق بموضوع الإرهاب، ولكن للأسف حظنا أننا في هذا الاتجاه. Mr. Speaker, allow me. With our friendship, allow me. We are requesting the floor. نعم. I wish to understand why are you requesting the floor. I asked the question about the issue of the Iranian Iranian and the Iranian Iranian, and I was going to the same direction that the Palestinian leader asked. Dear Mr. Speaker, dear colleague, we finished this point of our agenda, and so we need to go forward. I apologize. ظن أنكم لم ترون في حينها ولذلك فقد فات القطار علينا وأتمنى في الخطوات القادمة أن تلتفتوا يمينا ويسارا. Thank you so much, but we need to go forward. And so maybe I will give later on to a point of order to Her Excellency the Chair of the African Group. Uh, and so we can go to the elections, uh, agenda, the point number 15. And so it's, uh, I believe, a uh, rapid one because we have two members of the executive committee, two very important members, two vice presidents of IPU that uh, are leaving the they positioned at the executive committee, Mrs. Canote from Senegal. Uh, of course, she continued as member of parliament, but the term ended uh, here at the executive committee. And uh, Mrs. Cecilia Whitegreen of, of Sweden, that uh, because she is no longer a parliamentarian. And because of this, we needed to replace these two members of the executive committee. My first word, I repeated this several times during this day, but never is, never is too much. Uh, I should express in my name, in the name of Secretary General, and I believe in all members of the executive committee, the appreciation for the participation of these two members in our executive committee. They are uh, very active always with the positions, uh, always defending uh, very, in a very strong way what they believe and uh, always putting on the first road, on the front line, the prestige and interest of IPU. And so to Cecilia Whitegreen and uh, Madame Canute, our great appreciation and thank you so much for the, your work you developed in our executive committee.
for the, to replace these two members. We receive uh, also two, two names, of course, the, the candidature of Madame Alma Alm Eriksson of Sweden, the, who will complete the remaining term of Mrs. Whitegreen, and from the African group, Mrs. Ida Kamonji Nasserwa Sabagu of the Democratic Republic of Congo, that will represent the African group for a full term running from March 23 to March 27. Uh, the, these candidatures were accompanied, accompanied letters and CVs were shared with full membership. And so I ask if the Governing Council accepts these two elections and nominations. No opposition. It's done. It decides. My congratulations to Mrs. Tarserva Savangu and Mrs. Eriksson for, uh, and you will understand that to be a member of the executive committee also became with a lot of work, but you are, organized, you are prepared for it. Uh, Madam Speaker is not there, so we can go to the point 16. Uh, dear members, the point 16 is the IPU Anton. Uh, it is, I, I think, uh, I, I feel as a historical moment because all the organizations, all the countries have their own flag and their own atom, and usually they will not change it every year. It's something that will be taken for a long time and that will take one spirit of uh, family. And so we took the decision to create it on our 144th IPO Assembly in Usadua. Then the Secretariat asked a team uh, was, uh, as, uh, of, uh, the, the prop inside the Secretariat of IPU to draft in terms of references and identify the process. They consult music, music experts and they publish a request for proposals and gave potential composers six months to present the musics. It ended on 30, 31 December of the last year. And it was a surprise, but it may show also the relevance of IPU because we are waiting for five, six, seven proposals and we received 19 proposals, so 19 musics uh, that can be candidates to the Aten of IPU. Then uh, we, try to, we, we tried to identify a strategy because no one inside the Secretariat is expert in music. And so we, uh, we decided to ask help from uh, an expert in music. Uh, we send them the list, uh, not just the list, the 19 musics and ask to present us uh, to the executive committee a short list. And then, with different sensibilities, the members of the executive committee choose from the short list what should be the national, the, the atom, atom of uh, IPU. And it was uh, what happened. And so the executive committee yesterday has voted and recommends that the proposal made by Mr. Pedro Alf Alfer became the IPU anthem to be played at the beginning of each IPU assembly and other IPU events. I will ask if it's possible to hear the music that the executive committee uh, choose and then with your agreement it will become the atom of IPU. It's possible to have the music play? Please.
May I understood that with your applause, you, appro you approve the recommendation of the Executive Committee. So now we, are, we will not just have a flag. We have a flag, an atom, and so the family will feel more together for the future. I hope so. With this, the serenity that as we need to solve the problems of our world. The point I to see Madame is she's not there. The point seventeen is about the Kramer. It's about the Kramer Party Awards. It was created in May 21, and uh, we accept the rules of the Kremlin, and uh, last year it was the first time that uh, we decide uh, with the name of our founder fathers to nominate and to choose the winner that received for the first time in our history the Kremlin Pass Award. This Kremlin is to, to be uh, to, uh, to be in honor of elected MPs on the job that are doing a lot to defend the ideals of IPU. Of course, on that moment, we create some rules. But we should learn from the first experience. And from the experience of last year, we understood with the Executive Committee, the Secretariat, myself, I think all members, that the rules are, were not perfect. That is, we needed to, to improve them. Because it was the first experience, as we know, when we are doing something from zero, we try to create, but sometimes we need to understand what we can do different to achieve what we really wish. And so the Executive Committee, receiving some proposals from the Secretariat, accept to propose some uh, amendments to the, to the rules of the Kremlin Prize. Uh, before, uh, uh, to pass a video, I will give the floor to the Secretary General, if you wish to present uh, the main important uh, modifications, or, uh, or if you think, if no one uh, wish to uh, to receive what, I, what we are changing, but I think for transparency we should provide what are the most relevant modifications we have in our rules. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I uh, would like to point out that uh, you have before you uh, the set of uh, amended rules uh, as adopted by the Executive Committee. And for ease of reference, we have tracked the changes that are being proposed uh, to you. The changes are intended to streamline the process for the uh, organization of the award or the prize, uh, the Kremer Passy uh, Prize. We are clarifying how geopolitical groups can receive and process uh, nominations for uh, the award. We are also in this document clarifying that uh, members of the prize selection board will not be allowed to vote for uh, nominees coming from their own geopolitical groups. They will need to uh, vote for others outside their geopolitical groups. We have also clarified what would happen if uh, a member of the uh, prize selection board was unable or unwilling to uh, score the various nominees there. The votes would be spread across the whole palette of uh, nominations. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we have also clarified the uh, composition of the prize selection board. We have indicated that in the event that a geopolitical group does not have um, a, an honorary president, as is the case with some geopolitical groups, then a retired speaker from that geopolitical group would be 
designated to sit on the uh, uh, prize selection board. If that is not the case, then it would be a prominent member of parliament from that geopolitical group. So, Mr. President, those are some of the highlights of these amendments that are here being proposed to you. And uh, we hope that uh, Council can now uh, endorse uh, the recommendation of the Executive Committee to amend the rules accordingly. And if that is the case, these amended rules will apply uh, forthwith to the uh, process for nominating and choosing winners for the price this year and thereafter. Mr. President, I am sure you will also mention that yes. uh, we are proposing that climate change be a focus of the price this year. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Secretary General. Uh, you you explain in a very concrete, with concrete uh, words, what are the, the, the main important amendments to the rules. I ask if someone wish to raise the floor. No? So we may consider them approved. Thank you. Before, you, before we watch the video, allow me to... No, the video first. IPU involves more than 46,000 parliamentarians all over the world. Men and women dedicate their lives to defend freedoms, democracy, the state of law. It's time to the international community and to the IPU recognize the role that each one deserves. award to one parliamentarian. Dear colleagues, we try to focus as all our strategy this year on climate action. But everyone uh, are free to nominate and then the geopolitical group will decide and will send it to the board that will have the final decision before the 1st of uh, April. Yes, it's 1st of April. Thank you. Yes. Uh, any other business? If we don't have, I, on this point, I, I will ask the Madam Speaker of um, of the Africa, no, the chairperson of the African Parliament, to avoid this, the mistake. The chairperson, the chairwoman of the African Parliament and Speaker of Tanzania, uh, to, uh, to have a statement. I understood that you wish to a point of order. Um, sorry, Mr. President, it's not a point of order, but I had wanted uh -huh. to know if I can use a few minutes of your time to report. Um, we have had consultations with the Egypt, um, uh, Egypt delegation, so you, I seek your indulgence. It's not a point of order. So if you give me the minutes, then I'll go ahead. Of course, madam. It's, uh... If it's good news, you will have all the minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm told if it's good news, then I have all the minutes. That's good <laughs> to know. Okay, so we... Um, now, as the president for the Africa Geopolitical Group, I took initiatives to um, sit with the, the Egyptian delegation, which is headed by the speaker of Egypt. And I managed to call some of the colleagues who are, uh, who are still around here. So we met and then we agreed on what I'm going to say now. 
and then you can give after I have spoken, then you can give a chance uh, with your permission to Egypt to uh, say maybe a word or two. So in our consultations, we have uh, reached um, we have reached a consensus that because Egypt belongs to both groups, belongs to the Africa geopolitical group because it is geographically there, but also it belongs to the Arab geopolitical group because that's where it subscribes uh, politically, so to speak. So we have had a long uh, discussions about the establishment of the pilot, um, uh, pilot regional office for IPU, and we have come to an understanding that the office that will be established in Egypt, it's an, I, it's an IPU office, and Egypt has, uh, has assured the African uh, geopolitical group, those who met there on behalf of the whole group, that their office will serve Africa. It's ge geographically there, but our, uh, our brothers and sisters from the Arab um, from the Arab geopolitical group are equally welcome to be served there. So we have agreed in principle. This is the pilot office. It is also an IPU office. So the African geopolitical group and the people and the representatives who were there, we have all agreed that let the pilot uh, office begin and then we take it from there. Very important and good news, Madam uh, Speaker. Uh, the, uh, the Speaker of Egypt, please, you have the floor, Mr. Speaker. Shukran ma'al al-Rais wa kulli shukr li ma'ali Raiset Barlaman Tanzania. Fa'alan minzu qalil iktama'na ma'a siyadita wa ma'a al-magmu'a al-Afriqiyya al-ikhwa al-Afadil min mumathili al-Barlamanat fi Afriqiyya. واتفقنا على ما ذكرته سيادتها من بيان الآن وأوضحنا أنه تم انتخابنا فعلا من المجموعة الجيوسياسية العربية ولكن هذا المكتب هو مكتب الاي بي يو وإن كان يقع في مصر وسوف يخدم كل المنطقة المحيطة المجموعة العربية والمجموعة الأفريقية على قدم سواء ولا تمييز في أي معاملة ويسعدنا يسعدنا يسعدنا ويسرنا ليس فقط أن نساعد الجميع بل أيضا نطلب المساعدة من الجميع فكلنا واحد وكل الهدف أن ينجح هذا المكتب تحت شعار الاي بي يو ونحن مستعدون لذلك ونحن كذلك على وشك الانتهاء من كل الإجراءات المطلوبة بالتنسيق بين الاي بي يو وبين الأمانة العامة في البرلمان المصري وسوف تنتهي قريبا بإذن الله شكرا جزيلا مع الرئيس Thank you Mr. Secretary General I will ask if the Secretary needs uh, any uh... Um, clarification of if it's okay to you if you understood. No, no, Mr. President, I think that uh, I, I feel satisfied that my concerns that were raised this morning have now been addressed and that we have our marching orders and we will proceed in like fashion. Thank you very much. Good news. Uh, and uh, now I see that Ukraine wish also to uh, a point of order? I don't know. If I just see you are uh, yeah, yeah. the floor. It's about po point of order, but maybe no. But you will uh, choose what it will be. <laughs> maybe yeah, other, other business. business. Yeah. Other business is uh, a good, good suggestion. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, it's, uh, it's, it will be about you, sorry, personally. Uh, our parliament uh, has adopted a decision to award a honorary certificate to Mr. President Pacheco uh, by your very uh, huge leadership. 
It has been critically through these difficult times for Ukraine and for, for all over the world. Thank you so much for your attentive and uh, to all concern, to all uh, impartiality, your decisiveness, your amazing work. We also thank the team of IPU and Secretary General also uh, for supporting us and doing your job excellently. And uh, if it's possible, uh, can I personally give it to you? Thank you, dear colleagues. I just will, of course, I need to say thank you, first of all. But I think that when we do what we should do, we don't need to, to receive nothing, because we are just doing our duty. Thank you. And, uh, I think, Mr. Secretary General, that we ended the, this meeting of the Governing Council. Uh, first of all, thank you for your cooperation. And we are just, we are on time. Uh, I, I said before lunch that we should uh, try to finish at 4. And in my, it's 4 p.m., not more one minute, not less one minute. <laughs> and so, uh, Thank you for your uh, collaboration, participation, uh, also the Secretariat for uh, all the help the, that was given to this meeting of the Governing Council, to Madame Canote that uh, in some moments needed to, to lead the meeting. Apologize me if some mistakes happen during the, the, the process, but we achieve what we, we, what we wish to finalize on time with uh, all the discussions, with the good news that came from the African uh, geopolitical group about the office in uh, Egypt, with the approval of the, our uh, ATAN, and so with the elections then, with all the reports then. It was a magnificent uh, meeting, and so in two minutes we will begin the last moment of our assembly. Thank you.
اسعد الله مساكم يطيب لي ان انوه الى ان الايام الاربع الماضيه لجمعيتنا تخللتها مداولات مثمره وقويه للغايه بشان مجموعه من القضايا ذات الاهميه القصوى كما تعلمون جيدا اتمنى يوم امس قرار البند الطارئ تحت عنوان تنميه الوعي والدعوه الى اتخاذ اجراءات بشان الازمات الانسانيه الخطيره التي تؤثر على شعوب افغانستان والجمهوريه العربيه السوريه واوكرانيا واليمن وبلدان اخرى وبشكل خاص استضعاف النساء والاطفال. اقترح ان نبدا الان في النظر في البند رقم ثلاثه من جدول اعمالنا وهي المناقشه العامه بشان تعزيز التعايش السلمي والمجتمعات الشامله للجميع مكافحه التعصب. لقد اجرينا مداولات موضوعيه وقويه خلال الايام الثلاثه الماضيه بعد ان استمعنا لما يقارب من 160 مداخله من 120 برلمانا وعشرات المنظمات الشريكه. اسمحوا لي الان ان ادعو سعاده السيده هاله رمزي من البحرين وسعاده السيد ملفن بوف من سورينام لعرض مشروع الاعلان ليتفضل. Will Mr. Melvin Boff take the floor, please? ننتقل الآن إلى البند رقم خمسة من جدول أعمالنا يرض علينا الآن القرار الذي عدته اللجنة الدائمة للسلم والأمن الدوليين تحت عنوان الجرائم الإلكترونية المخاطر المستجدة على الأمن العالمي بالإضافة إلى عمل اللجنة الدائمة تم تعميم مشروع القرار بعد التعديل باعتباره وثيقة وثيقة الجمعية رقم 1/146/dr.cr ادعو الان رئيس اللجنه الدائمه سعاده السيد محمد مهدي الجان الاحبابي من قطر لعرض القرار ليتفضل الله يحييك برزنتيشن كي بعد شكرا سعادة الرئيس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم معالي الرئيس أصحاب السعادة السيدات والسادة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته تتمثل مهمتي في الأولية في إطلاعكم على نتائج مداولات اللجنة الدائمة للسلم 
والأمن الدولي التي أوكلت إليها مهمة مناقشة البند الخامس من جدول أعمال الدورة السادسة التي أُكِلت إليها مهمة مناقشة البند الخامس من جدول أعمال الدورة السادسة والأربعين بعد المائة للجمعية العامة وإعداد مشروع القرار ذا الصلة أجرت اللجنة الدائمة للسلام والأمن الدولي لأول مرة مناقشة حية لمشروع القرار في 12 مارس بدأنا بملاحظة تمهيدية من السفير براينر الممثل الدائم الممثل الدائم للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي لدى الأمم المتحدة في فيينا الذي أشار إلى أنه في ضوء الاعتمادات المتزايدة على التقنيات الرقمية ينبغي ويجب من منح الحماية للمواطنين عبر الانترنت كما هو الحال في العالم الحقيقي ثم استمعنا إلى المقررين المشاركين للجنة السيدة سارة فلكناز من دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة والسيد خوسي سيبيدا من أسبانيا اللذين قام بالمهمة الحاسمة المتمثلة في وضع مشروع القرار والمذكرة التفسيرية المصاحبة له يجب أن أقول إنهما لم يأخذا هذه المهمة باستخفاف فقد عمل لمدة عام في جمع المدخلات من زملائهم البرلمانيين المشاركين والمشاركة حيثما أمكن لتعزيز صوت البرلمانات لا سيما في اجتماعات مفاوضات الأمم المتحدة بشان اتفاقية الجرائم الإلكترونية حيث ناقش مع أصحاب المصلحة الرئيسيين كما تحدث ما, يقر ما يقرب على أربعين متحدثا خلال مناقشة التي تلت ذلك لإثارة قضايا تتراوح بين الحاجة إلى تبادل المعلومات حول الجرائم الإلكترونية عبر البرلمانات وتعزيز حماية المواطنين ولا سيما الأكثر ضعفا والبنية التحتية المدنية الحيوية وكذلك التعبير عن اختلافات في الرأي حول المفاهيم والمصطلحات التي يجب استخدامها عبر القرار كان موضوع الجرائم الإلكترونية والهجمات الإلكترونية ذا أهمية بالغة للأعضاء ولم يظهر ذلك في المناقشة فحسب بل ظهر أيضا في العدد التاريخي للتعديلات التي تلقتها الأمانة في غضون المهلة القانونية والتي ارتفعت إلى 320 تعديلا من قبل, من قبل 27 برلمانا عضوا ومنتدى برلماني ولا بد لي من التأكيد هنا إن المناقشات خلال المناقشة والمفاوضات ظلت متسقة ومحترمة وبناءة والأهم من ذلك أنها سمحت بالتعبير عن العديد من وجهات النظر نتائج هذه المفاوضات هي قرار متوازن ببساطة يسلط الضوء على دور البرلمانات في توسيع الحماية للمواطنين في الفضاء السيبراني بنفس الطريقة كما هو الحال على أرض الواقع كما يشدد على أن الجرائم الإلكترونية قد تشكل تهديداً خطيراً للعمليات الديمقراطية ويؤكد الحاجة إلى التعاون الدولي للتصدي للجرائم الإلكترونية وكذلك لحماية السلام والأمن والاستقرار الاقتصادي العالمي مع الحفاظ على المبادئ الأساسية لحقوق الإنسان بما في ذلك حرية التعبير بالأمس اعتمدت اللجنة بكامل هيئتها القرار يتوافق بتوافق الآراء أعرب وفدانا عن التحفظ هما الهند بشان الفقرة 25 من المنطوق والاتحاد الروسي أيضا بشان الفقرة 11 من الديباجة والفقرة واحد من المنطوق ونص القرار معروضا عليكم الآن لاعتمادة من قبل جمعية الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي وبما أن المفاوضات قد غيرت المسودة الأولية 
وجعلتها أكثر تركيزًا على الجرائم الإلكترونية فإن اللجنة تطلب أيضًا من الجمعية تغيير عنوان القرار إلى الجرائم الإلكترونية المخاطر الجديدة على الأمن العالمي والتي تعكس محتوى الوثيقة بشكل أفضل قبل أن أختم ملاحظاتي أود أن أبلغكم أن الموضوع التالي للجنة الدائمة للسلم والأمن الدوليين سيكون حول تأثير أنظمة, أنظمة الأسلحة المستقلة والذكاء الاصطناعي كما يتم النظر في العمل على قضية الجنود الأطفال وهو اقتراح آخر معروض أمام اللجنة وفي هذا الصدد أتمنى للمقررين المشاركين حظاً سعيداً وتعاوناً مثمراً من أجل, من أجل قرار ناجح ولا يفوتني في الختام أن أتقدم بالشكر الجزيل للأخوة في مملكة البحرين ممثلة في البرلمان البحريني على حسن الاستقبال والتنظيم والضيافة شكراً لكم شكراً هل هناك أي اعتراض من الجمعية بشأن تأييد هذا الإعلان؟ إنديا Honorable Chairperson India has a reservation on the operating para 25 of this resolution. This has been duly acknowledged by the Honorable Chair as well, and we are grateful to him for that. The same was mentioned and registered with the Honorable Chair of the committee yesterday. And India dissociates itself from this OP25, operating para 25. Our dissociation may please be included in the final resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Just to clarify that the question that was put to the uh, Assembly was whether they were in a position now to adopt that resolution. And uh, the rules uh, say that uh, the resolution can be adopted and any uh, parliament or delegation that wishes to enter a reservation will then have the opportunity to, to do so. We have a reservation from India that has been duly noted. And Mr. President, according to the rules, if there are no other reservations, you may now uh, uh, ask the Assembly to adopt uh, this resolution by consensus. Thank you very much. So this resolution is adopted. So decided. Thank you. نرجع للبند رقم ثلاثة من جدول أعمالنا وهي مناقشة عامة بتعزيز تعايش تعايش السلمي والمجتمعات الشاملة للجميع مكافحة التعصب. لقد أجرينا مداولات موضوعية وقوية خلال الأيام الثالثة اسمعوا لي الآن أن أدعو سعادة السيدة هالة رمزي من البحرين وسعادة السيد ملفن بوف من سورينام لعرض مشروع الإعلان ليتفضل Mr. President of the 146th IPU Assembly, Mr. President of the IPU, Mr. Secretary General, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's our pleasure to present to you Manama Declaration, myself and my colleague, Mr. Belova. 
promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies, fighting intolerance. We, members of parliament from around the world, gathered at the 146th IPU assembly in my beloved country, Bahrain, are deeply aware of the dangers that hate, intolerance, exclusion, and violence in all their forms pose to the very foundations of democracy and the social contact, contract that holds our societies together. Consumed by greed and competition, our world is facing social and economic inequalities and on an unprecedented scale. <coughs> Heightened economic insecurity is breaking communities apart and leaving growing numbers of people socially isolated, fending for themselves, and often with inadequate access to public services, delivery, and social safety nets. Inequality and economic insecurity can give rise to anger and frustration in communities everywhere. The dignity intrinsic to human being can be undermined by factors such as poverty, denial of in inalienable economic, social, cultural, civil, and political rights, violation of the law of law, discrimination against women, lack of inclusion of youth, and the de facto exclusion from politics of the most vulnerable and marginalized. Xenophobia, racism, intolerance, negative stereotyping, stigmatization, discrimination, and extremist narratives are all expressions of this deep malaise in our societies. The mani they manifest themselves in hate, speech, and all right, outright violence in various forms against migrants, people with disabilities, and national, ethnic, religious, linguistic, or other marginalized groups perceived as a threat to the established order. They can also be expressed in the discretion of religious sites and symbols, actions which are deep enrichment, deeply enrichment, and we reaffirm the fundamental rights and freedoms of all people as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Regrettably, some in positions of influence in society seek to exploit the vulnerabil vulnerabilities of others sowing hatred and division as a way to advance their own interests. Digital platforms designed to facilitate social interaction and communication are being misused to micro-target, amplify, and spread disinformation and in intent against others. The ease with which some of these voices speak in total disregard of the truth carries profound dangers and of for democracy. Most worryingly, their words can be a direct cause of violence and intolerance within communities and between nations. How can we respond to these challenges? We can do that by encouraging collaborative networks, promoting dialogue and joint projects in service to community, by creating channels for conflict prevention and mediation, by promoting moderation, by advancing education and awareness building, and by encouraging community and religious leaders to contribute to these objectives. We commit to speaking out against intolerance and especially any advocacy of hatred that constitutes discrimination, hostility, and violence. We will also assist in the resolution of conflict through the exercise of parliamentary diplomacy. With all this in mind, we consider it our unique responsibility as parliamentarians to speak and act responsibly towards all people, particularly those who disagree with us, and in ways that bring people together peacefully and pursuit of the common good. We affirm that societies that are inclusive and just, and in which rights are upheld, are more likely to be cohesive, peaceful, and democratic. We pledge to fight inequality through right-based economic and social policies that put people before profit and the weak before the strong, 
and that uphold the equality and dignity of every person. We reaffirm the urgent need to implement the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, leaving no one behind. As our best hope for peace, democracy, and sustainable development for all. More concretely, we are committed to utilizing our lawmaking, representative, and oversight functions toward the following objectives. Objective. Make hate-motivated acts and all forms of violence linked to religion, belief, xenophobia, racism, or intolerance of marginalized groups an offense under the law. Invest in education for all at all levels, including peace education and education for democracy, pursuant to the United Nations General Assembly resolutions by this name. Make parliamentary proceedings consistently open to the input of relevant civil society organizations and community groups representative of the diversity of the society. Engage in constructive, respectful dialogue with parliamentarians of all political persuasions, both nationally and internationally. Ensure that national statistic institutions and research bodies produce up-to-date disaggregated data to assist with the formulation of inclusive economic and social policies. Perform self-assessments of inclusivity, inclusivity or parliaments and take active measures in, to increase the representation in our parliaments of women and youth, as well as of underrepresented national, ethnic, religious, linguistic, and other marginalized and vulnerable communities. Uphold the rights of migrants, refugees, and stateless people as particularly vulnerable groups consistent with international conventions. Regulate digital platforms and other media to diminish the risk of hate speech and various forms of disinformation while protecting the fundamental right of speech as a bulwark of democracy. Protect cultural sites as expressions of our common heritage, as well as holy sites, places of worship, and religious symbols as expressions of different religions and beliefs. Promote interaction with relevant UN organizations for interfaith and intercultural dialogue and support UN peacemaking and mediation efforts. We, we pledge to, to take, take this declaration forward through concrete actions and in accordance with the, with the core values of the IPU as, as outlined in its, in its current strategy. strategy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. هل هناك أي اعتراض من الجمعية بتأييد هذا الإعلان؟ So it is all so decided. ننتقل الآن إلى البن ستة. والأعمالنا اعتماد القرار الذي أعدته اللجنة الدائمة للتنمية المستدامة تحت عنوان الجهود البرلمانية لتحقيق التوازن الكربوني السلبي للغابات أمامكم مشروع القرار بعد التعديل كما أعدته اللجنة الدائمة وتم تعميمه باعتباره الوثيقة رقم C-2-146-DR دش دش داش سي آر هل هل لي أن أدعو رئيس اللجنة الدائمة سعادة السيدة أغنس مولدر من هولندا لعرض مشروع القرار. You may take the floor, please. Thank you very much, dear Mr. President of the IPU, President of the Assembly, dear colleagues and dear staff, and of course the Secretary General. Um, my task today is to inform you uh, about the outcome of our deliberations of the Standing Committee on Sustainable Development. The committee was entrusted with the task of debating and preparing a draft resolution on parliamentary efforts in achieving negative carbon balances of forests. The co-rapporteurs were Mr. Christoph Hoffman, 
he's from Germany, and Ms. Hina Gavit, she's from India. And they prepared a draft resolution and an ex accompanying explanatory note. And I take this opportunity to reiterate my thanks to the rapporteurs for their great work. The committee first he heard a presentation on, uh, of the draft resolution, and then we had a debate. Drafting of the resolution was conducted in the plenary. The committee considered 150 amendments, and they were submitted by 23 member uh, parliaments. And I hereby thank all of the committee members for their dedication and their engagement, and in such a fruitful way. Yesterday afternoon, the committee examined uh, the consolidated draft resolution and adopted the text by acclamation. The Russian Federation expressed a reservation on preambular paragraph 19, and India expressed reservations on uh, preambular paragraphs 2, 5, and 8, and operative paragraphs 1, 3, 5, 6, 9, 11, 12, 13, 17, and 21. The resolution states that deforestation and its impact on humanity is a common struggle to be tackled by the international community as a whole. Parliamentarians need to stand together to update the natural foundations of life and to ensure that we can all live well on our planet. This is essential, not only from a climate perspective, but also as part of peace, stability, and a sustainable development agenda. There can be no healthy un uh, economy on an unhealthy planet. And the committee also approved a work plan for the next assembly in Angola, and which includes a debate on the theme of the next resolution, partnership for climate action, promoting access to affordable green energy, and ensuring innovation, responsibility, and equity. And we'll also have a hearing on food security, as well as a segment to prepare the parliamentary meeting at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in the United Arab Emirates, the COP28. So there's a lot of work to be done, and especially to do it right now as Parliament, because the planet can't wait. Thank you very much. I wish you a blessed afternoon. Thank you. هل هناك أي اعتراض من الجمعية بشأن تأييد هذا الإعلان؟ Honorable Chairs. It is so decided. Honorable Chairs, we have. Honorable Chairs. Is that India? Yes, Your Chair. Yes, India. I, I take it from the President that the resolution has now been agreed. And according to the rules, you can now take the floor to express reservations without actually opposing the adoption of the resolution because that decision has now been taken. Without understanding, Mr. President, you may now wish to give the floor to the Indian delegation. Can we proceed? Can, you can take the floor. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. India has reservations on many paragraphs which have been duly noted by Honorable Chair of the Committee on the resolution, which was adopted yesterday during the meeting of the Committee. India dissociates itself from these paragraphs, which have already been communicated to the IPO Secretariat. Our dissociation may please be included in the final resolution. Thank you. Thank you. اقترح الآن أن ننتقل إلى البند السابعة من جدول أعمالنا تقارير اللجان الدائمة للديمقراطية وحقوق الإنسان وشؤون الأمم المتحدة. سأبدأ باللجنة الدائمة للديمقراطية وحقوق الإنسان وأدعو رئيس اللجنة السيد جاجادين من سورنام لعرض التقرير. تفضل سيد جاجنام.
Mr. President, President of IPU, Secretary General, dear colleagues, first of all, I want to thank Your Highness the Government of Bahrain, the IPU President, the Secretary General, and all delegates um, for the, this conference that we had. We traveled from different parts of the world to Bahrain. I traveled from South America through Europe to Bahrain, and while I arrived, I got ill. But the facilities of Bahrain were there, and I could uh, work again within some days. Once again, thank you. It's my honor to report on the two debates organized by the, our standing committee on democracy and human rights during this assembly. On 13th of March, the committee took up the theme of its next resolution, orphanage trafficking, with bureau member Jihan Mohammed of the Maldives in the chair. The committee approved the nomination of Mr. Bustamante of Peru to work with Senator uh, Linda Reynolds of Australia to draft the resolution. More than 30 delegates provided input. They described how this new kind of child trafficking has developed. It is an issue of supply and demand whereby well-intentioned countries, tourists, and volunteers donate money to orphanage in the false belief that they are supporting children in need. Meanwhile, skilled criminals and traffickers supply the tailor-made orphanage experience of donors. But in the, this illicit scheme, the children in the orphanage are most often not orphan, and in fact, they have at least one living parent. The committee indicates its intention to prepare a resolution that set out best practices to combat this form of child trafficking and modern slavery. The committee has held a debate on 14th of March on the topic of parliamentary impetus in favor of the fight against disinformation and hateful and discriminatory content in cyberspace. The debate was held in two parts, starting with an overview of the issues from UNESCO, followed by, a, by an expert hearing with many in interventions from delegates throughout this session. The starting point was the need to protect the amazing opportunities offered by the internet while also creating the means to prosecute online harms in accordance with international human rights standards. Several areas were discussed as online violence against parliamentarians, hate speech, the targets specific groups as women or religious communities, and the need for efforts to combat this information in countries outside Europe and North America. To be effective in this fast changing digital environment, environment parliament 
should prepare legislation through a transparent and inclusive process that incorporates the view of the public and the private sector. Once again, I want to thank Bahrain government, IPU secretary, especially our secretary of the committee, Mr. Andy Dixon and his team. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. هل يمكنني الآن أن أعتبر أن الجمعية قد طلعت على هذا التقرير؟ عراق تفضل شكرا شكرا سيد الرئيس لإتاحة الفرصة لنا بالتحدث لقد كان لنا موقفا يوم أمس في اجتماع لجنة الديمقراطية وحقوق الإنسان حول محتوى الكراهية والمحتوى التمييزي عبر الفضاء الإلكتروني وتكلمنا عن الإسلامفوبيا والكراهية ضد الإسلام والتمييز والتمايز الحاصل ضد المسلمين وطالبنا من الحكومات كافة بأن تراعي مصالح المسلمين في بلادهم وطالبنا كمجموعة عربية ومجموعة إسلامية بأن يكون من مقررات لجنة الديمقراطية وحقوق الإنسان تذكير وإحاطة لنبذ محتوى خطاب الكراهية ضد المسلمين ومعاقبة من يرتكب المحتوى التمييزي عبر شبكات الأنترنت ضد المسلمين شكرا سيد الرئيس شكرا Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, the comments made by the Honorable Member from Iraq have been recorded and will be reflected as such in the records of this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to to the Congress of the the سيد ويرلي تفضل الكلمة لك Merci Monsieur le Président Je vais parler en français pour permettre à cette langue officielle de notre Assemblée de pouvoir également être présente au pupitre. J'aimerais vous remercier, Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Président de l'Union interparlementaire, Monsieur le Secrétaire général, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers collègues. Tout d'abord, permettez-moi de m'associer aux différents remerciements qui ont été faits aux autorités et collègues du Bahreïn pour leur excellent accueil, qui nous ont permis de conduire de manière tout à fait pertinente nos différents travaux. J'aimerais également profiter de ce début d'intervention pour remercier tous les collègues du Bureau et de la Commission en charge des Affaires des Nations Unies pour une séance très importante, enfin des séances très importantes, comme vous le verrez tout à l'heure. Enfin, un grand merci au secrétariat, à Paddy, Alessandro et Brigitte, qui nous accompagnent parfaitement dans l'avancement des conditions et des éléments de notre Commission. La Commission permanente des Affaires des Nations Unies s'est donc réunie le 14 mars et a adopté un nouveau mandat et des nouvelles modalités de travailler. Comme vous le savez, ces modalités avaient fait l'objet d'un audit lancé par le secrétariat général de notre organisation qui avait été ensuite été discuté au mois de juin dans la séance du comité exécutif, puis avait fait l'objet d'un certain nombre de débats dans le cadre de nos rencontres de Kigali. Il avait alors été décidé par notre Assemblée et dans la bonne collaboration que le Bureau et la Commission en charge des Affaires des Nations Unies reprendraient l'audit, reprendraient les éléments et avaient pour mission à cette Assemblée ici à Manama de présenter des propositions concrètes validées par la Commission pour retravailler, revoir les modalités de travail de la Commission. Ceci, mesdames et messieurs, chers collègues, a été fait. La mission a été remplie. 
en pleine bonne collaboration avec le secrétariat général, le secrétariat de la Commission, les différents membres, qui nous ont permis ainsi de venir avec une proposition tout à fait concrète, qui a été adoptée à l'unanimité par le Bureau, puis à l'unanimité par la Commission, et qui permet maintenant d'envisager la suite du travail de cette Commission de, tout à fait, de manière tout à fait pertinente, adéquate et actualisée. Ces éléments ont pu également être préparés, évidemment, dans la suite de Kigali, par différentes séances de travail, et en particulier une séance virtuelle du bureau au mois de janvier. Encore une fois, un grand merci au secrétariat et aux collègues qui se sont investis dans cette démarche. Au-delà des modalités de travail propres à notre Commission, nous avons abordé deux thèmes particuliers dans notre séance. Tout d'abord, la question de la représentation entre hommes et femmes au sein de l'Assemblée générale de l'ONU et de la représentation des pays. Quels sont les pays qui ont des représentantes permanentes au sein de l'Organisation des Nations Unies qui a un homme Et dans ce cadre-là, nous devons reconnaître que nous sommes aujourd'hui de manière statistique à 25% de représentantes donc féminines permanentes au sein de l'Organisation des Nations Unies et donc de l'Assemblée Générale. Ces éléments nous incitent et nous ont amenés à faire un certain nombre de propositions, y compris évidemment de travail dans nos propres parlements, auprès de nos gouvernements, afin que cette proportion puisse être renforcée dans le droit fil des modalités et priorités fixées par notre organisation. Nous poursuivrons ce travail dans le cadre de notre prochaine séance de commission à Luanda cet automne. Deuxième thème abordé, c'est la question dans le cadre des objectifs 2030, donc objectifs de développement durable 2030. Vous le savez, chaque année, un certain nombre de pays soumettent un rapport volontaire national sur l'état d'avancement de la mise en œuvre des ODD 2030. Ces rapports sont fondamentaux, chers collègues. Ils sont importants. C'est des rapports d'étape dans la conduite de projet. Nous avons déjà eu l'occasion ici, à plus d'une euh, fois durant cette semaine, de réaliser combien l'objectif d'atteindre les objectifs 2030 en 2030 devient délicat, voire difficile. Nous devons donc agir, chers collègues, et pour agir, c'est évidemment au sein de notre organisation que nous pouvons nous coordonner, mais ensuite c'est au sein de chaque pays, de chaque Parlement, que cette préoccupation doit être relayée, et c'est ce que la Commission a présenté et pris comme position générale, afin de renforcer le rôle de chaque Parlement dans sa mission de suivi et d'accompagnement de son gouvernement et de son administration dans la mise en œuvre des objectifs de développement durable 2030. Dans ce cadre-là, il y a une volonté de renforcer le suivi, ne fût-ce que de quel pays a rempli ses devoirs au travers des rapports euh, volontaires annuels, quels sont les pays où il faut poursuivre les démarches, insister plus peut-être. Et c'est dans ce cadre-là, et en vue aussi du sommet de l'ONU du mois de juillet prochain à ce sujet-là, que nous allons poursuivre le travail grâce au secrétariat. Et je me permets ici, chers collègues, de lancer un appel déjà lancé et validé au sein de la Commission, mais je le fais volontiers à l'échelle de l'Assemblée générale, pour vous demander, chers collègues, de faire ce suivi, de contrôler que les questionnaires qui sont envoyés dans vos pays, dans vos parlements, vos gouvernements, vos administrations, ces questionnaires soient remplis, soient renvoyés dans les délais. Ce n'est que ainsi que nous pourrons ensemble avancer suffisamment pour atteindre ces objectifs fondamentaux. Enfin, d'un point de vue organisationnel, nous avons eu le plaisir de prendre note des nominations suivantes au sein du bureau de la Commission. M. Ali Talbi d'Algérie, M. David McGuinty du Canada, M. Dingamoe Luhiaran Gamaye du Tchad, le Dr. Mohamed al du Koweït, M. Itoshi Ayogagi du Japon, Mme Pia Kayateno des Philippines et Mme Arena Schroum d'Ukraine. Un grand merci à ces collègues qui prennent leurs fonctions. Merci d'avoir accepté ces nouvelles déterminations au sein de cette commission. Enfin, alors que je remets mon mandat, puisque je suis au terme des quatre ans de la limite de mandat dans cette fonction au sein du bureau de la Commission et plus particulièrement 
de sa présidence depuis le mois de septembre de l'année dernière, vous dire tout le plaisir et l'honneur que j'ai eu de conduire ces travaux, de conduire en particulier cette réforme des modalités de travail en pleine concordance et coordination avec les instances de notre organisation. Comme nous disons en Suisse très volontiers, je rentre dans le rang, mais c'est pour continuer évidemment mon engagement au sein de notre organisation. Merci beaucoup. شكرا جزيلا هل يمكنني ان اعتبر ان الجمعيه قد اطلعت على هذا التقرير yes it is so decided يمكننا الان انتقال الى البند رقم سبعة من جدول أعمالنا الموافقة على بنود الموضوعات للقرارات التي ستعتمدها اللجان الدائمة للسلم والأمن الدوليين ومن ثم بشأن التنمية المستدامة في الجمعية 148 للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي وتعيين المقررين أود أن ألتفت ألفت انتباهكم إلى الوثيقة رقم A-146 slash 7-p.1-rev كما سترون فأن اللجنة الدائمة للسلم والأمن الدوليين تقترح بأن يكون هذا الموضوع ضمن البنود المدرجة ضمن قائمة الدورة القادمة والموضوع هو معالجة التأثير الاجتماعي والإنساني لمنظمات الأسلحة ذاتية التشغيل والذكاء الصناعي السيدة أم ستول بايزر من الأرجنتين والسيد سيل أخوة من بلجيكا تم تعيينهم مقررين لهذا الموضوع في هذا البلد في هذا البند هل هناك أي اعتراض من الجمعية في اعتماد هذا القرار؟ نو؟ يس سو ديسايدد كما ستلاحظون فإن اللجنة الدائمة للتنمية المستدامة تقترح أن يكون هذا الموضوع ضمن بنود دورة العام المقبل تحت عنوان شراكات للعمل المناخي تعزيز الوصول إلى الطاقة الخضراء بتكلفة معقولة وضمان الابتكار والمسؤولية والإنصاف السيد ساسمت باترا من الهند والسيدة ميري السو... ميرا السويدي من الإمارات العربية المتحدة والسيدة ليسكا فالسينكو من أوكرانيا تم تعيينهم مقررين لبند هذا الموضوع هل ترغب الجمعية في اتخاذ هذا القرار إذ لا يوجد أي اعتراض قبل أن ننتقل إلى الكلمات الختامية أود أن أدعوكم جميعا لمشاهدة هذا العرض المصور لفيديو قدمه لنا رئيس الجمعية الوطنية الأنقولية الموقر بصفته البلد المضيف للجمعية 147 للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي في لواندا العام المقبل Can we please show the video for Angola? Thank you. Geographically speaking, Angola is located on the southern cone of the African continent, more specifically on the western coast of southern Africa, just south of the equator. To the north, it borders with the Republic of Congo, the northeast with the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, the east with Zambia, the south with Namibia, and to the west, it borders with the Atlantic Ocean. 
independent since November the 11th, 1975, Angola has a territorial surface of 1,247,000 kilometers squared and is made up of 18 provinces, with Luanda as its capital and Portuguese is its official language. The Angolan climate is tropical wet, characterized by two seasons, the rainy season from October to April and the dry season, also known as Casimbo, from May to August. Joao Manuel Gonçalves Lorenzo is the president of Angola, elected in general elections of August 2022. Esperanza da Costa is the vice president of the republic. Angola is a democratic state under the rule of law, in which the president of the republic is also the Angolan chief executive. The National Assembly is the Parliament of the Republic of Angola, a representative body for all Angolans, which expresses the sovereign will of the people and exercises legislative power. The National Assembly is composed of 220 representatives elected by universal, free, equal, direct, secret and periodic suffrage under the terms of the Constitution and the law for a term of five years. The parliamentarians are 38.18% women and 34.9% young people. Carolina Soqueira is the president of the National Assembly. In 2014, Angola carried out its first post-independence population census, which revealed that the country had a population of 25,789,024. 52% of them were female. Today, it's estimated that the Angolan population is just over 30 million. Agriculture is the economic engine of the country, with 60 to 75% of the Angolan population depending on agriculture for their survival, with emphasis on the production of small cereals, masangano and masambala, together with corn, beans, cassava, peanuts, potatoes, fruits and livestock, with goats and cattle. Agriculture has taken significant steps towards the diversification of the economy, a goal set by the Angolan administration. Among the main provinces with the greatest agricultural potential are Huambo, Bie, Benguela, Huila, Melange, Kwanza Nort and Kwanza Sol. On the other hand, oil is the biggest export product in Angola, with a strong contribution to the gross domestic product and the general state budget. Investments in the domestic industry are based on the sectors of extraction, processing and construction materials. Angola is also rich in minerals, especially diamonds and iron. It also has deposits of copper, manganese, phosphate, salt, mica, lead, tin, gold, silver and platinum. This diversity of natural resources opens a window of hope and opportunities for the development of the country. Among the productive sectors considered a priority by the government are the sectors of food and agribusiness, fisheries and textile sector. Tourism is another priority sector that makes Angola not just a place of tourist attractions, but a possible source of revenue collection. It is this Angola that opens up to the world, not only as an investment scenario, but also as a good place to live. Será uma grande honra para a República de Angola e para a Assembleia Nacional em especial acolher a 147ª Assembleia da União Interparlamentar na nossa capital, Luanda, na última semana de outubro de 2023, para um debate sobre os desafios dos nossos Estados e para encontrar soluções conjuntas que respondam de forma holística às inúmeras prioridades das nossas instituições na resposta aos problemas que afetam a prosperidade e bem-estar das pessoas num ambiente de paz efetiva, estabilidade, promoção dos direitos humanos, de justiça social e de igualdade. Thank you. A malahabat al khitamiya limathli al majmuat al geo siyasiya. We'll start with Africa Group, Speaker of Tanzania.
Mr. President of the IPU, Mr. President for this assembly, uh, Mr. Secretary General, the speakers in the House, deputy speakers, honorable members, and staff, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Africa Group to reiterate on two issues. Uh, the first issue, we would like to remind the IPU under your presidency, Mr. President and the Secretary General, what we initially said in Kigali, our intention to um, suggest to you to change the statutes and the rules uh, so that you allow ample time to the members here to get a chance to know the emergency items in, uh, in advance. That means setting up a deadline of submission of those emergency items so that the uh, geographical groups would have a chance to look at them before the meeting is convened officially. Um, the second issue that I would like to bring to your attention, which is the last one, is um, the fact that we always come to these conferences and we only have to consider one item as an emergency item. That is a big challenge because we meet here as the world parliamentarians. And it's very unlikely that in the whole world we will have only one issue that is agreeable to everybody as an emergency item. And so the members of parliament from all over the world are forced to choose between a hard rock and a stone. And sometimes you have competing issues which are equally important. So it's important, Mr. President, that we reach a point where we don't really have to say no to, to women and rights of children. Like in this case, we had to vote against the motion which was brought about by Argentina. But it was a very important one to protect the women, to protect the children. And now we were all, uh, you know, we had to go against it. But I mean, who doesn't want the women and children to be protected in all situations? But because we are, choose, we are forced to choose only one, then we had to vote against the rest and then go with one. But if our rules and our statutes are changed to allow to have more than one item, it will give a chance to these members of parliament from all over the world to cover us on different issues than just one as we do right now. Uh, in conclusion, because our, sub, our um, geographical regions are just too many, we have to take into account that one issue as an emergency item is insufficient because the world is diverse and we are likely to always have competing issues that we have to vote against and for just because we need one and both of them, maybe they should be considered together. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. That's the statement on behalf of the African Geopolitical Group. Thank you. Arab Group. مجموعة العربية Speaker of Iraq متحدث من العراق فضل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السيد الرئيس الحضور الأفاضل يسرني أن أنقل إليكم تحيات الأستاذ محمد الحلبوسي رئيس الاتحاد البرلماني العربي رئيس مجلس النواب العراقي ولا يسعني بهذه المناسبة الهامة إلا أن أتقدم باسم المجموعة البرلمانية العربية بخالص الشكر والتقدير من مملكة البحرين ملكا وحكومة وبرلمانا على حفاوة التكريم وحسن التنظيم والإعداد لهذا المؤتمر الهام كما أتقدم بخالص الشكر 
للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي رئيسا وامينا عاما وجهاز الامانه العامه على التنظيم الجيد والتعاون المميز نتمنى لكم عوده سالمه حيث ناقشنا في هذا المؤتمر العالمي مجموعة من الأزمات الدولية والآليات المرتبطة بمكافحة الإرهاب ودعم المتضررين والشعوب المستضعفة والاستعداد للتغير المناخي ومساعدة الشعوب جميعا دون تمييز في حياة حرة كريمة بعيدا عن القسوة والإرهاب والكراهية والتمييز العنصري وإشاعة روح المحبة والتسامح بين شعوب العالم المختلفة بما فيه شعارنا الذي جمعنا فيه تعزيز التعايش السلمي والمجتمعات السالمة ومحاربة التعصب والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا The next speaker is Asia for Pacific Group speaker from Australia You may take the floor please Thank you, Mr. President, for chairing the IPU session and what a brilliant job you have done making us all feel so included and welcome in the beautiful country of Bahrain. And thank you to the President and the Secretary General for hosting one of the most successful IPU conferences, the 146th Assembly. And I would like to thank on behalf of the Asia Pacific Group your leadership your vision, but also your inclusivity to ensure that all nations, particularly from the Asia Pacific Group, are included in this country. The Asia Pacific Group comprises 36 members and this year Australia has the honour of serving as the chair of the group. Australia takes this responsibility as chair very seriously and will work to ensure the full engagement of all APG members, noting the importance of all geopolitical groups to work towards universal representation of the IPU. And that is something as chair I am deeply committed to. This year and at this assembly, the Asia Pacific Group met and endorsed 12 candidates for IPU positions from nine member countries from across the region. I congratulate all nine representatives and in particular acknowledge the important, the important appointment of Lord Whakapuana, the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of Tonga, to the Board of the Forum of Young Parliamentarians. And as Chair of the Asia Pacific Group, I intend to work closely with all of its members to ensure that all nations, big and small, have an equal opportunity to fully engage in the IPU and to fully represent the issues and challenges of their people and regions. And our region does have significant challenges, including climate change. For our Pacific Islander members who face a climate emergency, their participation in and engagement with the IPU is therefore more important than ever. So it is very pleasing to see Kiribati attend the IPU as an observer while taking steps to become an IPU member. And as chair of the Asia Pacific Group, I intend to visit the Pacific over the coming months and I look forward to engaging with all of my APG colleagues towards the 147th IPU Assembly. May you all go back to your countries and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Next speaker from Euro-Asia Group, delegation of Kazakhstan. You may take the floor, please. Thank you. Your Excellency, Mr. Speaker, Mr. President of ITU, Secretary General, esteemed colleagues, 
representing the Eurasia geopolitical group, I would like to congratulate the IPU and Parliament of Bahrain for the successful organization of this assembly. I would highlight the significance of the topic for discussion or topics for discussions uh, at the general debates and the precise elaboration of meaningful reports by I IPU delegations. Furthermore, the adopted resolutions of the IPU standing committees on cyber attacks and cyber crimes and the achievement of a negative carbon balance for, of forests are of high importance and timelines. I would like to express my gratitude to the staff of the Bahrain Parliament and IPU Secretariat for their attentive and friendly attitude towards the delegates and the comfortable and warm atmosphere which significant, significantly uh, contributed to the successful completion of the task assigned to the participants of the assembly. I hope to see you all at the next assembly in Angola. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Next speaker from Krolak, delegation of Borgway. You may take the floor, please. En primer lugar, quisiera, en nombre de nuestro grupo geopolítico de América Latina y el Caribe, dar nuestros agradecimientos a las autoridades del Reino de Bahrein, empezando por el Rey de Bahrein, el Presidente de la Cámara de Representantes y el Presidente del Sura de Bahrein. Y de manera muy particular, al Presidente de la organización de esta 146 asamblea, Mr. Jamal Fakro, que realmente sabemos ha hecho un gran esfuerzo y un gran trabajo para que esto sea todo un éxito. Cuando llegué acá a Manama Bahrein, le envié un mensaje diciéndole de que ya estaba bien, que había llegado bien, que ya estaba en el hotel y me contestó Mr. Faco, bienvenido a nuestro pequeño país. Me dio la bienvenida a su pequeño país. Y muchas veces, lo grande o lo chico de un país no se determina por la densidad territorial o la densidad poblacional, sino que se determina por su gente, por sus personas, por su pueblo por sus autoridades, y creo realmente que Bahrein es un gran país, por su gente, por sus autoridades. Y quisiera que todos podamos agradecerle a los colegas que han hecho posible esta hermosa asamblea con un fuerte aplauso. A las autoridades de la Unión Interparlamentaria, al amigo presidente Duarte Pacheco, al amigo secretario general Martín Chungón y a todo el equipo humano de la Unión Interparlamentaria. Porque sabemos que detrás de estos compañeros que lideran este tipo de, de asambleas, de eventos tan importantes, existen personas que están trabajando a la par que ellos. Tenemos traductores, secretarios, asesores, están los choferes de los buses, están los mozos, están las personas que atienden en los stands, en fin, una serie de personas anónimas, pero que hacen posible el éxito de este tipo de eventos tan importantes. A ellos también quiero expresar mi, 
mi agradecimiento. Tengo y reconozco, y este es un tema muy personal, sentimientos un poco encontrados en esta 146 asamblea, porque en lo personal es mi, mi última asamblea. Voy a dejar de ser parlamentario el 30 de junio de este año y ya no voy a poder acompañar las próximas asambleas de la Unión Interparlamentaria. Sin embargo, esa, esa situación se ve superada ampliamente porque aprendí mucho desde aquella primera asamblea 137 en San Petersburgo, aprendí mucho de lo que es la Unión Interparlamentaria. Y me di cuenta, sobre todo en la pandemia, que muchos creemos que los problemas que tenemos en nuestros países son solamente nuestros. Y nos damos cuenta que en realidad muchos de esos problemas son absolutamente transversales y nos afectan a todos, a todos los países y a todos los habitantes de los países del mundo. Porque la pandemia no eligió religión, no eligió grupo político ni ideología, afectó absolutamente a todos. Los temas que se tratan acá, que se trataron, se tratan y se van a seguir tratando, nos afectan a todos. El cambio climático no va a preguntar eh, usted a qué grupo geopolítico pertenece o qué religión profesa, nos va a afectar a todos. Por eso creo que dejamos, dejo en este caso, una unión interparlamentaria más fuerte que nunca, más firme en sus convicciones y en el convencimiento de que el Parlamento y el Congreso, Asamblea o como quiera llamársele, fue, es y será una caja de resonancia de los ciudadanos de nuestros respectivos países, donde tenemos que llevar adelante siempre los principios de la libertad, la justicia social y la igualdad. Y estoy absolutamente seguro que con la enorme labor que cumplió nuestro presidente Duarte Pacheco y con los que van a venir, porque yo creo que esta línea que hemos trazado, este rumbo que hemos trazado desde la Unión Interparlamentaria va a continuar, podemos estar todos muy tranquilos y contentos de que en un momento de la historia hemos aportado un granito de arena para el engrandecimiento de esta institución. Así que muchísimas gracias a todos los colegas de todos los países del mundo y decirles sencillamente que vuelvan bien, en paz, a sus respectivos hogares y que Dios les bendiga. Muchas gracias. Thank you. The next speaker from 12 plus delegation of Belgium. You take the floor, please. Dear uh, Mr. President of the Assembly, dear Mr. President of the IPU, dear Mr. Secretary General of the IPU, and dear colleagues, you stand a man who is proud to be the chair of the 12 plus group. You have to act as a team, and I'd like to thank all the countries who are members of the 12 plus group. Our 12 plus group has met each other on the 10th March for a very long meeting to prepare this General Assembly. And then afterwards, every morning, from 8 to 9 till yesterday. So it were quite long days. And we had also held an important site event on landmines organized by Ukraine, which was attended by a lot of delegations to support this important cause. The 12 plus group members have been very active in several committees, including the Standing Committee on Peace and International Security, which has adopted the draft resolution from our Spanish colleague, Mr. Cepeda, on cybercrime. And this is a very technical and delicate subject. And I want to congratulate Mr. Cepeda and his colleague from the United Arab Emirates to make this very, very difficult task to success, but also the secretary and the uh, chairman of this committee. The same, the same goes for the draft resolution on achieving negative carbon balances of forests submitted by Mr. Hoffmann from Germany 
and Ms. Gavit from India. It was a great pleasure to see the constructive atmosphere in both standing committees, and also I'd like to thank the chair of the second committee and the secretary for the outstanding working. The third plus group is also happy that the Standing Committee on Peace and International Security has approved the proposal from Argentina and Belgium on little autonomous weapons as a topic of its next resolution. This is a matter of grave concern and danger that already exists. It's not science fiction. However, we have also to draw a few remarks. The first one being that the resolutions on the inhuman war of aggression in Ukraine have had very little effect on the ground. And here, there's only one country to blame, and this is not Ukraine. Moreover, several 12 plus delegations have met with the delegation of the Afghan parliamentarians in ex exile, led by Mr. Rahmani, Speaker of the House of the Parliament of Afghanistan. And we all know the current situation in Afghanistan. We all know the humanitarian crisis, the dire situation of the human rights, etc. 125 of the 250 MPs are still in Afghanistan. And among these 125 MPs, there are 10 women parliamentarians. And they are in a greater danger than their male colleagues. And they constantly have to hide. The Taliban or specifically targeting MPs on their dead list. We request the Western countries to help to evacuate them, and we and the IPU are more than ready to provide you with some more information. There is an imminent danger of further crimes against the women MPs. And as you know, Ms. Murtzul Nabizada has already been killed in January 2023. So please, dear friends, we will ask you to take your responsibility if you are not already doing so. And then there is a regrettable incident with a participant from the Human Rights Watch, whose visa has been redrawn by the Bahraini authorities. And we know that our hosts from the Bahraini parliament weren't able to make them revoke their decision. But Mr. President, dear Duarte, and dear friends from Bahrain, as a 12 plus group, we cannot simply take note of the situation. Human Rights Watch defends core IPU values on which we cannot compromise in any way. So I have to mention it. And we count on you, Mr. President, dear Duarte, to not take this lightly. As 12 plus, we don't budge on the core values of this organization. And which brings me to the last matter that I want to touch upon here. During the next assembly in Angola, we will elect the new president of the IPU. And please allow me to refer to the note on the submission of candidacies for the IPU presidency that has been issued during the 206th session of the Governing Council back in 2020. And the note mentions that there are no formal requirements, but that historically, IPU presidents have been outstanding political leaders, well respected nationally and historically, and firmly committed to the core IPU values and principles, in particular, the promotion of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. So we as a 12 plus group are very curious to see what candidates will come for the next General Assembly in Angola. Dear colleagues, I would like to conclude by thanking all of you for the inspiring exchanges. I'd like to thank our Bahraini hosts for the perfect organization, and I have to say for the wonderful hospitality, not only here on site, but also in the main city and all over the country. And I would say to all of you, see you all next time in Angola, have a very safe flight or trip back to home, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll give the speech to President of IBU. Please take.
Thank you all. Mr. President of the Assembly and our host, dear speakers of Parliament, Mr. Secretary General, fellow parliamentarians, dear colleagues. We are coming to the end of our work after one intensive week. Allow me to say that our first word should be addressed to the, our hosts. Mr. Speaker, you, all the members of both houses, all our colleagues did amazing work to receive us in a way so warm during this week. We may say thousands of things, but I think that just uh, a thousand of words, but I think just one word is express everything. Thank you for everything you have done. We don't need to say more. And uh, this work, Excellency, is extensive to Your Majesty, the King, but allow me to say to all the people of Bahrain, because during these days, we also went to different places in the, this wonderful city of Manama, and it was possible to talk with the people, and we felt how warm they are, and how, how happy they are to receiving us here. So it was one experience that uh, for, the, for the people that came here for the first time can be a surprise, not for me, because I have the luck to come before. The, we need to say also a special thanks, allow me to say, to everyone that worked to achieve the success of this assembly. From the side of IPU, to the Secretary General, to all the members of the staff. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, all of you. But also from your side. Uh, of course, Ambassador Phillips is part of the family. We never need to say her name because she's always present. But allow me to say, Mr. Speaker, to all your staff as well. All people, the volunteers, people that are uh, behind the screens, but they, all of them work a lot to achieve the success. To the interpreters, without them, we can be here, but sometimes we will we'll not understand ourselves. Sometimes you don't understand also, also with, with interpreters. Now imagine without interpreters. And so we needed to thank all of them. Everyone was a small piece of the organization and just with all the pieces, it was possible to achieve the success of this assembly. Thank you to each one of these small pieces. Without one of them, we will not achieve the success. And uh, we work a lot, Excellency. I believe we had uh, the meetings that, that are in our status, the meetings of the committees, the side events, the Governing Council, the Executive Committee, the Plenary, but also bilateral meetings that I think it happened for hundreds, some hundreds, between different delegations that try to, uh, to understand what are the points of views of the other delegations about issues relevant for each one. I had more than 30 bilateral meetings, so I believe that we have hundreds of them because a lot of speakers, deputy speakers, and more than 140 delegations came to Manama. We approved different resolutions. One amazing declaration that will call for, for the future, declaration of Manama. We uh, decided to go ahead and try to put some pressure to, to the IPU and to the Uruguay authorities and to Egyptian authorities to put some pressure to achieve the office as soon as possible. We decide to update the rules of the Kremlin Pass Award. We approved what will be for the future our ATAN. 
something that will be always remembered, one of the most important decisions we took here in Manama. We elect colleagues for different positions, but allow me to express now from here, we have an, a new president to the Forum of Young Parliamentarians and a new colleague also to the presidency of women parliamentarians. And so new blood will give new vitality to these uh, institutions. I appre appreciate a lot what the other colleagues have done. But when they have fresh air, we understand they will come with energy, try to do more and more if it is possible. So, dear colleagues, we did a lot. Uh, we did also, we decided, Madam Chair of the, region, uh, the Geopolitical uh, African Group, we decided that we will have a, a roadmap to change our status. You appointed very relevant questions. And so what we decided is not to talk just about it, but on the meeting that joined all the, the leaders of the geopolitical groups with the Secretariat and with myself, that we will open a roadmap until Luanda, all countries will be available to present the proposals. Then in Angola, we will create a working group that will analyze and try to see what it can be consistent from the I don't know if it will be thousands or hundreds of amendments, and we will come back in one year from now to a, a final proposal to update our status. Because we should, the, the reality change, and it is not possible to work with the same rules of, of the past. We need to update to, to our new times. So we did a lot during these weeks. As it was possible to understand the progresses and the evolution of this wonderful country in all aspects, in aspects of democracy, of tolerance, of economic development, respect for human rights. Yes, it was possible to see the, the development in all these aspects here in Bahrain. And this way, we can to an end. We can to an end to understand that we should continue our work. Because we are in parliaments. We represent the people. No, because it is one obligation. Because it is our choice and the choice of the people that decide to vote on us. And so, if it is not one obligation, because we say that we are available to serve people, we should continue to work because the problems of the people are not resolved. And this way, we should continue to, to our work. And we, in IPU, we understand it will be easier to solve the problems of the world if we work together. It will be easier because many of these problems are problems that uh, a country alone, a parliament alone, will not be available to solve. Just if we work together, it will be possible. And so we address many issues. We address the situation in Myanmar, the atrocities that happen, happen there. We criticize the, the, the use of force against civilians. We uh, criticize the killing of members of parliament without any reason. I summarize uh, crime that needs to be condemned without, wor without in other words. As we address the situation in Afghanistan, where we, de we defend all citizens, especially women, that are treated without justice, without respecting of the basic human rights. We criticize the uh, assassinated of Marcel 
Nabizada, a former MP that was assassinated in her home in Kabul. We, we look to the Sahel region in Africa that is uh, severely affected by many crises. Terrorist groups and organized criminals are taking root in many of these states, killing people, destabilizing the region. Thus, Sahel call, calling for help, is calling for help. Ladies and gentlemen, we must hear this call. But we understand also, this is relevant issues, but there are other. What happened in Ukraine should end as soon as possible. This aggression from the Russian Federation to the Ukraine should to have an end, because people need to live in peace. We criticize what happened in Palestine. We understand that Israel needs to live with security. But it don't mean to have reason to, have, to attack other neighbors of, of the country. And so we, we pray for the people that died after earthquake that killed thousands and thousands of people in Turkey and in Syria. Now we understood also that uh, other countries, when we was here, Malawi suffered from an awful cyclone, Cyclone Freddy, with uh, our, that killed again thousands of people, showing that climate change is real. I don't know if no, it's some, there is someone with doubts about it, about this. But if you have, you may see the image of Malawi. Never they suffered something like that. And so we understand that we have a lot of problems. Migration from in America, from Latin America to the United States. People that are left everything behind, try to find hope in the future. In the Mediterranean, free people, people that are running away from the poverty, from war, try to cross the Mediterranean in small boats and dying every day. And the politicians go to the bed to sleep without thinking about it. How oh, it is possible? So, dear colleagues, please, here in IPU, we need to understand. We represent not just our constituents. We serve the global community, and we need to work to serve all of them. And this is why there are three basic points that I wish to conclude, to share with you. First, let us, representatives of our society, lead by example. Let us remember that healthy democracies hold space for difference. As such, we must encounter intolerance with respect and disagreement and with dialogue. This is the main thing of our meeting and assembly, promoting peaceful, coexistent and inclusive societies. But we need to do it day by day, also inside our parliaments. Secondly, let us ensure that our parliaments need to be inclusive places representative of our society and in dialogue with our constituencies and with all diversity, with more women and more young people represented. And thirdly, let us, through our parliament's work, to create laws which uphold the rights and dignity of all people looking forward. We needed to say, we needed to be happy tired. I believe you are so tired as I am now in the end of this week. But we need to look forward because we have one year in front of us to work and to change something in our world. I, I believe that the spirit of Manama will remain in our minds 
in our work. And this way, we will continue to work. And in Angola, we will say, we did it. Thank you so much. And Mr. Speaker, shukran for everything. Bidayatani. <laughs> أشكر أصحاب المعالي والسعادة ورؤساء البرلمانات وممثلي المجالس التشريعية من كافة الدول الأعضاء في الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي لمشاركتهم الفاعلة والإيجابية ضمن أعمال الجمعية 146 والمجتمعات المصاحبة لها لما وجدناه من مشاركة فاعلة وإيجابية في الحوارات والنقاشات والمداولات وما لمسناه عبر الكلمات التي ألقيت من رغبة حقيقية لإيجاد التأثير المنشود والرامي لتحقيق أهداف وتطلعات العمل البرلماني الدولي المشترك السيدات والسادة إذا رجعنا للذاكرة الأولى للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي ومنطلقات إنشائه من قبل فريدريك باسي وويليام راندل سنجد أن أول لبنة إنما قامت بدافع قوي نحو الالتزام تجاه إفشاء السلام والحوار السلمي وذلك يجعلنا نؤكد على أهمية الدعوة التي تفضل بها حضر صاحب الجلالة الملك حمد بن عيسى آل خليفة ملك البلاد المعظم حفظه الله ورعاه عبر كلمته السامية التي ألقيت في حفل افتتاح جمعيتنا هذه ببناء نظام سياسي وأمني واقتصادي وعالمي أكثر عدالة وإنصافا وتعزيز التعاون التشريعي والتقني في إقرار اتفاقية دولية لتجريم خطابات الكراهية الدينية والطائفية والعنصرية بجميع صورها ومنع إساءة استغلال الحريات والمنصات الإعلامية والرقمية في ازدراء الأديان ولا شك أن الدعوة الملكية السامية تمثل غاية إنسانية فطرية ومطلبا دوليا ملحا في ظل ما يواجهه العالم من تداعيات الكراهية والعداوة والحروب والصراعات وما يقابله من تحديات تستهدف أمنه واستقراره كما أنها تمثل ركيزة عنوان جمعيتنا الرامية إلى تعزيز التعايش السلمي والمجتمعات الشاملة للجميع ومكافحة التعصب الأمر الذي نتطلع معه أن يسم التعاون متعدد الأطراف تحت مظلة الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي لتبني هذه الأطروحات الهامة وضعها على طاولة الحوار والتداول والوصول إلى رؤية استرشادية موحدة تظهر انعكاساتها على التشريعات والمواقف الوطنية للبرلمانات الأعضاء أصحاب المعالي والسعادة عندما نتحدث عن الشراكة الدولية فإننا نتحدث عن إنفاق لغة الحوار والنقاش الحضاري الذي يستند على الحقائق ويبتعد عن المعلومات المضللة وتمكين سيادة القانون والاحترام المتبادل وتأمين المواقف الثابتة من رفض كافة التدخلات الخارجية في الشؤون الداخلية للدول واحترام سيادتها وهي أسس قام عليها الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي وبديهيات أجمع عليها المجتمع الدولي واعتبرها من مسلمات المبادئ التي تحكم العلاقات بين دول العالم وأن الاجتماعات والحوارات المستمرة بين البرلمانات تعكس دورا بالغ الأهمية 
للمجالس التشريعية في سبيل تنفيذ أهداف التنمية المستدامة وتصدي للتحديات المتشابكة التي ربطت مصالح جميع الدول على نحو وثيق وبصورة غير مسبوغة حتى بات مستقبل الإنسانية مرهونا بالعمل الجماعي فلا يحتمل التنافر بين أطراف المنظومة الدولية بل يحتم الحاجة للتآلف والتقارب سعيا لتحقيق مستقبل أفضل لجميع الشعوب والمجتمعات السيدات والسادة لقد كان لمملكة البحرين شرف استضافة الجمعية 146 للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي والاجتماعات المصاحبة لها وتحقيق نجاح ملموس بفضل ما, بفضل ما حظينا به من دعم ورعاية كريمة من لدن حضرة صاحب الجلالة الملك حمد بن عيسى آل خليفة ملك البلاد المعظم حفظه الله ورعاه ومساندة رفيعة واهتمام بالغ من قبل صاحب السمو الملكي الأمير سلمان بن حمد آل خليفة ولي العهد رئيس مجلس الوزراء حفظه الله على نحو يعكس التزام مملكة البحرين في دعم هذا الاتحاد البرلماني الشامخ لتحقيق أهدافه الإنسانية ولا يفوتني في هذا المقام أن أتقدم بخالص الشكر والتقدير والعرفان إلى اللجنة الوطنية المنظمة وموظفي الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي وكافة العاملين من طواقم إدارية وإعلامية وفنية وتقنية من كافة الجهات المساهمة في إنجاح استضافة أعمال هذا التجمع البرلماني الدولي في مملكة البحرين أرض التسامح والتعايش وواحة السلام والمحبة بهذا نختتم أعمال الجمعية 146 للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you, and the assembly is closed.